Good morning, sir. This is myself, Dr. Adam Bosle, Professor Head of the Pathology. Dr. Bharat Reki, sir. Good morning. Good, mo good morning, sir. Very nice to see you. Uh, sir, yes, sir. next time we are expected to join you as an offline seminar, uh, CME next year. Because of COVID, this we are uh, conducting online. My pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yes, sir. A very good morning and warm welcome to all the speakers, observers, dignitaries, delegates, and MMC observer from Bharti Vidya P. Dr. Sanjit. I, Dr. Vaishali Bosle, Associate Professor in Pathology, will now lead you into this very interesting Oncopathology Update CME, organized by the Department of Pathology, Symbiosis Medical College for Women, and Symbiosis University Hospital and Research Center, on the occasion of International Pathology Day. The inaugural session of this CME will be conducted at 11 a.m. today. And before we begin the first lecture, uh, we would like you to go through a few disclaimers. Questions will be taken uh, after the lecture and you can enter your queries directly into the chat box. The first lecture will be by the eminent speaker, Dr. Bharat Rekhi, uh, on biopsy interpretation of endometrial neoplasms. It will be moderated by Dr. Sujata Kanetkar, Professor in HOD, Krishna Institute of Medical College, Medical Sciences, uh, Karad. And ma'am will now introduce Dr. Bharat Rekhi. IT team, uh, uh, IT team, please unmute connect here, madam. IT team. Yes, sir. Uh, please unmute connect here, madam. Hello, am I audible? Ah, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, good morning, madam. Yes, yes. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here with Symbiosis Institute and all those who have joined on the precious day of International Pathology Day. So, heartiest greetings to all. And it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Bharat Rekhi, sir, who is a senior professor of pathology in surgical pathology and psychopathology from Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai. He has done his graduation and post-graduation from PGI Institute of Medical Sciences, Rohtak, Haryana. And then he has done DNB in pathology from Chennai. He is MRCH pathology from Mumbai. And he is recognized as postgraduate teacher by the Homi Baba National Institute. Uh, his special interests are oncopathology and research interests related to soft tissue and bone tumors, panic tumors, and related to molecular pathology and cytopathology. His major achievements are he has more than 250 publications and he is a recipient of grand prize for the best electronic research exhibit. International Skeletal Society meeting Rome, Italy in 2012. He is second prize winner in poster competition in the Asia Oceania Research Organization on genital infections and neoplasia 
AOGI and India National Conference 2011. And he's also recipient of Srimati Kunti Marotra Award for the best published paper uh, by the IAPM in 2013, Dr. V.R. Kanalkar Award for 2017, and best oral proffered paper, Cytocon 2018, by Indian Academy of Cytology, Goa. Included as a fellow of College of American Pathologists and awarded Certificate of Appreciation for Member Marker uh, as Research Panel on CAP 2009 and 10. Sir is Certified Enable Assessor and Treasurer of Indian Academy of Cytology. is Associate Editor of IJPM, IJC, BMC, Cancer and Outreach Editor of Cytopathology Journal. Edited first special issue of IJPM on Ganek Pathology. This is very recent, 2020. And Sir has been organizing secretary of many conferences and former convener of bone and soft tissue, uh, this DMG at Tata Memorial Hospital and editor of Grossing Book of Tumors. He has written five chapters also. Uh, with this uh, introduction, I request Dr. Bharat Rekhi Sir to take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Sujata, Dr. Bosle. Uh, a very warm welcome to everybody and thanks for the kind invitation. I'm really pleased and honored to be speaking today on the uh, pathology day. I think it's a very auspicious day for all the pathologists. Uh, and I would like to share my talk on the endometrial neoplasms. Uh, can I share my screen, madam? Okay, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. Yes. Okay, so I'm here to present on the biopsy interpretation of the endometrial neoplasms and very much uh, thanks for the opportunity. The plan of my talk or learning objectives is going to be we we'll look at the background of endometrial carcinomas, the recent WHO 2020 classification, the fifth edition, what is new that has come up in this uh, physical. Importantly, the prerequisites for interpretation of the endometrial biopsy, the diagnostic challenges that we handle, especially on the biopsies and how to overcome these challenges. We'll see the role of our good friend immunistochemistry chemistry with some case examples and importantly, molecular evolution of endometrial carcinomas that is uh, up on the horizon as part of the fascicle also. And finally, we'll wrap up the talk with some takeaways. So endometrial carcinomas overall are relatively uncommon tumors, but they are on the rise. They form the fourth most common cancers in the United States and form 0.9% of the overall cancers at various body sites. They form 2.1% of the female cancers and they are increasing and thereby associated with the increase in the cancer-related mortality. Presently in the United States, these are the most common carcinomas in the female genital tract. Of course, with ovary, these are on the rise. At Tata Hospital, we see them forming about 154 cases annually that we see at our hospital. And uh, coming towards the approach is uh, what we need, the prerequisites. Importantly here is to focus on the clinical history, whether the patient is postmenopausal with abnormal uterine bleeding, that's the uh, most common presentation. Then of course, it's important to know whether the patient has taken any hormonal intake because when you're interpreting a biopsy, uh, the hormonal changes, you know, that can masquerade malignancy and they can look atypical. Importantly, whether the patient has taken tamoxifen for, you know, breast carcinoma, which can have a spectrum of changes ranging from the metaplasias to hyperplasias to even carcinomas. We always set most times uh, fall back on the imaging results, essentially ultrasound. That's one of the questions I pose to the residents who are posted in DMG, that what is the normal thickness of the endometrium? That's 1.4 centimeters. And that can vary accordingly with terms of the age and the various presentations the patient has. So these can be 1.5% in patients who have taken some hormonal therapy. During pregnancy, it can be less or more. In uh, postmenopausal women, we'll generally expect that this could be lesser and if it's uh, normally, but if it's getting more, then it's of concern. That's the time when the uh, oncologist uh, with the imaging results would consider with the symptomatology of the patient to subject her to a biopsy. It's important to be able to type the endometrial tissue according to the age 
the date of onset of LMP in case of hormonal intake. Again, that's again one question I ask the residents. Uh, and we don't have to date the endometrium in terms of, because when we're looking at lesions in terms of the neoplasia, it's important and just sufficient to be able to say whether it's, you know, uh, proliferative or security as a part of the normal endometrium. We are seeing that. And of course, then we see further uh, atypical changes ranging from, you know, preceding hyperplasia to atypical or carcinoma. And again, uh, history of hormonal intake, if available, uh, can help us to interpret certain changes if you are seeing abnormal. So, like I mentioned, dating is not required and typing is enough, whether it's proliferative or secretory or early secretory is a part of the uh, normal endometrium that we are seeing. Again, important issue is to address the adequacy. What's, how much is adequate? That's kind of been a debate amongst various uh, pathologists. So what comes uh, reasonable as a part of one of the uh, lectures and also publications by Dr. McLavich from uh, Belfast is that uh, presence of endometrial tissue, that is glands and stroma, as long as it is access accessible, that you can assess, seems enough. Now, uh, it's been again, you know, how much is enough? So there's been a publication in the International Journal of Gynec Pathology that about 10 strips of endometrium could be enough, but that's not what we need to demand at all times. If we are able to use our judgment towards being able to interpret on the even lesser number of these strips of endometrium, as long as they are interpretable and they have significant findings, we should go ahead. So ideally it would be 10 strips because it takes care that you have very less false negative cases. That will be uh, about, you know, you have 100% chances to crack the lesion if it's there. And of course, uh, uh, if it's, uh, we can use terminologies like accessible or not accessible, you know, uh, apart from the adequate. And if you can't assess anything, you can call it inadequate. That's the time when you can, you don't see anything. So uh, as long as you can interpret the glands and stroma, I think it's good enough to say at least it is accessible because you can mention you are able to interpret that the uh, biopsy site is uh, correctly and that's the endometrial cavity has been entered. And important again is if you're saying inadequate and imaging wise there is abnormal thickness that calls in for a repeat biopsy. So that's how we can use terminologies like, uh, you know, if you're seeing less, you can say, it is accessible, but if you have any uh, abnormal findings, significant on imaging, uh, go ahead for a repeat biopsy. Now, what we need to formulate as a part of the pathology report is what I strongly believe in is should be scientifically correct and clinically useful. So we include the parameters that make sense towards the management and it shouldn't be very verbose. Essentially, we uh, furnish the diagnosis that what is it? Is it a lesion in terms of the hyperplasia or atypical hyperplasia or carcinoma and further subtypes? Importantly, when we are able to decide upon a diagnosis of carcinoma, we need to furnish parameters that will further influence uh, the treatment because you have uh, lesions like atypical hyperplasia or endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia and carcinoma well differentiated that can be candidates for non-surgical treatment like high dose progesterone therapy. In contrast to high grade serous morphologies where uh, adjuvant treatments will be contemplated and in the hysterectomy specimen, when you, once you're able to say whether it's involving more than half the thickness, uh, that will go for a, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, in terms of adjuvant treatment as well, including radiation therapy. And finally, certain parameters that tell how will the tumor behave. We know serous carcinomas behave aggressively, and that is why they are, can become candidates for adjuvant treatment. In terms of the biopsy, it's essential and important that we say whether it's a carcinoma and further, we attempt to grade the endometrial carcinoma and subtype the various components or the various histologies that I'll come to. So this is the recent WHO classification that stratifies uh, carcinomas that I'll be focusing in my talk. You know, we won't take uh, uh, upon the mesenchymal tumors because the talk is related to the biopsies and mesenchymal tumors are generally dealt on the excised specimens. So in terms of the uh, uh, tumors of the uterine corpus, we look at whether the lesions are related to endometrial hyperplasia without atypia or atypical hyperplasia of the endometrium. We don't use those four categories of the simple hyperplasia without atypia, with atypia, complex without and uh, with. So atypical hyperplasia of endometrium or the endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia equates to the complex atypical hyperplasia. So essentially is that we have gone away with the uh, four type four classes and we restrict ourselves to whether this hyperplasia is without atypia or whether there's an atypia in the hyperplasia, which could be complex. 
the carcinomas have come into four different flavors. These are molecularly defined now, and they have this uh, corresponding histopathological features that I'll come into more detail. You have the pole E ultra mutated endometrial carcinomas, and you have the mismatch repair deficient endometrial carcinomas, the P53 mutant endometrial carcinomas, and no specific molecular profile. So that's made a big leap in the diagnosis of endometrial carcinomas coming in molecular subtypes. But that's not to be very much uh, worried about. We can still use morphology, which continues to be the gold standard because these uh, molecular features are very nicely translated in certain uh, morphological subtypes. Then important is to identify if there's a serous carcinoma. It's a very, very important uh, type because it's going to influence, uh, you know, adjuvant treatments in a significant manner. Clear cell carcinoma is clearly a chemo insensitive tumor, again, an aggressive type two. I'll come uh, more in detail with some case examples. You can have mixed carcinomas, including various components. Maybe there's an endometrioid with a coexisting clear cell. And it's important to stratify if you're seeing additional components, especially the aggressive types. Then there are rare types of mesonephric adenocarcinomas, and of course, uh, mucinous carcinomas, gastrointestinal types, squamous carcinomas, and mesonephric like carcinomas. We've got away with the term that malignant mixed malignant tumors. We use the terms carcinosarcoma, and these are in the category of the carcinomas. We do not include these in sarcomas anymore. And of course, uh, we need to be abreast to the lesions which can look like tumors. That is the polyp, metaplasias, and rarely air stellar reactions. So the limitations and challenges that one can face, uh, including us at the Dershe Cancer Referral Center, when we see a lot of cases coming for review is, uh, there could be limitation of the parenting blocks. And sometimes we mention, okay, can you submit more blocks? Because we know these tumors are very heterogeneous. So you can see different components, you know, in different aspects of the tumor uh, blocks. You might see some hyperplasia in one, and if it's been split to do labs, it could be carcinoma going to the other, and that could lead to a discrepancy. Uh, suboptimal processing can clearly translate into compromising the morphological interpretation because we know the grading of carcinomas is based on the uh, nuclear characteristics and also the growth pattern. So morphology, including cytomorphological features, are very essential, and therein lies the value of the processing. So intrinsic heterogeneity uh, within the neoplastic lesions can, like I mentioned, uh, that can lead to errors if we don't have all the blocks or the, all the tissue that has been processed. And we need to be knowing that there are certain limits of endometrial carcinomas that I'll come in more detail. So another challenge could be a uh, lack of IHC in molecular genetics. Of course, molecular, I will say to a small extent, but IHC is very essential now because uh, there is to an extent, you know, you can resolute or your eye can re resolve the various subtypes, but uh, there is a good amount of inter-observer variability, including in the uh, experts trying to differentiate various tumor components, be it serous versus clear cell or endometrial. So you need to have IHCs uh, to a good reasonable extent, but molecular, of course, to a very small extent. So this is a list of the lesions that can mimic a hyperplasia and a carcinoma. You can have artifacts, which I think you don't need to focus too much into. Of course, if you've seen, that's important that you are aware that these are artifacts. Cystic atrophy, you could see a component of the lower uterine segment in form of the endocervical epithelium coming towards with the endometrial epithelium. Disordered proliferative endometrium is just almost the same spectrum of the hyperplasia that you will call in a younger patient. But in a perimenopausal patient, lady, you might have the disordered proliferative endometrium that can masquerade a carcinoma or a atypical hyperplasia. You need to look more uh, clearly towards the nuclear details. Secretory endometrium or aristellar reaction, uh, which we don't see too often because we have the cases referred as well, you know, uh, the carcinoma is coming more often. But I think at the community hospital, uh, one can be fraught with this uh, challenge of a, uh, but of course, yesterday itself, I had one case which was actually secretory endometrium interpreted as carcinoma. So that can happen. Rarely you can have benign papillary proliferations that can again masquerade as serious carcinoma. Endometritis is again something to look for, which can be a mimic. And of course, polyp, which can be over as well as underdiagnosed. So that's one unusual case I came across in cytology. Of course, cytology is not what is practiced usually, but of course, we see the specimens coming in different um, ways. And this was actually dismissed as um, negative, uh, you know, uh, thinking that this is perhaps some endometrial proliferation only it could be proliferative. But if you see the arch architectural pattern is complex, you see this papillary foldings, just like the fern in a tree branches. And um, correspondingly, the biopsy of this particular patient was interpreted as serous carcinomas. 
But if you see carefully, uh, you don't see psychological itch. They are very uniform, banal looking cells kind of little overlap, but you don't see at all atypical significant atypia, but the pattern is more complex here. So uh, in a review, I felt that this perhaps represents a complex uh, hyperplasia, and that can fall into the spectrum of atypical hyperplasia because it's the abnormal architectural pattern. You don't see significant psychological atypia, and that's a very rare lesion. So this was a complex atypical papillary hyperplasia, and the immunos fell into place. So you have this strong ER expression, you have low K67 or MIP1. Um, we had uh, WT1, which rules out a serious carcinoma related to ovary, because you can have at all times, if you see papillary proliferations, uh, which are malignant in the uterus, you need to make sure that it's nothing coming from the ovary. And WT1 takes care because it will come uh, positive in ovarian serous tumors, not in endometrial. It's very rare. You will see WT1 coming in endometrial carcinoma. So this was negative. A was very low in P53, you can see is the wild type focal expression. So important is to not say P53 is positive or negative in uh, lesions of the, or the tumors of the female genital tract. It's important to say whether it's wild type or mutation type. And I'll come more in detail about how we interpret the mutation types or the wild types of P53. So this was a complex papillary hyperplasia, a rare lesion. That's another case I came across uh, with a suspicion of malignancy. And um, that's kind of a wow situation, I feel, because you know you have something treatable. Of course, well future endometrial carcinomas are also not very bad tumors because they can be candidates for non-surgical interventions. But this is what I say the residents not to miss. And I think uh, if you see granulomas here, you can see very distinct granulomas and giant cells and these endometrial glands. So this was... Uh, uh, endometritis of a granulomatous type. And important in endometritis is to look for plasma cells. You can see in plenty across this entire lesion, the plasma cells are seen. And apart from the uh, Langen giant cells and granulomas, there was necrosis. So this was a necrotizing granulomatous endometritis, possibly of Cox etiology. Uh, unless you demonstrate AFBs, um, I do not call something as tubercular. So we can say that possibility because you have the necrosis, you have the uh, granulomas and giant cells. So that can be a mimic to malignancy. Coming towards endometritis, it's important to know that plasma cells uh, are normal in cervix, but they are abnormal in endometrium. And it's not that one needs to strive all the time to see plasma cells, but of course, you, if you see other features of endometritis, one needs to see surely to call endometritis is based on the presence of the plasma cells. And endometritis is generally associated with the proliferative aspect rather than the secretory wherein you will see more of the lymphoid cells. But if you go ahead to see more lymphoid aggregates, you see mostly in postmenopausal women that can happen in the biopsies. And uh, plasma cell markers are not very useful because these can also highlight the other cells apart from the plasma cells. So it's important just to see whether you're seeing aggregates of plasma cells to think about probably it could be uh, endometriitis. And if you see granulomas, it could be possibility of Cox etiology. Looking closely towards the more diagnostic challenges and neoplasia that we see, it's important to differentiate hyperplasia without atypia versus endometrial atypical hyperplasia or endometrial intrapetial neoplasia called synonymously or also complex atypical hyperplasia. We don't use terms like simple hyperplasia without atypia and simple hyperplasia with atypia. These are not uh, recommended. So essentially hyperplasia without atypia and with atypia including EIH. Then you have uh, atypical hyperplasia versus FIGO grade one, especially in younger patients. And that doesn't have to be too much of fuss because both these can be candidates for non-surgical intervention in certain cases with high dose progesterone therapy. So it's important to see whether it's a hyperplasia without atypia versus complex or atypical. Identifying aggressive histological subtypes or components, be it serous, clear cell is important. And of course, mesenchymal elements in a carcinosarcoma because they can connote a high aggressive clinical course. So how do we overcome diagnostic challenges is to look at the careful histopathological clues towards uh, significant atypia, which we will see in atypical hyperplasia versus a hyperplasia. Squamous differentiation, whether it's metaplastic or it's malignant. So it's either uh, a part of the C, uh, hyperplasia atypical, you can see uh, more squamous modules, or also in well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma. Then if it's a malignant squamous, uh, you will call it an adenosquamous. And if it's a frankly, rarely squamous carcinoma uh, individual, you will say so after ruling out a carcinoma of the cervix, which will be more common. Caveats include polyps, endometritis, I alluded to cyclical phase, uh, telescoping of glands, dysynchronous phase, and atypical adenomyofibromas. So these one needs to be aware of 
not to get into the trap of overdiagnosing endometrial carcinomas. And of course, uh, using immunohistochemistry and genetics to our uh, benefit for the patient, trying to accurately identify the aggressive subtypes. And at all times, interpreting your features in a radiological context. So if there is something abnormal, just make sure that you're looking at what is the thickness of the endometrium that helps. Uh, now, looking at the uh, criteria and the diagnostic challenge towards uh, separating uh, the endometrioid, endometrial atypical hyperplasia, or the EIN or the CH, synonymous terms with endometrial carcinoma, the criteria is myometrial invasion, but that we don't see on the biopsies. And it's best decided on hysterectomy. It's been seen that 15 to 50% hysterectomies uh, with diagnosis of EAH or CH or EIN had endometrial, endometrial carcinomas, depending on the different thresholds of the pathologist. And 30% uh, carcinomas might lack in vision as a result of limited sampling. So the risk of carcinomas in these lesions, atypical hyperplasias, uh, ranges from 29 to 100%, depending on the, the various thresholds of the reporting pathologists. And what one can use uh, to some extent, trying to differentiate uh, hyperplasia without atypia versus with atypia, including carcinoma, is a loss of P10 mutation, PAX2 and MMR, which can happen in certain cases of uh, uh, carcinomas. And of course, it will happen in uh, well differentiated carcinomas and also in hyperplasias with atypia. It won't happen in cases without atypia. And that's an example we all know it's very easy to clinch a diagnosis of endometrial carcinoma with myometrial invasion that we will see uh, on the hysterectomy. But this is the challenge to call something like a atypical hyperplasia versus a carcinoma. And you can see prominent squamous differentiation on this part of this. Uh, slide. And you see this back-to-back uh, -back arrangement of glands with some complex papillary pattern. So whether it's a AAH or whether it's a carcinoma, that's a challenge. And that doesn't have to be too much, you know, um, uh, dealt with a lot of stress because these both can be candidates for non-surgical intervention. Uh, that is the high-dose progesterone therapy. And let's look at the other examples. I'll come back in a moment to this case of challenge. When you see the glands, which are more in terms over this stroma, you start thinking whether this is a hyperplasia. And if it's localized, it could be a polyp. So this particular case was called, you know, in terms of its high gland to stroma ratio with dilatation of the glands. And you see still the polarity maintained of the um, uh, cells. And uh, there is some pseudo stratification that this was called, perhaps it could be a hyperplasia or polyp. It turned out to be a polyp. And that's when the things become more sort of uh, complex and more atypical in terms of the growth pattern. You can see this complex arrangement of the back-to-back -back little endometrial glands. And you see the complex pattern when I say, you see this bridging, crib reforming, and that's the time one needs to start thinking towards the complex atypical hyperplasia if you see. And now the polarity is lost. You can see this uh, irregular arrangement of these nuclei. And that's the concern towards a carcinoma. I call this an uh, atypical hyperplasia or CAH, and uh, it turned out to be a carcinoma well differentiated. So that can uh, happen because, and uh, when I say carcinoma, is certain clues that I'll come to in a moment uh, to be able, and that's the example that I initially showed. Uh, when you see the gland destruction with these neutrophilic aggregates, you see back-to-back -back arrangement of the glands, and you see foamy histocytes sort of telling you that there's hardly any stroma in the glands. Of course, squamous differentiation can be a part of the whole lesion, and that's what I call as a well-differentiated uh, grade one endometrial adenocarcinoma. So the terminology that can happen to cases like this is uh, suggestive for, suspicious for, cannot exclude or bordering on endometrial carcinoma that are occasionally used in younger patients. And that's not wrong because I think the pathologist is going to be uh, perhaps conservative, especially in younger women. And what is essential is that you are able to communicate this with your treating oncologist because again, there are possibilities of non-surgical interventions for well-differentiated lesions or atypical hyperplasias similarly. That's an example of an endometrial carcinoma well differentiated with mucinous differentiation. You can have a range of patterns from below glandular to ciliated to secretory as part of the well differentiated endometrial adenocarcinomas. And what we've been reporting in terms of the types, uh, which is clinically understandable, is to see whether it's type 1 or type 2. And type 1 is endometrioid, and type 2, like clear cell and serous are. Uh, non-endometrial. That's been more easily for the treating clinicians because they can't remember a lot of terms because for type 2, they mean that they might have to contemplate for the adjuvant treatments. And in case of mixed patterns, it's good to allude to the individual uh, tumor component. Serous component, if it's uh, forming more than 25%, is called and treated as serous carcinomas. And the term papillary is very unclear because I showed you from a uh, right from hyperplasia to carcinomas, it can be seen, and that doesn't quite help if you say papillary adenocarcinoma. 
But you see endometrial carcinoma, you create it and you call serious, that's essential and important. So the, coming to the clinical relevance in terms of uh, two uh, stratifications that we've been doing for quite some time as part of the Bachmann's uh, hypothesis of dualistic uh, you know, types of endometrial carcinomas, you have non-surgical interventions, uh, non-surgical treatments for the type 1 in contrast to type 2, uh, wherein one has to think about the adjuvant treatments, including CTRD. And that's again coming uh, towards the well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma I just mentioned. You can see the back-to-back -back arrangement of glands. Uh, you know, you see the neutrophilic aggregates destroying all, you know, with some subtle necrosis as part of the tumor. And how do we grade carcinomas is one, two, and three, because this is not a very uh, perfect, it could be an inter-observer variability. But what we can um, utilize is if it's less than or equal to 5% of the non-glandular, non-squamous growth solid pattern. That's what we need to focus on. We call that as grade one. If it's six to 50%, it's grade two, and more than 50% is grade three. And low grade includes grade one and two, and a grade three is uh, grade three, high grade. So you can escalate the grade if you are seeing the architectural pattern towards more differentiated type. If you see more than 50% cells showing a higher nuclear uh, grade and your architectural pattern is still towards the well, you can call that as a, you can escalate the grade to one. But that doesn't mean for every nuclear you have to look, you know, it's going higher or not. If it's more than 50% of the cells showing you a higher nuclear grade, even if your architectural pattern is towards the lower, you can escalate by a factor of one. So serious carcinomas um, are not graded as a part of the figure one, two, and three, because by default, they are type two high grade carcinomas. And what are important points to know is, uh, you know, uh, grade two gets overdiagnosed and overall grade one is the most common. So it's important that we just not on the basis of little moderate, if we have escalated the grade to grade two, because that can lead to an easy surgical intervention when any younger patient could still get a benefit of non-surgical and she could have the fertility sparing, uh, you know, treatment uh, assigned to her. So grading, like I mentioned, is influences the surgical management, of course, with the other histopathological parameters that are decided on the hysterectomy of the patient has undergone, be it the myometrial invasion, then when the time they'll offer adjuvant radiation therapy. And grading high and typing serious influence adjuvant treatments because they give contemplate chemotherapies in serious carcinomas because they have chances for metastasis. So it's been seen that there's a fair amount of inter-observer variability in the subtyping the hybrid endometrial carcinoma. There are three experts, what experts, Dr. Gilkes, Esther Olivia, and Rob Soslo, wherein they found in their study the major concerns were to serious versus serious. And now that can be resolved with certain markers like napsin and hepatocyte nuclear factor. Serious versus grade three endometrial carcinomas that we in our usual practice, you know, have the challenge. And serious versus undifferentiated, that might not be too much because it might not influence too much in terms of the treatment. Of course, the second is uh, more can be difficult. So, uh, like I mentioned, you can have scenarios towards uh, non surgical treatments for endometrial carcinomas, and you can come across cases uh, wherein the diagnosis of endometrial was assigned and the patient was offered high dose progesterone therapy. And that is, you see the post treated specimens that we've seen occasionally. So what you start beginning to see is that there's a decrease in the glands of these well differentiated, which are post treated now. You will see decrease mitosis, decrease atypia. There will be a range of metaplasias. You will start to see an importantly stromal destabilization because that is a progestational effect that you will be seeing that the patients will be offered. And of course, papillary and cribriform architectures. So a pragmatic approach towards handling these post treated specimens is to see whether the lesion has progressed, it's persistent, or has it responded towards partial or complete. And that's again one more challenge that we come across who done it situation. When you're seeing the lesion uh, related to the lower uterine segment or it's the cervix, so it's either cervical carcinoma or it's an endometrial carcinoma. And you can fall back on these, uh, utilize this four marker panel that is the ERY min 10 and uh, P16 and CEA, wherein you can see a block-like staining pattern in uh, endocervical carcinomas and uh, CA positivity in contrast to ER and Ymentin, which will come in endometrial carcinomas. But that's not perfect way, you know? You have to use your morphological features because endocervical carcinomas, E60, they are HPV driven, driven or might not be. You will see more apical mitosis and apical apoptosis in endocervical carcinomas. And of course, you see the diffuse E16 expression along with CEA. You won't see Ymentin diffuse, which you will see more in endometrial carcinomas. And of course, they will show ER positivity as well. 
So coming towards how immunohistochemistry can be utilized in endometrial carcinomas is, like I mentioned, ERPR by maintaining positive is towards endometrial carcinomas, and P16 blocks staining and CEA towards endocervical, but that doesn't happen all the times because you can see non-HPV associated endocervical carcinomas as well. So P53 abnormal expression in P16 uh, is more towards the serous in the context of endometrium now. If you see a tumor hydrate and you see P53 with uh, P16, in contrast to endometrial wherein you might not see this block staining pattern with P16, and you will see loss of added A and loss of P10 towards endometrial carcinomas. So that's the way you're trying to separate serous versus endometrial hydrate of the endometrium. And endometrium carcinomas will show you again nuclear beta catenin uh, in more than one types. So uh, one needs to know that IHC can uh, differentiate endometrial versus endocervical, but if you have an endometrial carcinoma in the cervix, which is rare, in contrast to of the endometrium, they will be the same uh, immunistic chemical profile. So then lies the value of the uh, location or the epicenter of the tumor. So MIM1 and MP53 are useful to separating aristella reaction from carcinomas because you won't see P53 abnormal expression in aristella, which can look morphologically atypical, and you will see a low MIM1 in contrast to carcinomas. And like I mentioned, loss of P10 and ARID1 can be utilized towards diagnosis of endometrial carcinomas, especially in hybrid, when you're trying to separate from a serious carcinomas. So that's an example of a grade two endometrial carcinoma. You can see a sort of more bridging and perhaps more um, solid pattern. And that's important to know whether you're seeing more crowded glands versus a solid pattern. Here I was in the middle of perhaps this is more glandular, but I could see the nuclear atypia in more than 50% cells is definitely more than a well differentiated. So I assigned this as grade two. And you can see low grade, that is the grade one and grade two show uh, mostly in the vast majority of cases, a strong ER and PR positive expression. And this is uh, one one can come across as a challenge calling this as a hybrid carcinoma. You can see the nuclear ATPI is clearly high and you see a papillary proliferation with areas of necrosis. So that's the time one needs to resort to some immunohistochemical stains, trying to further subtype this tumor, which is otherwise a hybrid adenocarcinoma. You can see ER is one of the stains that we follow here is negative. So that's taking away the possibility of endometrial carcinomas. Of course, serious carcinomas do show ER positivity, which can be a little lower. And what this tumor shows is diffuse P53 expression and block-like staining expression of uh, P16. So this is called the mutation expression of P53. If you see complete uh, diffuse intense staining in 75 to 85 or more cells, that's what you call as missense mutation. You can see a, a complete loss of uh, staining. That's what you also is one of the uh, mutation of P53. And then you can see cytoplasmic staining. Again, that is becoming in the uh, mutation type expression of P53. If you see focal expression, that's called wild type. So it's important to mention whether it's a mutation or a wild type expression. And this is what is a block-like staining pattern of the P16 to reinforce the diagnosis of serous carcinomas. So important again, parameter in terms of, you know, what you see in serous carcinomas are the intra-epithelial carcinoma. That's one of the studies my colleague Dr. Kedar with his student, uh, Dr. Aarti performed, and they found that you can see serous uh, intra-epithelial carcinomas with or without invasive carcinomas in 40% cases. And what is important is that polyps, which can be overdiagnosed as carcinomas, can also be associated with serious component. You need to put uh, P53 and stains like P16 to identify those components which can be seen in an endometrial polyp. If you see atopia, so it's always good to see nuclear details in every polyp and at the same time not overdiagnose a polyp as carcinoma. So polyps are very important to be examined. So that's again one pattern of a hybrid carcinoma. You can see a some metascalcification in this particular case, and you see a more papillary pattern towards this uh, uh, tumor. It's a frankly a hybrid carcinoma. That's the time you would start wonder that this could perhaps be a serious carcinoma. Excuse me. Uh, and you utilize stains like P53, which is showing again an abnormal expression. You see WT1. So this points towards more ovarian type morphology, but of course you can see WT1 coming rarely in uterine serous carcinomas also. So that's a good mark to differentiate serous uterine versus ovary in a context because rarely uterine serous can also show WT1 expressions. So that's important to uh, consider this marker. And also to know that there are certain differentials benign for a serous carcinoma that we need to make sure, uh, you know, when you're looking uh, cases at the community health center with a lot of endometrial biopsies, there could be a papillary syncytial metaplasia. Of course, I don't have a nice example to show uh, to you, which can happen in a florid endometrial breakdown. And important is that these can be ER low, 
wider, but P16 strong. So we don't go too much towards one particular marker because anything can happen with any marker. And of course, rare forms of papillary hyperplasia can masquerade as serious carcinoma. You can see occasionally some of it is calcification also in endometrial carcinoma. So that's not like if you're seeing the some of my bodies, it's going to be a serious carcinoma. That's a newer variant that has come up, you know, and it's a lot of excitement towards the mesonephric like endometrial carcinomas, adrocarcinomas. I borrowed this slide uh, from the WHO classical. You can see this very thyroid like appearance. Uh, you know, again, this tumor type is associated with an aggressive clinical course. So that's the uh, couple of cases we've seen uh, in our uh, practice. You see this again, a frankly hybrid carcinoma. If you begin to realize that you're seeing some hobnailing pattern, maybe some clearing and some inclusion, some, uh, you know, eosinophilic material across. That's the time one needs to start thinking about clear cell carcinomas. You don't want to miss this component because these are aggressive and they're chemo insensitive. And this is the markers that you can utilize. Napsin is a very good substitute if you don't have hepatocyte nuclear factor. And important is to know that it comes as a very granular ex expression. You won't see like a very cytoplasmic expression. You will see a very dirty sort of granular expression because it's like an enzyme. So that's one of the questions I ask my residents, how do you interpret an absent expression? So it comes uh, very useful, be it carcinomas of the ovary clear cell or the endometrium or the cervix. So it comes very useful. Paxate tells the molarian origin. P53 wild type expression is seen more. Of course, you can see P3 mutation also rarely in clear cell carcinomas and they are WT1 negative. So napsin and WT1 are mutually exclusive and that's what can help you to differentiate serious from uh, clear cell carcinomas is part of one of our studies that we did. We found that ovarian clear cell carcinomas show napsin and uh, uh, serious carcinomas show WT1 and they don't uh, come together unless you're seeing both the components which can happen in endometrium. So coming to another example of this uh, sort of more uh, malignant stromal component, you start to wonder that perhaps this could be a sarcoma. And you, do, you see the other section is showing you endometrial component. This is a carcinosarcoma, and we don't use the term malignant mixed malarian tumor. We, in the WHO classical, uh, it's the carcinosarcoma because to avoid confusion, these are treated and managed as carcinomas. Of course, they are bad um, actors. They don't respond very well. And that's another example of the carcinosarcoma you can see here. But apart from the malignant stroma and the glands, what you see is the uh, more pink cells that start to wonder perhaps this could be rhabdomyoblastic cells. And that's when reinforces your impression of a rhabdomyoblastic differentiation in this carcinosarcoma, which is heterologous elements. You can see cartilage and bone also. These are the more aggressive uh, subtypes of the carcinomas. So there are any limitations in the morphological classification towards this being non-reproducible with interobservable variability in terms of the various components that I mentioned in the one of the AGSP articles that I just alluded to. And it's been an imperfect reflection of the tumor biology. Of course, we've been trying to reach out towards the underlying molecular subtypes, and that's not to get worried. It's clearly, you know, you see type 1 endometrial carcinomas that have been associated with the loss of P10, and you can see the NMR uh, instability and uh, mismatch repair beta cadetin WT1 driving type 1 endometrial or the endometrial carcinomas in contrast to type 2, where you see the mutation of P53 in form of diffuse P53 expression. And you can also see the HER2 new overexpression P16 inactivation leading to diffuse block-like staining pattern in type 2 serous carcinomas. So what has come up more now clearly in 2013 is the uh, cancer genome atlas, which has stratified endometrial carcinomas in more integrated genomic approach into four flavors, including pole E, uh, mutated, the ultra mutated uh, tumor, then the microsatellite instability, hypermutated, that's MSI. You have the copy number low and the copy number high. So the pole E forms about 7% of the tumors, and you can identify only with the uh, genetics. You don't have a marker as a substitute. In contrast to the other types that you can uh, do with the IHCs because you have the MMR4 protein, uh, you know, the panel that you can utilize for identifying the MMR deficient. I use the term MSI if you're doing genetically and MMR if you're doing immunostochemically. And these form a sizable number of about 28% of the cases of endometrial carcinomas. The copy number low are the ones which are mostly grade one and grade two. When you have ruled out the other molecular three subtypes, you can call something as copy number low. And copy number high includes serous when you see about 26% of such cases where you can pick up with the diffuse or the mutation or the null mutation type of the uh, P3 and normal expressions, what we call it. 
So in terms of our experience at Poli, we've just started, we've uh, cherry picked about 30 cases and we found three cases showing the uh, Poli mutation. You have the exon 9, 13 and 14 with these hotspot mutations that we look for at PU286R, which is the most common. Share with you some examples of this hybrid, otherwise looking at the carcinoma. We're tempted to think perhaps this could be serious, but you have DP53 is the wild type here. So whenever you see this hybrid carcinoma, it may be youngish patients or age is no bar, but importantly, you see a lot of inflammatory component as a part of this tumor, and this is ER positive. So this is one of the uh, morphological triggers that I utilize for considering this could perhaps be a poly mutated tumor. And why it is important is because even though they look high grade, they don't behave uh, more aggressively in contrast to serous carcinoms. That's a very important point of identifying poly ultra mutated uh, tumors, which come as a part of the DNA polymerase, you know, uh, the uh, defective proof reading that leads to this ultra mutated forms. So this is, you can see a poly mutation with the uh, change of the, it's a point hotspot mutation. You can see in 286 in particular example of the same case that I mentioned. Another example of this uh, sort of redifferentiated pattern, you see this more differentiated and more undifferentiated areas with long of inflammatory component as part of this tumor showing poly mutation. Another example, this was called as hybrid, but finally was grade two because you see some small component um, more solid apart from this very differentiated mucinous areas and P53 being wild type. You see this focal expression, even though it looks more high grade, but it's a wild type expression. You see uh, ER positivity, of course, inflammatory component as part of the tumor showing the poly uh, mutation seen on this uh, standard sequencing. So uh, the techniques that one can utilize for identifying uh, the mutation is by rt pcr followed by sequences that we do at TMH. NGS, which is more express, uh, expensive, but it's high throughput, massive parallel sequencing, when you can also see the MSI if you have it in your panel. So you can right away test for the four mutation subtypes because they have the uh, clinical bearing in terms of the, uh, especially the prognosis and also towards some extent towards the therapeutic. In situ hybridization has been also tested, um, utilized for identifying poly mutations. And what is important, which you see as a part of the uh, morphological features in, in, in poly mutated tumors, as uh, coming from the seminal publication, Modern Pathology by the Memorial Sloan Ketting, Dr. Rob Soslo is, that these are mostly hybrid tumors. They have lymphocytic infiltrates. They have a very ambiguous morphology. So you can't resolute from your eye that this is going to be a poly mutated tumor, or you have a marker towards this. You can think about it and you have to test to call something as poly mutated tumor. And these um, can have P53 mutation. They're called dual classifiers. You can have two at the same time, P53 abnormal as well as the poly, uh, but those should not be called the serious because serious are aggressive and they will go candidates for a more chemotherapy and uh, radiation therapy and they behave worse in contrast to poly which can be hybrid and that's another recent uh, publication in 2013 which showed up and mentioned even though they are high grade these have an overall better survival in contrast to serious which are aggressive subtypes which can be p3 abnormal most of the times and that's more uh, you know a clinically uh, important paper that came as a part of the Portic 3 trial, when we tried to look at the uh, carcinomas, which are you know high end risk uh, stratification to see whether you can see adjuvant CTRT versus in the randomized hybrid, you know, the uh, aggressive subtypes of carcinomas, endometrial carcinomas uh, in two arms uh, with CTRT versus, uh, you know, the RT. And they found that the, uh, you, you saw about 7% cases overall have poly mutation, but they had 23% of P53 abnormal tumors. And within that also, there were 12% showing poly. So you can see a poly with a P53 abnormal. And what happened was irrespective of both the arms, wherever there was a poly mutated tumor that uh, fared well. So there was a better survival. So that in lies the importance of identifying poly mutation, even in, in high grade P53 abnormal cancer. So what can come as a rescue if you don't have genetics for all four subtypes, you know, to classify is use IHC that we do at TMH as the uh, proactive uh, mutation risk classifier that comes from the Vancouver group. You just need to have a poly mutation testing and the rest can be taken care of by the IHC, be the MMR. And I've just mentioned you how you can see the abnormal expression with IHC. And after you've ruled out the three subtypes, you will see these grade one, grade two are actually non-copy number high uh, as a third category. Category, which is the most common category. So coming towards how IHC can be utilized in the uh, interpretation of genetics is one of our studies that we published in Annals of Diagnostic Pathology, looking at the MMR deficient tumors, 50 uh, tumors that we identified as MMR deficient. And we saw what are the morphological triggers that's caused the ones 
first study from our country on the MMR deficient endometrial carcinomas. And certain features that are useful that one can utilize is if you see a tumor in a youngish patient in a lower uterine segment, high grade, deeply infiltrated, heterogeneous, you have more the endometrial and maybe clear cell component, and showing wild type expression of P53 and PR positive, you can think that this could be an MMR deficient tumors. And in terms of the four panel markers, you have the MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, and MSH6. The MLH1 and PMS2 loss generally occurs together. It's most common. And uh, 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 in contrast to the MSH2 and MSH6. So MSH2 and MSH6 are pointers towards the Lynch syndrome. And we've seen patients with more than one carcinomas also harboring either of the MSH2 or a paired loss of MSH2 and MSH6. So MLH1 is the, uh, you know, a more common. It's sporadic in contrast to MSH2 and MSH6 loss, which is more towards the Lynch syndrome. That is uh, one important aspect of identifying the MMR deficient tumors. That's one example of this um, um, lady who had this tumor in the lower uterine segment. Of course, you don't have the very clear cut anatomical landmarks to say something which is, but it's important to know whether the tumor is involving the LUS and simultaneously she had an endometrial carcinoma in the ovary and you can see morphologically showing you know a very uh, differentiated grade one to two rather grade one only endometrial carcinoma but importantly with a clear cell component reinforced with napsinase chaining showing diffuse ear expression and p3 wild type and immunostochemical in the four panel markers you can see the complete loss of mlh1 and pms2 in contrast to msh2 msh6 retained uh, making this tumor as mmr deficient tumor that's another example of this de-differentiated pattern that is again important. You see a, a lymphoepithelioma-like pattern or a de-differentiated pattern in the youngest patient in the lower uterine segment you think about. And these can also show you focal uh, neuroendocrine markers like synaptophysin and chromogranin. So don't get tempted to call these as small cell carcinomas because you can see focal neuroendocrine expression in the undifferentiated component of an endometrial carcinoma, which actually could be de-differentiated. Despite the hybrid morphology, you still see the P53 wild expression. That makes them with the possibility of the MMR. And you can see here uh, the PMS2 MLH1 loss and the retained MSH2 and MSH6 expression. Again, a very lymphoepithelioma like appearance. That's what I was mentioning. Even in the poly mutated tumors, you can see a lot of inflammation, the TILS or the tumor associated lymphocytes, infuriating lymphocytes. So P53 is uh, wild type. Uh, despite you have this very undifferentiated look and you have the loss of MLH1 and PMS2 and MSH2 is uh, retained. So what is important? Uh, essentially is it has a therapeutic connotation. If it's a high grade infiltrative extensive tumor, they can contemplate for immunotherapy and therein lies a value of testing such tumors for pdl one expression. And that stems from one of the first publications that we did, you know, uh, from, uh, uh, from our country. I identified two cases of MMR deficient tumors, which occurred in patients who had uh, adrenal metastasis and lymph node metastasis. And unfortunately we couldn't save, you know, despite chemotherapies that were offered to this uh, patients who had uh, extensive uh, metastasis. But of course, now there is hope because if you had an MMR deficient tumor which is spread out, you can think about uh, for immunotherapy or the checkpoint in it because, of course, then lies the value of testing these for uh, PDL1. That's a good marker. So finally, you can how you can utilize molecular genetics is in form of a algorithmic approach. Uh, if you are really looking at the uh, state of the art reporting of the endometrial carcinomas, you see uh, poly mutation be through NG NGS if it's but it's going to be more expensive or through RT PCR. Then if it's not poly mutated, you can go ahead with the MMR testing by IHC. Then if uh, if you see a hybrid pattern, you go for the P53 testing. If it's abnormal, it's going to be either serous or in, in and if it's not showing any of those, it could be a non -cop uh, copy number low uh, kind of tumor. So the challenges we're going to be trying to interpret the molecular classification as the resources, be it IHC and molecular. But of course, IHC seems more feasible. Molecular takes a while to be standardized. And uh, that's what is important. You standardize a test, including quality checks and control, because that's going to influence the quality of the results. And MMR proteins, are, of course, can also be a challenge to standardize, which is very important. So to wrap up my talk, I'd like to mention that histopathology remains the gold standard. Uh, tumor grading and typing are essential features on the endometrial uh, biopsy when we're trying to interpret carcinomas. We need to rule out the other mimics that we can see uh, as a part of the uh, you know uh, tumor tumors that can mimic a carcinoma, be a polyp. But of course, in the polyp also, you need to see whether you're not missing on any intrapedial carcinomas, which can happen. We interpret morphological features in a clinical radiological context, 
which is very important uh, if you're seeing uh, and also if you have a history of hormonal intake because you know uh, clinical radiologically in isolation they might think that this is a carcinoma the patient had a history of hormonal intake you're seeing something abnormal uh, which can lead to a mistaken diagnosis so it's important that we interpret in a clinical radiological context our findings we need to integrate molecular um, results and classification. That's the prime time. And uh, poly, uh, I think, is a good uh, subtype, which is being looked. It's not very common, but it takes care of even though high grade a patient can fare well. But now there are publications that some poly mutated tumors can also be aggressive. So we're looking at, you know, in this in a, in a circle, but uh, circle is all around the morphology. We can utilize IHC because you can clearly see how MMR proteins, it's just a mirror of the MSI, what you will see by genetics. So uh, it's important that you are able to test your uh, cases, at least certain cases, which have the morphological triggers towards for MMR testing. We need to focus on validation if we have any IHC or molecular tests and look at the quality related issues because these are, if you are embarking on any new IHC or any new molecular test, it's essential that we address the quality related issues because that will influence the quality of your tests and translating towards patient care. I have to acknowledge our immunistic chemistry staff, uh, Mrs. Uma Vishaka, Tina, right, and all who uh, work so, uh, you know, uh, throughout the day uh, with the new markers standardizing. I have to particularly thank my colleagues in molecular pathology, Dr. Omshri, Dr. Mandar and Ramya, with whom we uh, did this Herculean task of bringing in the poly test. And we're very happy to be able to offer it. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta Desai, our head who supported us in this endeavor. Uh, my colleagues in the Gynec DMG group, uh, Dr. Keda, Dr. Santosh, Dr. Neha, we, we discuss our cases and of course with our other clinical colleagues, Dr. Amita and the other medical oncologists. And that makes a lot of sense towards what you report is, you know, uh, which is leading to patient care when you interact. And uh, that's, that's very essential towards the patient care. And uh, my resident, Dr. Priya, who helped me with putting out certain cases. And that's a timeless triangle. I believe the presentation at this point in time, we've always focused towards the uh, looking at the uh, clinical details integrating with radiology and pathology. Now it's a prime time to include the new angle in gynec pathology also, and that makes a more holistic uh, approach towards uh, diagnosing endometrial carcinomas with uh, treatment uh, implications. And thank you very much for your patient hearing and also for this opportunity. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It's always great to hear from you. Uh, so, few uh, participants have few questions. Sure. Uh, Dr. Deepak has this question. Uh, how to differentiate between a typical endometrial hyperplasia and well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma on biopsy if no squamous modules are present? Yeah, so that's like, you know, a, a, a very uh, prominent question that we have. And uh, you can see squamous modules even in uh, atypical hyperplasia. So, uh, and, and I would say that it's not a point to get too much stressed about as we have been stressing over research so long to differentiate these two, because these two, like I mentioned, can be candidates for high dose progesterone uh, or progestin therapy. But having said that, it's good that we are able to uh, differentiate. What I use is a back-to-back -back arrangement of glands. You will start seeing uh, the nuclei, they are not losing their polarity. You will see more crowded. You might not see a high-grade atypia, but you will start to see more crowded nuclei all over the gland. You will see a more cribriform pattern, luminal bridging, uh, loss of stroma between the glands, foamy histiocytes, and I look for, you know, if I'm seeing gland destruction by neutrophils or necrosis. These are the clues towards uh, a formulation of a well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma, which I say in a clinical radiological context. But if I see something falling short of these features, I use the term atypical hyperplasia bordering on an endometrial carcinoma. So I think that's also fine as long as you are able to communicate to your oncology. These are the clues that I use to utilize to call something as a well-differentiated endometrial adenocarcinoma. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is asked by Dr. Dheeraj. Uh, is it legitimate to call uh, EIN on biopsy? What are absolute criteria for EIN? Yeah, so uh, we, we, we utilize terminologies like atypical uh, endometrial hyperplasia, which are now, you know, in the spectrum of the endometrial intraepithelial uh, neoplasia in, as part of the new fascicle. So uh, you, you can use, you can use these terminologies, but as long as whatever terminology you use 
is understandable to your oncologist. That is most important. Whatever uh, terms we use, if you're using a, and we do use complex uh, atypical hyperplasia, uh, but our oncologists are knowing that this is a complex atypical hyperplasia. This could be perhaps turning into a well differentiated carcinoma. We're not looking at something going to be grade two or serious. You know, so that's important that CAH or AAH or EIN are used uh, terminologies used, which are understandable to your oncologist. That's the most legitimate way of handling, I think, uh, a, a term. Yes. Uh, next question is from uh, Dr. Wynn. Uh, are atypical mitotic figures helpful in differentiating between atypical hyperplasia and endo adenocarcinoma in endometrial curatings? Well, well, you know, I haven't looked at uh, atypical mitotic figures that way in gynec as much as I look for in soft tissue tumors, you know, as which I do. So that that's more like, uh, but it's, I think, interesting point. Uh, important here is to see, I think, uh, to see is the, uh, uh, the architectural growth pattern is important. And uh, you can see mitosis even in proliferative endometrium. But if you start seeing the glands losing their polarity, you see the atypia, which is coming, vesicular chromatin and mitotic figures popping out. You know, uh, that is the time uh, one needs to think perhaps this is a carcinoma. And of course, with the other features. I haven't dwelled too much into a single isolate atypical mitotic figure. But of, of course, an atypical mitosis, if a polar form you're seeing, that is indicative of aneuploidy. And uh, if I remember, I see more of these atypical mitosis in something like serious carcinomas. We've seen occasional cases of actually something called as hyperplasia, which turned out to be serious because you saw uh, that atypia was so stark, uh, but you, you wouldn't see a lot of, you know, the tumor coming in the curate arch. But if you throw in a P53, it just lights up the whole tumor. And that's the time when I can remember I saw a couple of atypical myotic figures. So I won't use that to differentiate carcinomas, but I remember seeing these more in high-grade carcinomas and atypical myotic figures on its own is an indicator of aneuploidy and worry. So you need to look at the other features uh, to make sure not on one feature you would think about as a carcinoma versus a hyperplasia and use ILCs in certain situations. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Jaffer has this question. Uh, is frozen study has any role in uh, primary diagnosis of endometrial neoplasm? Fortunately, we don't. Uh, we have our oncologists who do not uh, ask these requisitions uh, of frozen because again, uh, the interpretation of uh, uh, the carcinomas versus hyperplasia includes morphological details, which might not be perfect on frozen section. So uh, we don't do frozen, and these are not the part of a clinical practice in oncology of gynec. Frozen in gynec are mostly related to the, uh, if you can say, you know, thickness. Once the uh, there's a preceding diagnosis, and we can say whether there's a, uh, how much is the involvement and the grading that is possible. And we use frozen uh, for, you know, in those situations, if it's more than half or the tumor typing, if you can sort of say that and more towards in ovarian, that's what my area of interest is looking at frozen for ovarian tumors, but not for uh, the, uh, the, the question, I think. What was the question? Just uh, can you just please repeat? Yeah. Uh, is uh, does frozen study has any role in primary diagnosis of endometrial neoplasm? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we don't uh, utilize frozen for primary diagnosis. Okay. Curatage. Now, uh, now you have the curatage samples which are over. You know, we used to have BNC. Now you have the pipel, which gives us lesser tissue. So, and we have to furnish more. It's a world of less, and we have to give more. You know, so curatage, I think, uh, is what we handle. We don't handle uh, frozen for primary diagnosis but only for uh, grading and maybe for more than a thickness is what are, and the lymph node sampling sometimes they decide uh, for further, you know, staging on process. So one last question, uh, Dr. Zacharya, uh, do we routinely use L1 cam IHC in endometrial, endometroid adenocarcinomas? If yeah, so, what is your experience? Yeah, that's a new kid on the block. So we are not doing uh, routinely. We in our routine panel, we are doing ER, PR, and uh, you know P53. Of course, ER immuno is not uh, required in every case of endometrial, but we are doing ER, PR, and P53 uh, as a part of our practice. Uh, we are doing L1 CAM as a request coming from radiation colleagues. So in certain cases, we do when they want to contemplate about a uh, you know a therapeutic intervention related to radiation is the time when they look for an L1 cam expression, uh, if we can. So that's on the basis of a clinical request. We don't do it routinely. Okay. 
थैंक यू सर ओवर टू डॉक्टर कानेटकर मैम थैंक यू डॉक्टर पल्लवी एम आई ऑडिबल Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you yes, very much for uh, a wonderful deliberation on endometrial carcinomas. Your lecture was truly scientifically correct and clinically useful. Reports how a pathology resident to practicing pathologist how they should convey the correct information to the onco pathology uh, onco uh, surgeon. That was uh, nicely covered in your lecture. And as you have given some support to uh, people like us who do not have. ihc markers or uh, genetic or molecular studies available for our every case of uh, endometrial carcinoma by telling us that morphology is still the gold standard but how and which cases we have to send for ihc or uh, cytogenetic studies that was a wonderful thing and uh, i believe that that will help us to discriminate high grade tumors then ovarian and endometrial synchronous tumors and other things and also for youngsters and seniors where not to over diagnose endometrial carcinoma and benign mimics to be separated uh, that guidance was very wonderful thank you very much sir thank you my pleasure ma'am thank you so much ma'am good morning everyone i am dr neha jaja thank you sir thank you hi yes thank you sir thank you very much good morning thank you dr bharat sir and doc thank you dr sujatha ma'am for your valuable time and guidance over the topic and leading us through the lecture uh, thank you dr pallavi ma'am and i would like to introduce myself first i am dr neha jado faculty sncw pathology so i would like to uh, move on to the next session of our cme uh, our next lecture will be taken by dr mukta ramadwar madam and to carry forward the lecture i would like to welcome dr shubhangi agale madam to uh, be the moderator for the session and i would like to just give a brief intro for dr shubhangi madam so uh, madam is the professor in pathology department at, uh, of grand medical college she has done her graduation from gmc aurangabad and post graduated from tata memorial hospital mumbai she is presently working as professor in pathology at grand medical college mumbai madam has contributed to two book chapters in hematology and she is on the editorial board of many international and national journals as well madam is the reviewer for many international journals as well and she has organized and has been a chairperson in many cmes as well as conferences and delivered a number of uh, guest lectures in international as well as national conferences she is a mmc aggregated speaker and the current chairperson for mapcon and is also the executive member of mumbai hematology group and life member of many associations and is also on the board of different associations so i would like to welcome thank you thank you very much for that kind introduction thank you ma'am uh, yeah if you can project uh, dr mukta ramadwar cv i would introduce her uh, yes madam uh, today speaker is dr mukta ramadwar she is a good friend of mine she is professor in histopathology of tata memorial hospital uh she, she is ex convener of gi disease management group and a member of pediatric and bone soft tissue disease management groups she has many publications to her credit and she is a life member of iipm and iapid she is also a molecular molecular pathologist and uh, she has research research interest in many gastrointestinal bone tissue uh, bone soft tissue and pediatric oncopath oncopathology uh i welcome dr mukta ramadwar for her talk thank you so much um at the outset i would like to thank you thank dr bhosle for inviting me um it's really an auspicious day having uh, you know bringing us together on an international pathology day um so um thank you for organizing this event and inviting me over 
um thank you dr shubhangi it is a pleasure to have you and it's an honor to have you as a chairperson um so let us um let us just uh, start with our um uh talk today it is a daunting topic you know biopsy interpretation of liver it is massive and i just hope that i do justice to um you know uh, the topic as a whole so i'm just touching upon the clinically relevant common issues that happen um, in our everyday practice um let us begin with um what is the indication of uh, of a liver biopsy so it goes um, without saying that for diagnosis for documentation and for biomarkers but it this also has a caveat which we will just discuss um liver tumors are primarily divided into primary and metastatic tumors so primary liver tumors are hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma those are the commonest and then we have uncommon tumors such as mesenchymal tumors lymphoid tumors etc metastases by far are much more commoner than primary liver tumors so the pathology diagnosis as always begins with history clinical history imaging findings which will tell us what is the tumor in the liver like is it single multiple what is the size what's the location and then the other findings which are very relevant to distinguish between primary hepatocellular tumors versus the others like you know the vascular pattern of the tumors is it a, a arterial washout or a venous washout and those those findings are extremely important for the clinicians to make the diagnosis as well as for us to rely upon the radiology findings which will be helpful in challenging cases serum tumor marker levels like alpha serum alpha fetoprotein level c19.9 and cea these are three most important serum tumor marker levels which we have to know before we are interpreting a liver biopsy then hepatitis uh, hepatitis or the viral status of the patient is is immensely helpful if the patient is positive for hepatitis surface antigen the chances of him suffering from hepatocellular carcinoma are much more more higher of course the other tumor most like cholangiocarcinomas also occur on the background of uh, hbs ag positive status and then the presence of cirrhosis or no um, and of course which viruses are involved that is also important now um, when we are considering a liver biopsy let us look at the clinical context why is the biopsy is being done and what would happen to the patient so in general if the tumor is operable let it be a primary tumor or metastasis um then the patient will undergo uh undergo uh surgery and in in such cases in operable tumors biopsy may not be done it may not be considered that is because it is first of all it is an operable tumor so we would know the histology from after the surgery so unless the the patient requires keep new adjuvant chemotherapy biopsy is not undertaken in such clear cut cases on the other hand if the tumor is inoperable be it a primary tumor or metastasis then a biopsy is mandatory in all cases and that is obviously for confirmation of diagnosis documentation of the diagnosis then chemotherapy even if it is a inoperable tumor we have to choose chemotherapy based upon what tumor it is depending upon whether it is a primary tumor metastatic tumor and which metastatic tumor chemotherapy is indeed offered to the patient it may be in a palliative setting but still we have to choose chemotherapy drugs and then there are new or the uh, avenues for treatment currently which are in the form of immunotherapy and hence the biopsy is important even if the tumor is inoperable Uh, and even if it's a primary tumor or a metastasis at this juncture let me make a point that maybe a few years ago i would have talked more about fnac when it came to liver tumors but not in today's era biopsy is surely and definitely replace uh, sorry yeah so replacing the fnacs and this is for the single most reason that we have more and more immuno histochemistry panels available we have the recent um, newer therapies in terms of immunotherapy which require biomarker testing and all this is possible on a biopsy so um at least in our center and worldwide 
the FNAC is definitely fading out and biopsy is replacing the FNAC. Um, let us look at a very typical conventional uh, case of a hepatocellular carcinoma. Patient has a typical clinical presentation, typical radiology, raised serum alpha fetoprotein levels, patient is SPSAG positive, liver is serotic. So would we do a biopsy in such setting? It may not be done. It is not necessary, uh, especially when a, a mass is operable. However, if there is any deviation from a classical clinical setting, like, for example, a patient is young, the uh, serum alpha fetoprotein markers are not raised, radiology is not usual, like that of hepatocellular carcinoma, and there is a differential diagnosis of a benign lesion versus HCC on radiology and inoperable cases, as we discussed earlier. In all these clinical scenarios, a liver biopsy will be definitely performed. Um, so let us start with the common tumors that happen in the, in the liver. Um, hepatocellular carcinoma. This is a tumor which consists of tumor cells resembling hepatocytes. And it is actually, it sounds quite superfluous to say that, but it is a great diagnostic adjunct. That morphologic resemblance to hepatocellular to the hepatocytes is a very useful diagnostic uh, um, parameter, which is helpful to make uh, arrive at a diagnosis, both in FNAC as well as in the biopsy. The stroma is composed of sinusoid-like blood spaces lined by a single layer of endothelial cell. And this is, again, a very important um, uh, feature to distinguish HCC from, say, other adenocarcinomas like cholangiocarcinomas or metastatic adenocarcinoma. Fibrous stoma is strikingly absent in conventional hepatocellular carcinoma. However, there are various architectural patterns and various uh, variants of hepatocellular carcinoma, which we will discuss in a short while. Um, in, uh, um, in the architectural patterns, Hepatocellular carcinoma are commonly trabecular. It is the most common um, morphologic um, uh, pattern in the well and moderately differentiated HCC, and trabecular become thicker with increasing grade of hepatocellular carcinoma. This is a biopsy which shows, sorry, this this is a biopsy which shows cores of cores of a tumor tissue. Here we do not have any normal liver parenchyma, but the presence of tumor and a malignant tumor is clearly visible here. And this, these tumor cells are arranged in trabeculae, which are two to three layer thick, and the tumor cells have visibly um, appreciable atypia with nuclear enlargement, high NC ratio. Uh, the stroma is in the form of uh, endothelial line sinusoidal spaces. Part of the tumor is also showing glandular pattern in addition to the trabecular pattern. So this is a conventional hepatocellular carcinoma in a typical clinical setting. I don't think uh, this will pose any challenge to any pathologist as far as the basic diagnosis is concerned. We will not even resort to any immunohistochemistry in such classical cases. Um, let us just uh, see what are the variations on this conventional theme. Um, hepatocellular carcinoma can have, as against the, the tumor cell that we just saw, which were clearly obviously resembling the hepatocytes, uh, we can have smaller cells. And that means the NC ratio is even higher. The cells are more compactly arranged. The, there is, of course, higher degree of vascularity, but it may be inconspicuous. And in, the, in these um, hepatocellular carcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors come into the differential diagnosis. Um, Highline globules can be present, and when present, they are a great diagnostic adjunct in a hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, a glandular pattern can be much more evident than the trabecular pattern in some tumors, and these can pose problems because of the differential diagnosis with cholangiocarcinoma or even metastatic adenocarcinoma. Um, certain hepatocellular carcinomas can show solid morphologies with very little trabeculae or glandular pattern, and these tumors can again have a morphologic resemblance to neuroendocrine tumors. Um, this is another variant of, of a solid variant of um, 
uh, hepatocellular carcinoma showing small cells which are arranged in small SNI, but they are in the form of no, no trabecule A. So this is again a great mimic of neuroendocrine tumor. So uh, while we are looking at these variations in the conventional theme, we are also talking about the differential diagnosis and the diagnostic pitfall that can happen um, in the spectrum of hepatocellular carcinoma. This hepatocellular carcinoma is showing marked nuclear RTPR and this um, is does not show a resemblance to a conventional hepatocyte. So this can actually pose a diagnostic problem in terms of um, the basic, um, uh, you know, identification of this tumor as hepatocellular carcinoma. And these are the tumors which would certainly require immunohistochemistry and confirmation that this is indeed a hepatocytic lineage tumor and not any other like cholangiocarcinoma or any other metastatic carcinoma for that matter and even other tumors like germ cell tumors. So these are the tumors which are unconventional hepatocellular carcinomas, which are high grade HCCs and can, they can pose a diagnostic challenge and would require immunohistochemistry. This is a uh, <clears throat> this is a sclerous hepatocellular carcinoma. Thankfully, this variant is uncommon, but it does exist. This will show um, conspicuous fibrous septa, which are not otherwise present in conventional hepatocellular carcinoma, and the tumor cells are also arranged in the glandular pattern. So if we are unaware of this and presence of this entity, we might just easily mistake this as a cholangiocarcinoma or a metastatic adenocarcinoma. But um, it is important to, to see the entire biopsy closely, uh, understand that the tumor cells do have certain as a kind of voluminous cytoplasm, which is <clears throat> rather uncommon in a conventional cholangiocarcinoma or a metastatic adenocarcinoma. So <clears throat> this is an example where the pathologist has to use her, his or her judgment and <clears throat> and use, make use of appropriate immunohistochemistry panel. Hepatocellular carcinomas are known to have a retic poor pattern. They are poor in the presence of reticulin, whereas this is a normal hepatocyte where the trabeculae are invested in, uh, <clears throat> sorry. They are invested in, um, in reticulin um, meshwork, this meshwork is lost in hepatocellular carcinoma. It is very poor or completely lost. And this is an important feature um, uh, where we have to use make use of this uh, spatial stain, reticulin, in small biopsies where um, it is a question between a hepatic adenoma, normal liver, and well-differentiated uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Typically, hepatocellular carcinomas are positive for hepatocyte-specific uh, um, uh, markers, which are HEPAR1, glycan 3 and um, arginase, and there are some more as well. CD34 highlights the vascular uh, channels in hepatocellular carcinoma as against in the normal um, liver parenchyma, which are negative. CD10 will show luminal positivity. Fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma is a distinct variant of hepatocellular carcinoma, which we need to know. That is because it is very different uh, in, a, uh, in a way of its clinical presentation and epidemiology than that of conventional HCC. As against the conventional HCC, um, fibrolamellar HCC occurs in children and adolescents. These are large mass lesions. Left lobe is the common location. Um, Serum alpha fetoprotein is seldom raised in this tumor. It is not associated with HPV infection, not associated with a background of cirrhosis. However, uh, its prognosis, although it is slightly better than hepatocellular carcinoma, but these tumors are also known to recur and also known to metastasize. The prognosis is better, that is because it is occurring in younger individuals without a background um, liver disease. And that is what makes it slightly better than conventional hepatocellular carcinoma. But it is a very distinct variant of HCC. This is how it looks. This tumor has large tumor cells, almost like oncocytic type of cells, and as they are associated with um, prominent um, fibroblastic reaction. 
and, uh, and that is why the name fibro and the lamellar is because of the arrangement of the tumor cells in the form of broad lamellae as against the trabeculae or glandular patterns seen in conventional hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, one more distinctive immunohistochemistry difference between fibrolamellar SCC and conventional SCC is that this tumor is positive for CK7. It will also show hepatocyte-specific antigen positivity. In this instance, it is HEPAR1 positive. It is strongly positive, but it will also show CK7. So now combined with the morphology in this term, presence of um, now presence of fibrous septa, presence of CK7 positivity, and the lack of trabecular pattern, we can clearly see a diagnostic pitfall here unless we pay attention to the clinical history wherein we have a young person in with a large um, large liver tumor, no other primary um, that can that is detectable anywhere else. So this morphology is the clue to the correct diagnosis of fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, thankfully, if the patient has operable tumor, it has a patient. It is a good prognostic tumor. Um, referential diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, we have already discussed a few while we were going ahead with the, di with the diagno uh, variations on the theme of a conventional HCC. So just to reiterate, metastasis, metastatic adenocarcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma are the dominant differential diagnosis followed by neuroendocrine tumors. Then the adenoma versus well differentiated neuro uh, well differentiated HCC is a problem. Sometimes focal nodular hyperplasia can resemble hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, let us just touch upon hepatic adenomas. These are benign tumors which occur in women of childbearing age. They happen in patients who are using exogenous steroids, most importantly, first generation um, oral contraceptives. These can be large tumors and can be quite alarming. They have potential to rupture. And uh, the radiology is quite characteristic of hepatic adenoma. Uh, however, in terms of unusual tumors and large tumors, the clinicians would want to have a biopsy diagnosis and it can be challenging for us pathologists. Uh, there is a, a great deal of uh, uh, <clears throat> advances as far as the genotypic phenotypic classification of hepatic adenomas are concerned. They are now classified based upon the HNF1 inactivation. So there are four types of uh, hepatic adenomas. The commonest one is HNF1 inactivated adenoma, inflammatory hepatocellular adenoma, beta catenin, catenin mutated hepatocellular adenoma, and the non-mutated non-inflammatory hepatocellular adenoma, out of which beta catenin mutated hepatocellular adenoma has the most potential to progress to hepatocellular carcinoma. This was a biopsy from um, a patient, a young patient with a core biopsy showing hepatocellular um, hepatic adenoma. And here you can see that the tumor configuration is very much similar to hepatocellular carcinoma, but what is strikingly different is the lack of cellular atypia. This tumor does have trabecular architecture, this tumor does have a uh, glandular or the assigner architecture, but there is lack of cytologic atypia. The trabeculae are not um, thick as we see in a conventional hepatocytic adenoma. Reticulin pattern is very well maintained in this adenoma. So these are the distinguishing feature between well-differentiated HCC and the hepatocellular um, uh, carcinoma. But trust me, as we all know, this can be a challenging issue. Um, so hepatocytic adenoma versus well-differentiated HCC, these are the morphology characteristics that we use. HCC are usually more than three cell thick trabeculae. It shows loss of reticulin network, which is maintained in an adenoma. Cytologic atypia is absent in adenoma, which is definitely present in HCC. In fact, that is the diagnostic criteria for HCC. If there is no, no atypia, the problem between the normal uh, hepatocytic parenchyma versus adenoma can persist. Um, uh, pseudoglandular pattern is more commonly seen in HCC. Small cell change is more commonly seen in HCC. Mitotic activity may or may not be visible in a small biopsy. Then the absence of Kupffer cells is characterized by in hepatocellular carcinoma. Complete sinusoidal CD34 positivity is seen in, in hepatocellular carcinoma as against in hepatic adenoma. 
then this is how a, a thick trabecular architecture in hepatocellular carcinoma associated with clear nuclear atypia. Then the poor retic pore pattern and the presence of CD34 positive sinusoidal pattern. This characterizes a, a well differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. On top of it, this is a good um, uh, uh, immunohistochemistry that we can use. Um, if the this tumor is glypican 3 positive, it is hepatocellular carcinoma and not adenocarcinoma. Beta catenin nuclear positivity is seen in hepatocellular carcinoma, but not in adenoma and same with glutamine synthetase. The issue is that not all hepatocellular carcinomas would show these positivities. Only about 60% um, of HCCs are positive for glepican 3 Beta-catenin positivity is seen in even lesser number of hepatocellular carcinoma. So when they are positively expressed, they are useful. If they are not negative, if they are not expressed, then we are falling back again on the morphology when it comes to the distinction between hepatic adenoma and hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, focal nodular hyperplasia is a solitary, well-circumscribed well liver lesion, which is commonly seen in young females. And the size is less than 5 cm, but like adenoma, they can also attain large sizes approaching 15 cm as well. They can be a single lesion or multiple yellow-brown nodules. There is a distinct fibrous septa in the center of focal nodular hypoplasia. Histologically, rather than resembling, um, uh, resembling a hepatocellular carcinoma, it resembles cirrhosis. So it can resemble a um, fibrolamellar hepatocellular um, carcinoma if we don't pay attention to the onchos lack of oncocytic type of, um, of cellular pattern. Imaging findings are very helpful here because it is a focal mass lesion with central stellate scar. Uh, we will see thick walled blood vessels, which can be also evident in a biopsy. And nodules will contain normal liver cells. And more importantly, bile ductular proliferation would be seen within the septa. And this feature is lacking both in hepatic adenoma as well as in hepatocellular um, carcinoma. The differential diagnosis also en entertains mesenchymal hematoma if the patient is of younger age group. It is a, the etiology of FNH is a, it is a result of vascular malformation and it is considered to be a localized overgrowth of all the liver constituents. So it is mostly incidental lesion. It may not cause harm and no treatment is required unless the tumor is very large and it is causing symptoms. This tumor can increase in pregnancy and increase uh, because it can increase in vascularity and there is also a potential to rupture. This is a classical example of focal nodular hyperplasia, wherein it resembles a cirrhotic liver. There are several nodules, and then, then there is a central scar, which is containing biliary proliferation. Let us come to another big one in, that happens in the liver, which is a cholangiocarcinoma. It is a primary biliary tumor. It can be extrahepatic or intrahepatic. It commonly invokes a desmoplastic stroma. There are three variants of cholangiocarcinoma, a mass-forming cholangiocarcinoma, then periductal or infiltrative um, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, and intraductal growth pattern cholangiocarcinoma. These are intrahepatic variants, and they are not as sclerotic as the extrahepatic or portal cholangiocarcinomas. So the cellularity of these cholangiocarcinomas as against the conventional norms can be very, very high. And they can also show um, a high degree of uh, um, uh, cellular atypia as well. So that understanding has to be there before we deal with a liver biopsy with suspected cholangiocarcinoma case. So this is a biopsy um, with a cholangiocarcinoma, which in this case is poorly differentiated. We can see a fibrous stroma here and the tumor cells are arranged in nests. They, can, uh, they are arranged in small trabeculae and cords mm -hmm. and sometimes the, um, the tumor cells can also have, a lot of times the tumor cells will have glandular pattern mm -hmm. and the sclerotic stroma. Um, so this is an example of a cholangiocarcinoma showing um, CK7 positivity and CK19 positivity. These tumors who are also positive for MOC 30, 31, we do not have access to this. So we rely on the diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma based on the radiology, the morphology, and immunohistochemistry for CK7 and CK19. Whenever there is an issue of 
distinction between hepatocyte, uh, HCC and cholangiocarcinoma. So what are the problems that we encounter in the diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma? The, the one single most problem is the distinction of cholangiocarcinoma uh, from metastatic adenocarcinoma. There is sometimes a morphologic overlap between hepatocellular carcinoma when um, uh, the, uh, the tumor cells show voluminous cytoplasm. And of course, they are indistinguishable from those of extrahepatic biliary and pancreatic origin adenocarcinoma because essentially, biologically, they are the same category of tumors. So what helps here is the clinical and imaging findings. Uh, coming to mixed cholangiocellular carcinoma, uh, there are tumors which will show dual differentiation, hepatocytic as well as cholangiocellular differentiation. And these tumors can be really difficult to begin with. Even clinically, they would have a dual um, increase in the serum tumor marker levels. We would have increase in serum alpha fetoprotein levels as well as CA19.9 or even CEA levels. Morphologically, we would have two patterns. We would have a hepatocellular carcinoma on one side and the conventional cholangiocarcinoma on other, or the single tumor can show dual expressions of hepatocytic as well as cholangiocellular um, uh, uh, markers. It, this was one difficult tumor which had glandular pattern, which had sclerotic stroma. But if we looked at them closely, the cells started looking more like hepatocytes. So this looked more like, um, like a hepatocellular carcinoma when we looked at it under the higher power. But on the lower power, the morphology was more like that of a cholangiocarcinoma. There was a lot of um, fibrotic stroma here. And you can see these small glandular cells here or small glandular patterns, which look like cholangiocarcinoma. So it had a dual morphology to begin with. And we went on to do immunohistochemistry in terms of glypican 3 which was strongly positive. Um, HIPAR-1 was focally positive, not, not as strong as glypican 3 but CK7 was also expressed in the tumor cell. CK19 was focally positive. So we diagnosed this as a mixed cholangiocellular, hepatocellular and cholangiocarcinoma. Why is it important to diagnose these correctly? That's because there is always an ambiguity clinically because of the dual expressions in, in the serum tumor marker levels. The radiology can also be uh, confusing, can be atypical, not like HCC or cholangiocarcinoma per se. So the biopsy is invariably performed here because the management of hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma is different. And moreover, mixed cholangiocellular carcinomas are by default poorly differentiated tumors and they require different type of chemotherapy different than um, cholangiocarcinoma. And this distinction can be difficult in a small biopsy if we have just one of the patterns, because the clinicians might call you back saying that, um, you know, this is uh, the radiology and you have called it um, cholangiocarcinoma, but the serum alpha fetoprotein levels is in thousands. So how to deal with this situation? It is a difficult situation and you have no choice but to say that you have taken the clinical um, um, uh, findings into consideration in terms of the radiology as well as the serum tumor marker levels. And it is possible that there is an element of hepatocellular carcinoma which is not represented in the biopsy and this could actually be a mixed cholangiocellular carcinoma. So that is how we deal with it in a real life situation because it is impossible to get both the um, both tumor patterns in a small biopsy. Now coming to a very large group of tumors, um, that is metastasis to liver. Uh, liver and lungs are the common ports of metastasis. They account for 25% of metastasis to solid organs. Um, so the liver lesions, if uh, our patient is a known case of malignancy, uh, then what happens is the clinical scenarios are two. It is the patient is a known case of malignancy and later on presents with metastasis. Or the patient presents with primary presentation as metastasis. And uh, I, of course, I'm in the primary tumor as well as metastasis in the liver. This is usually not a diagnostic challenge for us pathologists. Um, however, even in these situations, sometimes a liver biopsy is done and not that of a primary tumor because of easy accessibility. And then the 
the, the need for the availability of tumor tissue, as we discussed earlier, for immunohistochemistry and for the diagnostic biomarkers. So even in this typical clinical scenario, um, a biopsy would be performed. This may not have been the case a few years ago when we did not have immunotherapy or other targeted therapies on the horizon, which are available today. So in these, in these typical metastatic scenarios, we do get biopsies. Um, and of course, if there are multiple liver, uh, liver tumors in the liver and we do not know what is the primary, then obviously a biopsy is performed because we want to know where the uh, metastasis is coming from. And especially when there is a radiologic uh, overlap between multicentric hepatocellular carcinoma and metastasis. So this is the commonest scenario, in fact, that we come across and the biopsy is performed in this, uh, in this tumors. And let us not forget that metastasis can also be in the form of a single lesion. So we cannot always presume that a single tumor in the liver is always a primary uh, liver tumor or either HCC or cholangio. No, it is not the case. So the, the question to the pathologist is always posed in terms of uh, these tumors. Um, now, there is a group of, uh, uh, we uh, on one hand, we know the primary tumor and then there is liver metastasis. But on the other hand, and the commoner scenario is that we do not know where the tumor is coming from. So these are called cancers of unknown primary, CUPS, heterogeneous group of metastatic tumors for which a standardized diagnostic workup fails to identify the site of origin at the time of diagnosis. This is the definition of a CUP and they form around three to 5% of all malignant tumors, which are metastatic to the liver. Now, which are the common tumors that go to liver? I do know, so obviously the tumors which have propensity to have a hematogenous metastasis. Adenocarcinomas are the commonest, which are originating from the lung, from the colon, pancreas, breast, and the stomach. These are the frequent sources of adenocarcinomas um, accounting to 24, 15, 10 percent, and 6 percent, respectively. The other adenocarcinomas that go to uh, and the livers are ovarian cancers, endometrial cancers, prostatic cancers, and urothelial carcinomas. They are uncommon, are forming around 4% of the hematogenous um, metastasis, but recognizing them is important because each of these entities have their own treatment protocols. Then squamous cell carcinomas of the lung origin, esophagus, head neck, genital primaries, or anorectal primary sites will go to the, uh, to the liver. And then the other tumors in forms of neuroendocrine tumors, melanomas, lymphomas, germ cell tumors, sarcomas, and virtually practically any tumor can metastasize to liver. Let us just um, learn um, a bit about them as far as what are, how are we involved in their diagnosis and what is the impact of their diagnosis on the management? Mm -hmm. So the, if the biopsy comes to the pathologist, these are the questions that we need to answer. We need to distinguish metastasis from primary tumors, okay? Especially the hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma versus metastasis. What is this metastasis of? Is it a carcinoma or is it any other tumor? Determining the site of the primary origin, if it is a carcinoma, then determining immunophenotype, for example, foregut adenocarcinoma versus a colonic adenocarcinoma. Subtyping of the tumor if the metastatic tumor is not a carcinoma. And then a, a very important question now is asked is, would this tumor respond to available treatment? In, in other words, what are the biomarker um, status of this tumor? So these are, this is how we would, um, we would uh, use, these are our tools. Morphology is the first, of course, after the clinical inputs, radiology, clinical findings, biochemistry. Then here, uh, then comes the morphology, then comes immunohistochemistry, and then the biomarkers. Why do we have to use immunohistochemistry in terms of metastasis? Because we have to identify or attempt to identify the tissue of origin, to identify chemosensitive and potentially curable tumors, uh, and these are exemplified by lymphomas and germ cell tumors. We cannot miss these tumors because these are perfectly treatable with good prognosis as against the other tumors where, where the patient receives mostly palliative treatment. Now, and recognize hormone sensitive adenocarcinomas like breast adenocarcinoma and prostatic adenocarcinomas. So we cannot miss this again because in addition to conventional chemotherapy, hormonal therapies are installed uh, to the patient.
uh, why do we do a biopsy in a in a conventional setting as we discussed earlier um and the uh, patients were in clinical biochemical and imaging findings are not conclusive the primary is not known and maybe it is a first clinical presentation and we need the tissue for diagnosis and molecular testing so the tissue comes to us and most commonly more than 90% of the situations what we see is a typical foregut derived adenocarcinoma it may or may not produce mucin and the the issue is that all of these organs all of these organs the adenocarcinomas arising from these organs will show similar morphology and also immunohistochemistry adenocarcinomas of the lung would exactly look like pancreatic adenocarcinomas exactly similar to cholangiocarcinomas gallbladder carcinomas breast carcinomas and gastric carcinomas all these are foregut adenocarcinomas and they would look exactly similar morphologically and also immunohistochemically so that is a big catch for us as a pathologist so unless we know clinical inputs we will not be able to go ahead based only on the morphology and immunohistochemistry profile and therefore this comes this is a clinical scenario which we should be um, very well aware of that this is a frequently asked wrong question to us that there is a tumor in the liver pathologist please tell us whether this is a cholangiocarcinoma or a metastasis should we even be answering this question actually the answer is no the reason is that distinction of cholangiocarcinoma can be practically impossible from metastatic adenocarcinomas especially when they are foregut derived adenocarcinoma and also they are indistinguishable from those of extrahepatic biliary and pancreatic origin adenocarcinomas so the distinction of <clears throat> cholangiocarcinoma and metastasis is not unfortunately not a function of the pathologist then who helps the clinicians in this clinical scenario it is the radiologist actually the radiologist will will have to the scans will have to tell that this is a tumor which is metastatic from this and this site or there is no other other primary site which is evident on radiology and this is what an adenocarcinoma looks like so it's most likely uh, to be a primary cholangiocarcinoma and not a metastasis so a huge amount of um, a huge amount of effort that is put in uh doing a biopsy and posing a question to the pathologist we cannot actually help the clinicians in this scenario and the imaging findings have to be taken into account and your report might read that taking the radiology images or radiology findings into account i favor this or i favor that and that is how we have to deal with with this clinical scenario on the other hand distinction between hepatocellular carcinoma on one hand and the metastasis or cholangiocarcinoma is certainly possible and every attempt should be made to distinguish these tumors from one another at cc versus mets and cholangiocarcinoma now this is one example of a typical foregut type of adenocarcinoma a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with sclerotic uh, stroma and this one was positive for ck7 as well as ck19 and as i as i just said this is just an adenocarcinoma which is a foregut derived adenocarcinoma it could be from lung it could be from pancreas so unless we know um unless we know and also of course the gallbladder yes i mean we should never forget the gallbladder and this is these always form intrahepatic single masses so it's extremely important for the radiologist to recognize that this tumor is arising from the gallbladder so that we can recognize it as a primary gallbladder adenocarcinoma and not a metastatic carcinoma um now uh, uh colorectal adenocarcinoma this is a carcinoma with abundant central necrosis in the glands and these are ck20 positive cdx2 positive sat b2 positive and ck7 negative so the predictive uh, probability or uh, is 78% of this immunophenotype which indicates a colorectal primary and systemic treatment is used for colorectal cancer so it's important to recognize them and then a molecular profile of colorectal cancer is essential in terms of ras um all ras testing and the msi for targeted therapy so we should not miss a colorectal adenocarcinoma having said that in most instances we always know the primary and it is the matter of availability of the tissue to do the biomarkers like msi or the ras 
Now, um, this is again, this is uh, another very classical example of a biopsy showing colonic adenocarcinoma in the liver, um, the necrotic tissue, gland in gland pattern, garland like pattern, cribriform pattern. So this is a CK20, CDX2, SATP2 positive and CK negative um, adenocarcinoma, which is a colonic primary. This is a very helpful immunoprofile as against the other immunoprofile, which we, we will be just discussing in some time. Um, neuroendocrine carcinomas metastasize to liver and they can pose problems in terms of differential diagnosis. They can come from pancreas, can from, come from stomach, from intestine, and then the terminal ileum neuroendocrine tumors will be um, uh, posing a problem of an unknown primary. Immunohistochemistry uh, is um, very helpful in diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors in terms of synaptomycin, chromogranin, CK7, ATRX loss, and P53. ATRX loss is seen in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And grading is, is important, just like it is important in a primary site. So deal with a neuroendocrine tumor in a metastatic setting in the liver, just like we would deal with in a primary setting in terms of immunohistochemistry and the determination of the MIB-1 index for sake of grading. Uh, so we have well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine um, uh, carcinomas, and the treatment of them are, of both are different. Well-differentiated NATs are treated in terms of somatostatin analogs, then streptozocin plus 5-fluorouracil chemotherapy, then sunitinib and everlimus. These are targeted therapies which are used to treat well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, whereas if it is a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, the patients are treated more aggressively in terms of platinum-based chemotherapy plus etoposide combination chemotherapy. And hence, it is important not to miss neuroendocrine tumors because the well-differentiated entities have much better prognosis. Poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors may not have um, uh, as good a prognosis, but they are treated differently with different chemotherapy regime. And more importantly, why is the emphasis being made on, on the uh, accuracy of diagnosis is that neuroendocrine tumors, as we discussed earlier, have a morphologic overlap between both hepatocellular carcinoma because of their high degree of vascularity and the cytologic overlap, as well as adenocarcinoma when they are a dominant in their assigner or glandular patterns. And hence, now, uh, the index of suspicion should always be high when it comes to neuroendocrine tumors metastatic to liver. This is a neuroendocrine tumor grade one with, with little cellular atypia. Uh, cells are arranged in cord-like pattern. The MIB-1 labeling index was 2% in this particular tumor. This was a grade 2 neuroendocrine tumor with higher degree of nuclear atypia, strong chromogranin positivity, and MIB-1 index approaching around 10%. Now, this is a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. Earlier, we used to call it NEC grade 3, but now we label it as neuroendocrine carcinomas. They can be either large cell or small cell type. These tumors will not show, will show a very high degree of, of cytologic atypia. There is a presence of, of stroma. So if we look at this tumor just without immunohistochemistry and without thinking about it being a neuroendocrine tumor, this can be easily mistaken as poorly differentiated cholangiocarcinoma or poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma carcinoma. But uh, that index of suspicion has to be there looking at their organoid pattern. There is a nesting pattern, very little glandular pattern, and then high NC ratio, no hyperchromatic nuclei. So it is there is no harm in performing immunohistochemistry. And of course, the, the diagnosis is clinched based upon positivity for chromogranin, synaptophysin, and the MIB-1 labeling index is very high. These tumors may be positive for CK19, especially when they are coming from pancreatic tumors, and these tumors would have um, a, a worse prognosis. And it is important not to miss them because the chemotherapy regime is different as compared to conventional adenocarcinomas. 
Um, this is one example of a neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is showing a signer pattern, and you can actually see how it resembles hepatocellular carcinoma here. So these are the tumors as against the earlier, this adenocarcinoma, wherein we would have added CK7 and CK19 along with the neuroendocrine markers. In these kind of tumors, which have resemblance to hepatocellular carcinoma, we would add hepatocytic specific markers like HEPAR1, glyphicam 3 and arginist along with the neuroendocrine markers, synaptophysin, chromogranin, INSM1, and of course, MIP1 has to be added for a grading purpose. So this is how neuroendocrine tumors can mimic both primary liver tumors, HCCs, as well as cholangiocarcinomas. Um, there are certain treatable metastatic tumors, which we should never miss. One is, of course, a lymphoma. Another is germ cell tumors. And unfortunately, both are mimics of a carcinoma. And again, just like neuroendocrine tumors, high index of suspicion is required for their accurate diagnosis. I have just chosen an example of a plasmablastic lymphoma because this shows unconventional lymphoid markers. This may be only focally positive for LCA, negative for CD20, and then positive for CD138. So this diagnosis is important to be arrived at because of the appropriate chemotherapy um, given to the patient. Germ cell tumors, this is one case of embryonal carcinoma, which was metastatic to the liver without a known primary and a, a presence of a metastatic seminoma, again, without a known primary. This, of course, was a, the, the primary remains unknown in germ cell tumors because of inadequate clinical examination. So it becomes a, a prerogative of the pathologist not to miss a germ cell tumor. Again, just like lymphoma, these are treatable tumors with, with good prognosis and the chemotherapy therapy regime is completely different. Um, and this index of suspicion should be very high, especially when the patients are adolescents and young adults. So again, it is criminal to miss a germ cell tumor, just like it's criminal to miss a neuroendocrine tumor and lymphomas. Sarcomas can metastasize to liver, and in this group of tumors, it is essential to differentiate just from non-GIST sarcomas, um, purely because the GIST are treated with um, imatinib treatment. So um, any GIST, any sarcoma that is metastatic to liver, it is important or it is mandatory to apply CKIT and DOG1 immunohistochemistry along with the others if needed, and exclude GIST and then you can diagnose a non-GIST sarcoma accordingly, depending upon the immunoprofile. So significance of recognizing a primary, um, probable primary is lies here. We have already dealt with um, a few of them in terms of neuroendocrine, uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors treated differently than poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, as well as the um, other adenocarcinomas like cholangiocarcinomas. Now, now there are these certain tumors, why we should be um, recognizing them accurately. Uh, serous, uh, peritoneal serous papillary adenocarcinomas in females or ovarian primaries are treated with platinum-based therapies and surgical debulking. Breast tumors are treated with a specific chemo regime along with hormonal therapy. Um, then colorectal cancers are again treated with, with surgery chemotherapy and then it requires a uh, um, other, other primaries, uh, other um, biomarkers like uh, PDL1 and on um, MSI. Um, so this is how it is important to, um, to recognize a primary. Now coming to that big issue of um, uh, cholangiocarcinoma or the four gut type of, of carcinomas. CK7 and CK20 positivity is the commonest immunophenotype. When, uh, we, when it comes to the four gut type of adenocarcinoma or even actually commoner is CK7 only phenotype. It is expressed in all four gut type of carcinomas as we enumerated earlier. So it is impossible to distinguish an absence of a known primary, but can we do anything more than just CK7 or CK20? Yes, we can. If the, the clinical suspicion is that of a lung primary, then we can add a TTF1 and napsin A, never forgetting that TTF1 and napsin A both can be positive in non-pulmonary adenocarcinomas as well. So this interpretation should never be done without imaging findings. A thyroid tumor can also be positive for th of TTF1, but thyroglobulin would also be positive. And these tumors would be treated with palliative intent chemotherapy. Um, so here is how we approach. 
Here is a four gut type of adenocarcinoma, which is CK7 positive, CK7 only positive, or CK7 and CK20 positive. Depending upon the clinical scenario, we would add further immunohistochemistry markers in terms of CEA, CDX2, SATB2, TTF1, Napsin A, then ERPR, and the um, mammoglobin, then uh, GCDFP15, urethylene WT1, and then HIPAR1 and PSA. These are site-specific markers which you can use depending upon what is the clinical scenario, what is the tumor morphology. So although we do have a foregut, conventional foregut type of adenocarcinoma, which is CK7 only or CK7 and CK20 positive, then um, we can extend the MNO panel in an attempt to, to segregate these tumors further if possible. But then we may not be able to be, uh, be successful in determining a site-specific metastasis. And what happens to these patients then? So these are non-classifiable metastasis with foregut type of phenotype. Primary site cannot be ascertained even after we have attempted immunohistochemistry panel. What happens to their treatment? The treatment will depend upon performance status of this patient. It is the patients are treated with mostly palliative intent. Um, at the max, two drug chemotherapy can be added to their treatment regime. There are certain tumors which resemble hepatocellular carcinoma like renal cell carcinoma and adrenocortical carcinoma. They have overlapping morphology. So liver specific antigens and other immunostochemistry markers would help us. Um, I think I will just skip these. These are the coming to targeted therapies. We do have the access to targeted therapies in terms of bevacizumab, monoclonal antibodies to VEGF, metastatic colonic cancer. So satuximab is used. Uh, it is an anti-EGFR monoclonal antibody. Um, it is used in a RAS wild type patients. Transazumab is a monoclonal antibody and given to uh, the breast cancers and gastric cancer. So again, I am reiterating the issue of determining a primary site and also determining the biomarkers when a primary site is known as well. Immunotherapy is especially relevant in today's era in lung adenocarcinoma, colonic adenocarcinoma, and also melanoma. So a biopsy, the given biopsy should be saved for uh, testing for RAS, testing for HER2, PDL1, and MSI. So indiscriminate immunohistochemistry may not really help the patient, but what would help more is the testing for biomarkers like, like these. So um, again, the point to reiterate is that because of this issue, a core biopsy is uh, indeed being preferred over FNAC in the in recent eras. So I think with lack of time, I will just skip these um, unusual uh, vascular tumors, which can resemble a carcinoma in terms of you know, morphology and which were epithelioid hemangioendothelioma and angiosarcoma. Um, then there is this tumor, um, I really like to present this tumor all the time. This is a 23-year-old male patient and presented with a liver mass. What would you call this? Just because he was 23, I took a step back and thought something more, but this has such a striking resemblance to hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, the resident who came with reporting had already reported it as hepatocellular carcinoma, but the age of the patient made me think. And then we added some immunohistochemistry and this is what we found. This patient was, uh, this tumor was strongly positive for TAV3. And later on we asked them and then it was understood that this patient was already a known case of alveolar soft pad sarcoma and this was a metastasis. The tumor was present in the orbit and was operated three years ago. So these are, these are just your the diagnostic acumens or the judgments that we need to develop with, and because these are the pitfalls that would present to us in everyday practice. To summarize, this is my last case. Um, liver is home to diverse tumors, both primary and metastatic tumors. There can be morph morphologic overlap, with, which can be challenging. Not only just morphologic overlap, but also immunohistochemistry overlap. So we just discussed out some tumors which are of morphologic as well as immunohistochemically uh, overlapping. They should be approached with clinical details, biochemical parameters, and imaging findings. Use of appropriate immunohistochemistry is very important. 
important and save the tissue for biomarkers. That is our current message. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Shubhangi, madam, to please add her comments. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it was an excellent talk by Dr. Mukta. Uh, she has explained very intelligently different types of tumors in the liver which can be distinguished and what is the importance of distinguishing primary from secondary because of the immunotherapy and other modalities of the treatments. Thank you, Mukta. I have one comment to make. Uh, yes. We had cases, uh, as Mukta had said, that liver metastasis and uh, uh, clinicians were searching from uh, GI tract and everything and it was negative but the closest organ was gallbladder and in three four cases we had that experience where the metastasis was from the gallbladder it was direct invasion or metastatic and gallbladder just showed thickening of the yeah. you know that's very usual in uh, such cases so okay. in, uh, students should remember this that the closest organ should be kept in mind for Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Another uh, question I have for Mukta is, is it necessary to distinguish high-grade uh, high dysplastic nodule from the hepatocellular carcinoma on the liver biopsy? And what is your take on that or advice on that? Okay. Um, I actually, I have hidden those slides because that itself is such a big topic. Um, uh, you know, dysplastic nodules, by definition, what happens, the practice in our institution is that um, if it is a tumor which is of um, uh, high-grade cytology, but less than one centimeter, then uh, it can be treated with um, even RFA. And, but if it is uh, more than one centimeter, it is treated like hepatocellular carcinoma. Low-grade um, low uh, dysplastic nodules are left alone, but high-grade dysplastic nodules are a very tricky scenario for everybody. So the size is a, is a determining criteria. So less than one centimeter, um, if possible, RFA is done. And if that distinction is not possible based on radiology as well as on a biopsy, which we all know is very difficult uh, in a small biopsy because the diagnostic features between a high-grade dysplastic nodule and um, well-differentiated HCC are the presence of invasiveness in the, um, in the adjacent liver parenchyma, which is extremely difficult to demonstrate in a small core biopsy, and the presence of biliary ductilar proliferation, which is seen in the dysplastic nodule, but not in hepatocellular carcinoma. But that again is not a very easy thing because if, if the liver is cirrhotic, we would have biliary proliferation even in a hepatocellular carcinoma. So when it comes to a biopsy diagnosis of DN, high grade DN versus a well diff um, HCC, it is actually a very extremely difficult scenario and it is faced by pathologists world over. So the clinicians have to rely on imaging findings, the size of the lesion, the degree of um, a TPR. If it is a high grade uh, tumor and or typical in terms of radiology, uh, they treat it like HCC. And when I say treat it like HCC, that means it is surgery. Uh, very small lesions can be ablated radiologically and very few, very, very few uh, lesions are left alone and just watched alone. Thank you. Another question for you is, we also had few cases of hybrid, you know, hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. Yeah. Both these cases treated differently by the surgeons or they are treated depending on the grade, means SCC grade of the tumor? So, the, so that's the important thing. These tumors are neither treated like hepatocellular carcinoma nor by cholangiocarcinoma. So um, at this um, point, let me just reiterate how, uh, how um, hepatocellular carcinomas are treated. So if they are operable, surgically operable, of course, they are, they are taken out. If they are large tumors, then there is an attempt to shrink the tumors by giving transarterial chemotherapy. That is a very common modality in our institution. So it is a post-taste resection of hepatocellular carcinoma. 
if the liver is cirrhotic and if the uh, it is associated with hepatocellular carcinoma liver transplant is the um, is the current option so and when the none of these options are possible none of the surgical options are possible then the the patients are treated with uh, sorafenib or other targeted therapies because these tumors hepatocellular carcinomas do not respond to conventional chemotherapy and that is one extremely important reason why we have to distinguish hepatocellular carcinoma from cholangiocarcinoma or metastasis for that matter because conventional chemotherapy is not given and that is how how hccs are treated when it comes to the mixed cholangiocellular adenocarcinomas they are not treated like like hccs in terms of surgery as well as the treatment with sorafenib and neither the chemotherapy for cholangiocarcinoma is used they use some other regime i do not remember the name of those drugs but it is a different regime with one addition of a drug maybe i can just ask my um, medical oncologist but that is the significance of diagnosing a mixed cholangiocellular adenocarcinoma thank you i think mukta has done a very good justice to the topic given to her and i am thankful to her on behalf of organization organization and also i congratulate her on covering this big and difficult topic in a small time which was given to her i think it this needs more time to Elaborate <laughs> yeah. on a liver biopsy. You know, when we get a gross, it's very easy to diagnose adenoma and uh, other things. You know, HCC adenoma and other tumor. But you know, on a liver biopsy, it's very difficult. Hearty okay. congratulations to Mukta. Thank and you, Chibangi. It was an honor to have you as a chairperson, and um, you know, you're sharing your experience. Thank you so much. Thank and I, again, I thank the organizers, especially Dr. Bosley. Um, thank you for inviting me. It I'm also thankful honor. to organizers and thank you, Dr. Anand Bosley. I give it to the organizers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mukta Ramadwar, madam. Thank you, Dr. Shubhangi, madam, for carrying out our session. Thank you, Dr. Bosley, sir. And now, uh, moving ahead for our inaugural session. I will like to hand over the mic to Dr. Pratiksha Naval. Before that, we'll just have a short, short break, a short pause, and then we'll move on to the inaugural session. Dr. Bosle, sir, would you like to add a few words? Hello. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Department of Pathology, I welcome you all for this uh, auspicious International Pathology Day. Uh, for this uh, CME organized on uh, Symbiosis International Universities, Symbiosis Medical College for Women, Lovely Pune. And now we can start the opening ceremony. Shall we start? Dr. Pratiksha. Hello, everyone. I, Dr. Pratiksha Naval, welcome you to the inaugural session of our CME. It is indeed a matter of immense fright for us, the Department of Pathology at Symbiosis Medical College for Women, to conduct a CMA of this magnitude in the initial years of our service. We feel extremely grateful and privileged to host such well-known stalwarts of pathology on our virtual podium. I would like to extend my personal welcome to all the speakers, respected moderators, Dean SMCW, Dr. Vijay Sagar, sir, Dean of Faculty of Health Sciences, Dr. Rajiv Yaradrekar, sir, Respected CEO, Dr. Vijay Natarajan, sir. Speaker for this session, Dr. Anita Borges, madam. Professor and head of pathology department, Dr. Anand Bhusle, sir. And MMC observer, Dr. Rajan Sanchetti, sir. We shall proceed the session with virtual lamp lighting and Saraswati Vandana as we pray to the goddess Saraswati to shower us with her knowledge, wisdom, and guidance to put our knowledge to the best, best of its use. Yashweet of a 
Moving ahead with the session, I would like to invite Honorable Lieutenant Colonel Dr. T. Vijay Sagar, sir, the Dean of SMCW, for his welcome address. Uh, good morning to you all. As the Dean of the Symbiosis Medical College for Women, it is indeed a matter of great pleasure for me to deliver this welcome address at the Oncopathology Update being conducted by the Department of Pathology at uh, Symbiosis Medical College for Women. Firstly, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Rajiv Yaravdekar, sir, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the Symbiosis International University. I extend a very hearty welcome to our eminent, erudite, and highly distinguished speakers who are gracing this occasion today. A very warm welcome to Dr. Anita Borges, madam, Dr. Mukta Ramadwar, Dr. Bharat Reki, Dr. Santosh Menon, and Dr. Munita Bal. We at SMCW are truly fortunate to have such luminaries in this field gracing this occasion. Though I'm an anatomist by profession, I have been hearing the name of Dr. Borges, madam, for the last two decades or so, uh, thanks to my dear friend and colleague of uh, Dr. Burgess, Dr. Vinita Pant, who happens to be my classmate and uh, a dear friend from AFMC. I'm also glad that doctors of such towering statures are uh, gracing this occasion today. I welcome Dr. Rajan Chancheti, who is the observer detailed by the Maharashtra Medical Council. I extend a very hearty welcome to the moderators for the various scientific sessions who are themselves such well-known personalities in the field of pathology and oncopathology. I welcome my close associate at NPTEL Swain Prabha and a dear personal friend, Dr. Manoj Singh, former professor of pathology, Ames, New Delhi, and now a visiting professor at Symbiosis Medical College for Women. It's also a pleasure for me to welcome another dear friend from Sri Ramachandra Chennai, Dr. Sandhya Sundaram. Madam, it's a pleasure welcoming you again. I also extend a warm welcome to Dr. Shubangi Agale, Dr. Sujata Kanitkar, and Dr. Ranjit Kangale. And last but not the least, I welcome all the CME delegates who have registered for this online CME. I hope and pray that you will find the CME extremely rewarding and an excellent source of professional and personal upgradation. Before I conclude, I must place on record my sincere appreciation of the entire team of the Department of Pathology headed by Dr. Anand Bosley. Dr. Bosley and his team of motivated faculty have been doing a yeoman and a fabulous job right through the year. And I'm extremely happy that you have organized an event of this magnitude. I hope all of you enjoy the CME and make the best out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. I would like to invite Honorable Dr. Vijay Trajan, sir, CEO for Symbiosis University Hospital and Research Center for his keynote. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope uh, I'm audible. Um, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, at the outset, uh, I'd like to. Can I proceed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, at the outset, I'd like to welcome everyone. And I see real heavyweights here in the field of pathology in front of me. 
of course, led by the inimitable Dr. Anita Borges. So uh, welcome, madam, to this session. And thank you so much for uh, giving your time, uh, your precious time, uh, to this uh, CME organized by the Symbiosis Medical College for Women and the Symbiosis University Hospital and Research Center. It's indeed an honor uh, for us to have you in our, in our presence. Um, I have a little connection uh, with Borges, madam, in the sense that my boss in general surgery had worked under uh, madam's father, uh, the legendary, uh, you know, Dr. Ernest Borges, uh, who, I mean, who's synonymous with Tata Memorial. And um, uh, so that's my little connection. I've always heard all these legendary stories from my boss about um, uh, Anita Madam's father and uh, how uh, in those days, when technology was nowhere near what it is today and the kind of tremendous work, spectacular work that he was doing. And Tata was known as uh, the center for cancer the world over, not just in the nation. So, um, so I'd like to, uh, of course, um, thank all the um, uh, speakers and moderators for having come to this session. Um, now, Keynote basically is delivered by an expert in the field and it's a no brainer that I'm nowhere near that. So uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone on board here today. Uh, from the hospital perspective, I'd like to say that uh, Dr. Bosley and his team have been doing fantastic work in the field of uh, you know, pathology, histopathology, and more recently, oncopathology services that we have commissioned at the hospital. And uh, we have a fantastic team, uh, a tumor board as we call it, uh, where we meet every week and review all the cases and uh, it's a multidisciplinary team effort that um, uh, where we, we kind of baby steps right now. We're trying to put together this whole process in place so that we can give comprehensive onco services at, uh, at our hospital. So on the occasion of World Pathology Day, my best wishes to everyone here. Thank you very much for joining here. And I'm sure uh, as the morning session has already been so wonderful, the rest of the day will also be a very, very uh, refreshing, informative session uh, with all stalwarts over here. So my congratulations again to Dr. Anand Bosle, Dr. Bindu, Dr. Shruti Vimal, and the entire team of the Department of Pathology for having put this together. My best wishes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inspiring words, sir. I would like to call upon Dr. Rajiv Yeradeka, sir, the Honorable Dean of Faculty of Health Sciences, for his address on International Pathology Day. So I guess there's a delay in at Sir's end. Should we go ahead with the session? Wait, wait, we'll wait, Dr. Pratish. Yes. Welcome, sir. Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah. So good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for allowing me, you know, allowing me to share my views on this World Pathology Day. Uh, my greetings to all the pathologists, in fact, all the medicos <clears throat> on, the world on the occasion of the World Pathology Day. And I must place on record this phenomenal work, good work, which the Department of Pathology is doing, uh, Dr. Anand Bhoste, Dr. Shruti Vimal, and the, uh, Dr. Bindu, and everyone. Um, uh, the pathology department is emerging as one of the 
uh, you know, the face of the Symbiosis Medical College for Women. And uh, Dr. Bosle, congratulations for getting together this eminent galaxy of speakers who have gathered today to share their views on this very important uh, topics which we have selected on, on the occasion of the World Pathology Day. As Dr. Natrajan said, uh, we at Symbiosis Medical College for Women have this tumor board and the tumor board is an established entity uh, overseas and having worked in the UK and in Oman, uh, this idea was uh, first introduced to me when as a gynecologist there, we used to be treating uh, onco patients, the onco gynec patients and that time it was never an isolated one man decision and it was always a team and this concept of a tumor board was indeed welcome and I'm glad that the Symbiosis Medical College for Women and the Symbiosis University Hospital and Research Center is um, following the same tradition. Uh, well, we also are into uh, a lot of uh, ancillary aspects of tumor care beyond uh, uh, the tumor board. And uh, one of the initiatives which uh, Dr. Bosley and Dr. Bindu all have taken at the um, uh, Department of Pathology is the commissioning of the Morphal uh, machine, which allows the patient to have a global opinion on the pathology slides. And this is, I think, so a significant milestone where sitting <clears throat> within the uh, city limits in Pune, a patient has the right uh, and the access to a global expertise on the final diagnosis. So I congratulate uh, the pathology department and I look forward that all the departments emulate the department of pathology in getting such uh, stalwarts to the table, as Dr. Uh, Sagar rightly said, that uh, the name Dr. Borges is synonymous with cancer care, whether it's her father or whether it's Dr. Anita. And Dr. Anita, as Dr. Vijay Sagar said, I had heard a lot about you. I never was fortunate enough to have an interaction with you, even uh, virtual, but I've heard a lot about you um, from Dr. Kailash Sharma, who happened to be my colleague on the Board of Governors at the Medical Council of India in 2011 and 12. And it is such a cherished dream to be able to share space with you, albeit virtual, to, thanks to this uh, virtual uh, webinar which the Department of Pathology has organized. So congratulations and good luck. And I'm sure all the delegates will go back much more informed, much more knowledgeable uh, in handling patients of cancer and ensuring good, optimal care to their patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your golden words. I would like to call upon Honorable Dr. Anita Burgess for her address on oncopathology update. Thank you so much for having invited me to this, uh, uh, this conference. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, we had just New Year's Day and we had uh, Christmas Day and Diwali Day and Eid. And in between, it was all weekdays and, uh, you know, weekends, which was Saturday and Sunday. Suddenly, as I have grown older, I find all kinds of days have now come up. You know, Father's Day, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, any number of days. And I must say that I didn't know until Dr. Bosley actually contacted me that there was any such thing as a pathology day. And I'm very happy to, to learn that there was a pathology day. And it was when I went and Googled it, I discovered that it was the Royal College of Pathologists in London in sometime in 2014 or thereabouts, uh, decided that pathology mm -hmm. needed to have a day. And the, the reason being that, uh, you know, the general public had a very negative concept of what pathologists do, if they had any concept at all. And I think Pathology Day was introduced so that, uh, you know, people uh, all over the world could celebrate the things that pathologists do. And I think that uh, even if you're not a pathologist or now the, if you're a general a person uh, in the general public, you should realize that, um, you know, nothing, no clinical intervention can happen unless a pathologist is involved. And it doesn't have to be the kind of pathology that you are going to hear about today and have already heard, and that is uh, surgical pathology. It is clinical chemistry, it is molecular biology, it is microbiology. It's just clinical pathology. And I think without pathology, this, um, 
you know, clinicians just cannot act. And so I'm really very happy, Dr. Bosley, that you have chosen International Pathology Day to showcase the multifarious talents of your own institution mm -hmm. and that of an institution that I cherish very much, and that is the Tata Memorial Hospital. Because I notice that all of the speakers today are from the Tata Memorial Hospital. It is a place that, as you have heard, I have a very deep affection and uh, uh, fondness for because I played on the lawns of the hospital, uh, which is, it was a small little lawn. It's hardly there anymore because the Tata Hospital has just grown by leaps and bounds. But when I used to accompany my father and he went off to see his patients and then we as kids played on the lawn, but my own interaction with Tata Hospital for over two decades, I think Tata Hospital, and I must say this, uh, has really shaped my, my professional career and my approach to many things, apart from just, um, you know, teaching and diagnosis, et cetera, it has, it has uh, shaped my approach to patients who have uh, cancer. And you learn so much from interacting with these patients, as I'm sure everybody who is going to speak today and has already spoken uh, will tell you. So it is a very clinical uh, sort of approach to pathology, which all of the pathologists at Tata Memorial Hospital have. And I must say this about Tata Hospital, it is a very enabling institution. Once you have worked at Tata Memorial Hospital, you walk tall. And I, uh, I must uh, say that this is to do with the environment and the, uh, you know, interactive collegiality that we all shared at Tata Memorial Hospital. So with those uh, few words, I, I really want to thank you, Dr. Bruceley, for A, drawing my attention to uh, International Pathology Day, which I did not know existed, and also to make me so happy and proud that I am part of a celebration of International Pathology Day along with my colleagues at Tata Memorial Hospital. Thank you, thank you to your colleagues. Thank you to Symbiosis uh, Medical College uh, for Women for having organized this program and having me part of it. Thank you. Uh, if I could, if I could add, Madam. Yes, sure. I'm Dr. Rajiv, and I see a lot of similarity and a synergy between the doctor, the, the father-daughter duo at Symbiosis versus what you mentioned about your father at Tata Memorial. Dr. Muzumdar, our president and founder chancellor of the Symbiosis International University, and Dr. Vidya, his daughter, now leading the show at Symbiosis. So we really look forward to having an in-person interaction with you. And Dr. Muzumdar conveys his greetings to you. And, the legend, and salutations to the excellent work which you have been carrying on as a part of the legacy, rich legacy left behind by your late father. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam and Sir, for sharing your treasured experience. I would like to call upon Dr. Anand Bosley, Professor and Head of Pathology Department at the Symbiosis Medical College for Women, for his vote of thanks. Good morning, all. Before starting the vote of thanks, I'm requesting on behalf of Symbiosis International University, Symbiosis Medical College for Women uh, from Pune to Bojas, Madam, and your team. We are inviting next year offline physical CME because we got the uh, MAPCON uh, CME hosts 2022 and MAPCON ch chapter conference 2023. That is, uh, we got uh, this host because of Dr. Shubhada Agli, Madam. I'm, I'm thankful to Shubhada Agli, Madam. He supported for this. Uh, uh, conducting permission for the host as the next year, 22 and 23. So our humble request from, on behalf of our Dean FOHS also and our entire team, next year you please physically join with your team for the CME. Definitely we are happy to privilege that uh, hosting you as a uh, organizer team and speaker to come here. Thank you. And uh, now starting with this, uh, uh, on, on behalf of Department of Pathology, Symbiosis Medical College for Women, would like to thank to Honorable uh, our uh, Honorable Chancellor Dr. S. V. Mazumdar sir, our Honorable Pro Chancellor Dr. Vidya Erodikar uh, Madam, Dr. 
रजनी गुप्ते मैडम ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर देन ऑनरेबल डीन फैकल्टी ऑफ हेल्थ साइंसेज डॉक्टर राजीव एरोडेकर सर एंड ऑनरेबल डीन सर सिम्बासिस मेडिकल कॉलेज फॉर वुमन डॉक्टर लेफ्टिनेंट कर्नल टी विजया सागर सर एंड ऑनरेबल चीफ एग्जीक्यूटिव ऑफिसर्स सिम्बासिस यूनिवर्सिटी हेल्थ रिसर्च सेंटर डॉक्टर विजय नटराजन सर फॉर अलाइन एंड कंडक्टिंग दिस वर्चुअल CME on oncopathology update on auspicious day of uh, this uh, international pathology day and along with i, I am thankful to dr San, uh, rajan sanchiti sir our mmc observer and i take opportunity to thanks to main uh, agent behind this to organize this uh, uh, speakers that is dr sumit guzral sir because he is helping since last 10 to 15 years for uh, uh, getting the speakers stalwarts of the pathology from the uh, tata memorial hospital in fact in 2018 also he brought uh, five stalwarts from tata memorial hospital to chennai uh, medical college and he promised that this time virtual bojas madam will come and next year hope everyone including dr uh, subir guzra will come physically also and i am also thankful to dr manoj singh the, as a moderator for this uh, madam session and uh, uh, this especially all the speakers i am thankful uh, thankful to that uh, dr uh, this bharat reki sir dr mukta ramadwar madam then uh, dr santosh uh, then dr munita bal and all the moderators and i cannot forget all the participants uh, delegates who are participating day this on this international pathology day i am thankful to our uh, our team members team pathology which is i cannot forget dr rajan bindu sir dr sruti imal madam dr vaishali dr vivek dr pallavi dr pratiksha dr piyusha dr neha and dr manoj and dr saili and rashmi and especially i, I am thankful to our it team under the lead, uh, team of uh, pallavi power madam i am thankful on behalf of department of pathology and thank you all once again thank you sir without any further delay let us move forward to the much anticipated lecture by dr borges on reason judgment and paradox the place of evidence wisdom and hypothesis in medicine this particular session will be moderated by dr manoj singh sir is the professor and head of pathology he has been retired from aims and has been a faculty of for, of aims for 34 years he is a founder member secretary and president of the mathpath society of india he wrote the first indian dermatopathology textbook that is understanding dermatopathology and subsequently a book on tropical dermatopath 2000 in 2003 he has been uh, awarded many oration awards uh, out of which kandhari oration award by aims is important for pioneering work in dermatopathology He has been the IAPM president in 2014. He is the founder, professor, and HOD of the Indo-Nepal project of BP Kerala Institute of Health Sciences. He is a, a well-known lab assessor of NADM. He has published over 130 research papers. He has delivered numerous lectures, talks, and orations, and organized many workshops, seminars, and conferences on dermatopathology and other branches of pathology. He has been a member of various professional and voluntary associations. He has done prominent anti-tobacco work at all levels and worked on school health issues, mainly involving and improving the levels of health awareness among students. I would like to call upon Sir Dr. Manoj Singh, Sir. Just wait, Pratiksha. I am calling, uh, sir. Sir. Uh, no, no. You join. You join on which name, sir? Sudhir Arav. Uh, sir, uh, unmute, unmute yourself, Doctor Manoj. Unmute yourself, sir. Can you hear us? 
डॉक्टर सुधीर अरवा जस्ट होल्ड ऑन सर प्लीज डूइंग अनम्यूट सर यस जस्ट होल्ड ऑन सर कैन द आईटी टीम प्लीज हेल्प हां वन मिनट वन वन मिनट वी अपॉलोजाइज फॉर द डिले हां सुधीर अरवा जस्ट जस्ट हां यस 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 सर यू आर ऑन ओके मनोज यू आर ऑन यस यस थैंक यू सर थैंक यू hello everybody um um uh, i'm sorry you know post retirement uh, the necessary kind of shakings and so on and so forth i am at the moment on a borrowed uh, connection my own connection is uh, you know in a noisy room uh, i was asked to introduce uh, dr borges and uh, uh, i find that a somewhat frightening task ever since i have been in pathology dr borges has been uh you know uh, uh a senior and a towering figure in uh, uh, diagnostic pathology uh she uh, uh, uh graduated from tnmc and then training in royal marston and uh, in sloan kettering and then she has been at the tata cancer hospital for decades more than two decades right so uh, and uh, uh, currently she is uh, uh, again uh, uh, deeply involved in uh, in uh, uh, academics and in um, uh, cancer diagnostics she is working at bsl raheja hospital she is uh, working at the center for oncopathology dean of the indian college of pathologists chairman of the nabl accreditation committee she uh, uh, is you know to some extent uh, there is an expression in english called guiding the lily you know polishing the lily i mean uh, it's 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 very difficult to say anything more about anita borges except the fact that you know anita borges is speaking so ma'am i'd uh, uh, like to invite you on behalf of all of us to uh, address us i'd like to point out something which uh, those of you who are new to dr hearing dr borges uh, uh, as you will see from the title of her lecture which i leave to her to say i'm not going to say it out her lectures have uh, especially in in the past past 10 15 years she comes up with the most peculiar names and it leaves the audience wondering what is she going to talk about you know i mean as something which is seems to have nothing to do with pathology or cancer and then in the course of her talk she beautifully expounds how pathology diagnostic medicine are linked to 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 whatever she has named her current topic and so i would like to uh, 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 pass the mic on to dr borges and to her topic of the day which she will introduce she she will uh, tell the name of ma'am thank you thank you so much uh, manoj for that uh, introduction you know when you introduce me as having been in the, in pathology for decades i think um, it seems like i'm doddering on to my uh, you know to my last uh, stand or something of that sort but yes i have been in pathology for over 45 years and it seems like a very long time and if you if you feel that i have some uh, odd uh, titles to the talks that i've given in the last few years it is because um i think if you have been doing something for a very long time you come to some kind of uh, understanding or you should have come to some kind of understanding of what it is that we do why we do it and how we can do it better and i think uh, th this is a little philosophy i guess that uh, i wish to convey in the title of my talk that i have uh, today and i can share my screen uh, if i can manage it Yes, can you see my screen, everybody? Is yes, my yes, 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 yes. Manoj, the title of my talk today is "Reason, Judgment, and Paradox," and uh, 
I feel that uh, all of this, reason, judgment, and paradox, is very important because it talks about evidence, which is reason, wisdom, which I think comes from judgment. And when you are faced with a paradox, it usually needs an explanation. And therefore, that explanation can, can lead you to a hypothesis. Now, I have been a surgical pathologist all my life. And I think this is the, uh, is the place that I want to, or the context in which I want to place this particular talk. What is this reason and judgment story? Okay, I would say that uh, reason is um, very much bound up with uh, what our species is all about. You know, we call ourselves Homo sapiens, the thinking ape, I suppose. And this issue of thinking is all about rationality. Rationality is really, we believe, the crowning achievement of our species. The ability to use evidence is used in science, medicine, and of course, the, the legal system, because where else uh, does evidence play such a very important part? Reason in its logical and really pure sense is set to operate independently of experience. In other words, all rules are followed to their logical conclusion. This is true of whether the rules are legal, or otherwise, or even mathematical, two plus two equals four. And I would, from this uh, little uh, portion, I would say that there are three important words, reason, evidence, and logic. On the other hand, take judgment. Okay, in judgment, of course, there is a bit of reason, but it's the formation of an opinion after consideration or deliberation. If rules were everything, then we wouldn't need judges. And I think judgment is about context. It is evidence that is taken in a contextual kind of way. And without context, I don't think reason means very much. It, all judgment depends on experience. And in some cases, rules, even legal laws, could be disregarded in a particular context. And I want to elucidate both reason and judgment, and last of all, I will talk about paradox, in the context in which we practice. And certainly the context in which I have been practicing for over 40 years. So if I had to encapsulate this whole issue of reason and judgment, I would say that reason relates to the general. So rules, evidence, etc., relate to the general, whereas judgment only comes in when you have a particular case. And that is, you have to use your experience and take the context in which these rules and evidence have to be applied. Let's start with reason. Okay. Reason is based on, on evidence, as, uh, as I have already said. It is evidence-based medicine now has become, uh, you know, a word that trips off every tongue. But we have to understand that histopathology is a very qualitative discipline. And I would like to explore uh, whether evidence-based medicine is, can actually be practiced when you are practicing a qualitative discipline. So we will explore that. And what is the importance of, a, of context in diagnosis? So these are the two areas in the first part of my talk that I will be exploring. Now, if you want a definition of evidence-based medicine, and there are many definitions, I've chosen this one, and that is, it is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Now, you can replace this with a diagnosis. Care of individual patients, as far as pathologists are concerned, it is about diagnosis. But the real rub comes, and when you talk about surgical pathology or histopathology, 
and it is this. It is often an accusation almost that is leveled against uh, histopathologists that the whole subject is, is very subjective. And this was well uh, put by Crawford in an in a article that he wrote in 2007. And what he said was, how can it be that morphological examination of devitalized human tissue, nothing much has changed, that has been fixed in formalin, dehydrated and permeated with paraffin, sliced thinly and stained with biblical era colorizing agents, which we call HME, covered in glue and sandwiched between glass, how can it be that this can have any bearing on clinical management decisions that are made for the living patient? And yes, we are often, this uh, is often thrown at us who do histopathology. It's very qualitative, it's not quantitative, and how can you practice evidence-based medicine? Well, so let's, let's get into that subject. It is true that anatomic pathology literature is largely observational in nature. Evidence in anatomic pathology consists mainly of case series and often retrospective reviews. It is also subject to inter and intra -observer, observer variation. And when you take the pyramid of evidence-based medicine, you will find that we, what we do in pathology, histopathology, comes right at the bottom of this pyramid. And you know that we talk about levels of evidence, level one, level two. And one would wonder whether this anatomic pathology or surgical pathology or histopathology, as we call it, could ever be considered for as evidence-based uh, medicine. Because what, what is our... our contribution to the literature. It's certainly not randomized clinical trials, nor is it meta-analyses. Well, sometimes you have some cohort studies, sometimes case control studies, but extremely few. Most of the literature that we produce or we rely on are case series, case reports, and of course, opinion. Now, this was a very um, humorous piece that was published way back in 1999, when evidence-based medicine was in its, uh, its infancy. And this was jokingly called seven alternatives to evidence-based medicine. If you see the bright blue uh, line over there, if it is your basis for clinical decisions is evidence, the marker that you use is the randomized control trial, the measuring device is a meta-analysis, and the unit of measurement is the odds ratio, and we all know that. And that is what is the epitome of evidence-based medicine. But there are also other kinds of um, alternatives to evidence-based medicine, jokingly, eminence-based medicine, where the marker is the radiance of white hair. I have a lot of it now. Measuring device, the luminometer, and the unit of measurement, optical density. And you can go and read this article. It's extremely humorous. And I wonder where pathologists would fall in this seven alternatives to evidence-based medicine. And maybe we would fall here. Diffidence-based medicine and nervousness-based medicine because you know that today, everybody, including pathologists, are practicing defensive medicine. And we, you know, the marker is how, how often we are faced with with litigation and therefore are, have litigation phobia. Now I wonder what the confidence-based uh, alternative to evidence-based medicine, whom does that apply to? Well, I would say it would apply to my surgical colleagues, right? Where the marker that is used to, uh, to determine whether this is or not confidence is bravado. You measure the device and that is the sweat test, which means no sweat at all. The unit of measurement, of course, is no sweat. Well, I, I advise you to go and read this because it is it tells you about what exactly all this evidence-based medicine is about and why, uh, you know, we pathologists get the, uh, you know, the back end of the stick. 
because evidence-based pathology is said to have a great deal of inter-observer variation. And I've just shown you some of the things that we do on a regular basis. You know, we do grading of rectal carcinoma, classification of Hodgkin's lymphoma, even CIN one to three, acute liver rejection, breast cancer grade, grade, subtype, ADH, and uh, yes, this is the melanoma thickness, and you have a Kappa score, and the Kappa scores are on the right. If you have anything above six, six or above six, then you're doing well. And the only Kappa scores that match are CIN3, where at least 50, if, you know, you get a Kappa score of five, where you will get good, reasonably good inter-observer variation on what constitutes CIN3. And of course, if you're actually using a measuring device, like, you know, to measure the thickness of something, then you get a, a good Kappa score. But look at all the other Kappa scores. They are very, very low, not even reasonable. So I feel that this inter-observer variation has to be looked at very seriously by those of us who do surgical pathology. Now I will just quickly take you through this uh, inter, I'm sure there are a whole lot of pathologists here who are, uh, who are very familiar with this, and that is trying to determine whether there are or there are not clear nuclei in, um, in a follicular lesion and whether that constituted the follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Okay, many, much of this has become moot now because after 2016, there is an entity which is called the non-invasive uh, follicular lesion with papillary thyroid, tumor with papillary thyroid nuclei. But nonetheless, we still have to be able to determine whether or not there are nuclear features of papillary thyroid carcinoma, All right? So this, this is one of the papers that was uh, published in which there was observer variation in the diagnosis of the follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. And you can see that 87 such lesions were given to 10 reviewers and they were all experts. And you can see that reviewer number one, reviewer number five, six, seven, and eight, okay, called everything the follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, or nearly everything. Whereas there were other reviewers who called it not at all. Oh, there was, so what is this inter-observer variation all about and how do people then make diagnoses and how are these patients actually treated? Now I can show you another such thing that came this was in 2008. And I don't think things have improved since then. Look at observer number five and observer number six. Observer number five, uh, uh, you see that these are all experts or you can call them expert number five and they had 15 cases and he called everything, he or she, I don't know uh, whether it's a male or a female, called everything follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer except for one, which everybody agreed, and that's the uh, case number two, was benign, okay? So that was not a carcinoma. And you take um, expert number six. Expert number six called just two lesions of follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Everything else was something, was something else. Even more alarming would be if you looked at intra-observer vari variability. So the same number of cases was shown to people without them being able to identify what those cases were. And if you looked at the six, except for this one person, okay, who that is expert number, who made the same diagnosis, no matter what, that, uh, what uh, the case was, there is no in, uh, intra-observer variation either. Now that must be giving everybody who is not a, a pathologist, the heebie-jeebies, because have you been treating, uh, you know, patients based on very uh, low evidence that there can be uh, so much inter-observer variation? 
Well, what would people do, and this is true of this follicular variant of papillary thyroid transplant, what was the safest alternative? Do you know that most people would call it follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma? And that was the reason that there was a tendency to overdiagnose this follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. And this is another very in interesting article that somebody should read because he quotes, the author, Dr. Renshaw, quotes one Rosai. And this is the story is told that was told by Juan Rosai, and you know that he was the doyen of pathology who we lost uh, early last year, uh, about a very difficult melanocytic lesion that was sent to him in consultation from a pathologist friend in private practice. After a long study, Dr. Rosai decided it was benign. His friend thanked him for his opinion, but told him that he was still going to diagnose it as malignant melanoma. The friend said that if he called it melanoma and it never came back, everyone would be happy that the patient was cured. If he called it benign and it came back, then he would end up in court. Now, this is the dilemma that faces the practicing pathologist every day. The tendency to overdiagnose seems to be inevitable as long, of course, about malpractice attorneys as well as pathology experts who all have uh, varying opinions on the same as we have seen and a limited risk to the overdiagnosis. Okay? So we have to ask this question. Can a subjective discipline, which has so much inter-observer variation in some parts, be used as a gold standard? Well, we pathologists have known for a long time, histopathologists, that this is a subjective discipline. And so we have taken steps to minimize errors in histopathology, to try and have evidence-based clinical and translational research, and also external quality assurance. Of course, when you have external quality assurance, there is always this nagging doubt, is the majority opinion always representative of the truth? Indeed, is there one truth? All right, minimizing errors. And we know all about this. There are scoring systems, there are minimal data sets, and I've shown you one data set for colorectal carcinoma on the right side. And there are standardized criteria for diagnosis and or subclassification. And I think pathologists over the years have become more and more aware that we have to, to uh, be certain that our inter-observer variation is, gets lower and lower. And these are various steps that have now come into being, and I think rightly uh, so. We also are in, in, in the process of trying to put a lot of what we do, which helps clinicians, onto very solid evidentiary grounds. And this is one of these, uh, these papers, and I, I don't want to labor the point, but you know that, of course, this is from an English uh, journal. They still use the Duke's classification uh, over there for uh, staging. And you see that in general, yes, the green uh, arrow shows that Duke's B, if you take all Duke's B patients, they certainly do better with Duke C case, uh, cases, which means, uh, patients who have lymph node metastasis, it certainly does better. But if you break down the Duke's B and all of these Duke's B cases have no lymph node metastases and you break them down into those that have perf perforated tumors, involved margins, uh, vascular emboli or other criteria, which we know today are very bad prognostic criteria, you will find that those Duke's B uh, tumors do very badly. And it is as a result of the pathologists actually breaking down a otherwise supposedly homogenous group, which is has no lymph node metastases into all of these different subtypes that we have realized that Duke's B is not homogeneous, number one, and number two, there are some Duke's B tumors, which of course don't have lymph node metastases, 
that do worse than tumors with lymph node metastasis. And now this has come into the current understanding of the staging of colorectal cancer. Now also there are other papers and evidence based, I'm just going to tell you this on thymomas, where we know that transcapsular invasion is not a significant prognostic feature. So we have to, uh, we had to rewrite the Masaoka classification of uh, staging of uh, thymic uh, carcinomas. And similarly over here, the World Health Organization classification could be simplified into just three categories other than you know, the ones that are currently being, uh, being shown. Of course, these are papers that are doing this and finally they will end up in the, in the WHO classifications as time go on. So let's ask this question again. Can a subjective discipline be used as a gold standard? And I wonder what your answer will be at the end of it all. And the answer is yes, of course. Because do you realize that anatomical data, every time I say that something is a squamous carcinoma or I say something is a, has got uh, that this or that uh, uh, factor which can be used in prognosis is regularly and successfully used in evidence-based um, management for patient uh, management decisions. So I, I think that this issue of you know, histopathology, surgical pathology being so subjective that, you know, we are constantly disagreeing with uh, one another is not really true because no randomized clinical trial would be able to proceed unless there was anatomical data that, and prognostic in, information that was included in that randomized clinical trial. So I am very sanguine that this is just a finger pointing device and it really isn't as bad as it, as it seems. And I will just quote Juan Rosai again, and, he, and there's nothing truer that is being said. There is no technique in all of medicine that provides so much information so quickly and for such little cost as the H&E technique. And you don't even have to go beyond uh, the H&E for this to be true. And in our uh, local language, it is Sundar, Sasta, and Tikao, and the H&E, Maybe biblical era stains, but it's not going anywhere fast. All right, now that we have talked about reason, let's talk about judgment. And what is the importance of context? And I think reason is important, but context is extremely important. Now we know that we have a rule, right? Thou shall not kill. If you do, you will be punished. Well, do you think that people kill and they are not punished? Of course they do. And there is a context. And what is this context? Capital punishment by the state. You know that India is one of those countries in the world that still has capital punishment. So we kill, we kill people who have been adjudged to be, you know, have murdered or have, have done some very heinous uh, crime. So yes, we do. We do have capital punishment by the state. War causes a lot of, uh, of killing and we justify that in, uh, in war as it being a just war. And of course, you can kill in self-defense and that is the context in which this rule is disregarded. Now, how about this rule? Thou shall not steal. If you do, you will be punished. And what is the context? Here is a hungry child caught stealing food. Do you think that you require a punishment in this particular context? Well, I would not punish, but that is a judgment, okay? Because this is the context in which the rule has to be looked at in its overall context. So you may say, say yes, okay, this is, you have to make an example of this, but what is the quantum of punishment? That also requires a judgment. So what am I telling you? That it's not enough to have a rule. You have to be able to apply that rule with experience within a context. Now let us take this and apply it to a medical uh, example, right? 
Here is evidence-based medicine, and I call it versus real world, world medicine. Now, there is an EBM guideline, and if there are physicians there, they will recognize this. You can go to the Cochrane report and uh, Cochrane uh, reports and look at it. And that is treatment of mild hypertension is a diuretic. Now I will give you a context. And this is the context. A middle-aged, heavy osteoarthritic, recently widowed, never before hypertensive woman who's living in a chawl, and a chawl, if, uh, if you're not aware, is a, is a kind of a tenement in which people share their uh, facilities like uh, toilets and bathrooms, etc. And the, in this chawl, the toilet is Indian style and not on the same floor. Okay. Now, what is the judgment which or the decision that has to be made by the physician? Do you think that this would be a diuretic? Although this patient has got mild hypertension, she's heavy, she's osteoarthritic, and that uh, toilet is on another floor. And I think the answer would be no, we wouldn't use a diuretic. Okay, probably not. Why? Because a more appropriate treatment would be an anxiolytic and reassurance because she's, she just lost her husband. And probably that is the, the cause of her, uh, of her mild hypertension. What she needs is to be reassured that she's well, that, you know, uh, some anti-anxiety medication has to be given. Certainly not a diuretic that will make her uh, you know, run up and down, particularly at night, uh, to, you know, with her osteoarthritis, it's never going to be a very pleasant uh, experience. So this is where I, I think we have to realize that we make rules and those rules, or according to the evidence, apply to the general, but a judgment applies to the particular. And so let us see how it works in, in uh, histopathology. All right. Now here is a case, and this is an endometrial curatage, which looks like a carcinoma. But in certain circumstances and certain contexts, it is not to be treated as a carcinoma. And I'll give you that context. Okay, and here is a context where this was a young woman who was 40 years old, and she, we, I, we received this uh, material for, um, to confirm the diagnosis of a well-differentiated carcinoma. Now I will tell you the context. She had a late marriage, long history of irregular periods with infrequent bouts of heavy bleeding, never sought a gynecological opinion till desirous of conception. The, Ultrasound showed polycystic ovaries, a very thick endometrium, and there was no myometrial involvement. So should we call this a, a carcinoma? And this woman who is desirous of having her own child should, uh, uh, because she had a late marriage, should she have her uterus whipped out, which would be the treatment for a well-differentiated endometrial adeno, endometroid adenocarcinoma? Well, I don't think so. Because of the context, this is what we should probably have reported it as. And we did. Atypical endometrial proliferation, which is indistinguishable. It is histologically indistinguishable from a well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma. Certainly, if this woman was postmenopausal and 60 years old, this would be treated as a, it would be diagnosed and treated as, an, as a carcinoma. This is a proliferation that has been driven by unopposed estrogen stimulation, and we'd probably call it atypical hyperplasia or endometrial in situ neoplasia. And we see a lot of young uh, conditions in, like this in young women, and they are reversible by hormonal manipulation. And I'll show you how this looked like in the same woman after she had four months of GnRH agonist uh, therapy absolutely quiet endometrium. And this woman then went on to have, uh, you know, IVF. I don't know whether that IVF was successful or not, but at least 
her uterus didn't get ripped out for something that was called an adenocarcinoma, well-differentiated adenocarcinoma of the endometrium. Now, I, this is one of my favorite, uh, uh, favorite cases, and I'm sure that I have, uh, some of you will have heard of me talk about it before. Now, this was the excision of a mass on the palmar surface of the, of the right hand of a 22-year-old recently married female with a six-month-old child. Okay, and she walked into my, uh, into my lab carrying this child accompanied by her father. Okay, we were sent by a, an orthopedic surgeon because he wanted to confirm that this patient actually had what was called a syringocyst adenocarcinoma in the palm of her hand. And this, they had, everybody had, uh, had uh, advised an amputation at the wrist. And two previous pathologists, and good pathologists, had called it a syringocyst adenocarcinoma. You know what my diagnosis was? It was a lipoma. Now, any, any pathologist who's looking at this would know that this is ridiculous. How can you call something that looks like a high-grade uh, adenocarcinoma? Maybe you don't want to call it a syringocyst adenocarcinoma. How can you call it a lipoma? Well, I'll tell you why, all right? It is the context. The context of a syringocyst adenocarcinoma on the hand of any individual is an extremely unusual occurrence. Okay? And on the hand of a 22-year-old, without anything, you know, suddenly you get a syringocyst adenocarcinoma. So I thought, let me, let me find the history. Fortunately, this girl had come from some, I think this, they had come from Bhopal, and she was there. So I asked her the history, you know. And you know what she told me? I, how long, I asked her, have you had this? And she said, 12 years. I said, 12 years? Then why did you have it removed? Did it grow suddenly? She said, no, actually, it was giving me no trouble at all. I, I miss it now that I don't have it because it was so, so uh, comforting for me to, uh, to sort of play with this. I said, play with it? She said, yes, it was soft. And it was nodular and I used to play with it, but my husband didn't like it there because he didn't like it when he held my, my hand. And so he asked, uh, he sent me to a surgeon, somebody in their family to have it excised. So I said, can I see the surgeon's notes? And yes, and what did the surgeon's notes say? Say, palmar lipoma. And so I said, can I see your, see the pathologist, original pathologist notes? And sure, you know what the original pathologist's gross description was? Yellow, greasy nodule and, and some size or the, or, or the other, three centimeters in size. Okay, so I called up that pathologist and I said, you know, you, you uh, grossed a lesion which you described like a lipoma why did you call this? He says, well, I got the slide. No, and on the slide, I saw this, uh, this tumor. And then I sent it to two pathologists and they both agreed with me. I said, do you process your stuff in-house? And he said, no. And then it occurred to me <laughs> that this was something that had been inserted into the patient's block. Why? Because there was a clear lipoma also present in that, on that slide and in that uh, block. So, you know, I told them that this is not a, this is not a tumor, your tumor, this is a lipoma. And if you want to be absolutely certain, go and get DNA fingerprinting done. And they went to CCMB in Hyderabad and lo and behold, the lipoma part was, you know, belonged to the patient. And obviously the one that looked like the adenocarcinoma didn't belong to that patient. Okay, so I think that this is a salutary lesson to us all that the evidence said that there was a carcinoma, but the context was wrong. So I think that we must always keep our, uh, the context in mind before we make a decision that can have very uh, bad consequences for the patient.
Okay. So on the other hand, there is a, the alternative, uh, uh, the alternate kind of situation. And what is that? When is a car? When a carcinoma is not a carcinoma, but it turns out to be so. And this is the famous verrucous carcinoma story. You can do a punch biopsy from a buccal mucosa group and get atypical hyperplasia. Please repeat, not once, twice, three, three times. And if the surgeon is not very careful to, you know, or the pathologists themselves are not very careful to go and see what this lesion looks like, then you're going to miss a verrucous carcinoma. So it doesn't look like a carcinoma on your biopsy but it is a verrucous carcinoma in the context in which this biopsy has been taken, okay? So some people come and say, oh, that's fine, that's okay. But if you, if you have immunohistochemistry and molecular techniques, then your uh, context becomes less important and judgment takes a backseat to, uh, you know, to reason. Judgment should take a backseat to reason. And I think, yes, immunohistochemistry and molecular techniques, of course, they objectivize diagnosis. When you're not very sure, and you just heard, uh, at least I was there for, for Mukta's talk, and she, she put it very nicely. You need to do immunohistochemistry to objectivize your diagnosis in certain situations when, when it's going to make a lot of difference to the patient. Right, and a lot of people say, yes, it is black or brown or white or whatever it is, and therefore it is so. And I think I can show you examples where it may be black, brown, white or whatever, and it isn't so. And people be believe so much in molecular and uh, immunohistochemistry because science trumps opinion, right? Well, I will show you just this one case. It's a 29-year-old male, son of a leading physician, biopsy of a lymph node in the parotid region. And when you, when you went into the history, there's a sudden onset of multiple lymphadenopathy. They biopsy the parotid node. Everything else was normal, including the ESR. And the block was sent in for a second opinion because of the primary diagnosis of mixed cellularity Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I'll just very quickly show you, this is the H&E, and, &E, and you can see that it has a moth-eaten appearance. There are huge numbers of these large cells, and those large cells are CD30 positive. There is a background of uh, you know, T cells, B cells are very, are very few. And somebody made the diagnosis of Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma, okay, in this case. But the context was wrong. And why was that context wrong? This is infectious mononucleosis, and you don't get sudden onset lymphadenopathy in Hodgkin's lymphoma, even if you are related to a physician. Many things can happen if you're related to the physician, and worst thing is that you will be treated like a VIP, and many things go wrong if you are related to a physician, but you don't get sudden onset lymphadenopathy in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, so the context was wrong. You had objectively, and I can tell you, if somebody had gone to do, had even gone to do EBERS, that is Epstein-Barr virus, it would have been positive in these, uh, in these cells, okay? So I don't think that doing ISH or even doing immunohistochemistry, if you are not aware of the context, is going to help you to reach the right diagnosis. Now, what about molecular profiling? And I just want to tell you, this has been written by one of the, the big noises in, uh, in breast uh, pathology, and that is uh, Reish Filio. And he, he says that, yes, you, you can use molecular profiling, and molecular profiling is good, but it doesn't offer anything more than what you can do with your, um, you know, not just an h &E, in this case, perhaps an h &E and immunohistochemistry. And there was somebody who was even more uncharitable, and that's Ionides, who wrote that on close scrutiny in five of the seven largest studies on cancer prognosis, this technology performs no better, and this technology meaning molecular profiling, than flipping a coin. The other two studies barely beat horoscopes. I'm not, I'm not bashing 
uh, molecular uh, pathology. It it has made uh, you know the has changed the scenario of of management, but it has to be used and in the right again. I'll use that word in the right context. Otherwise, I think you can have terrible consequences. And I just want to put this up for those who believe that gene expression profiling, and particularly in breast cancer, is the beginning and the end. And you are willing to spend, you know, $3,000 and $4,000 to get it done. And this is, a, these are people who are, um, uh, you know, who are statisticians, okay. And I just want to read the lines that I've highlighted. It says, we demonstrated that in breast cancer, any set of 100 genes or more selected at random has a 90% chance to be significantly associated with outcome. Thus, any investigator is bound to find an association, however whimsical their, their marker is. Okay, so you just choose, you know, 100 genes. Now, why? Why does that happen? <laughs> and these are statisticians. And they have explained the results by showing that much of the breast cancer transcript, transcriptome is enriched. It is correlated with proliferation. It is enriched for proliferation markers. So those with higher proliferation obviously have a worse prognosis. And those with lower proliferation have a better prognosis together with ER and PR. And what do we do every day in our labs? ER, PR, HER2, and KI67, okay? So we have to be a little bit, a little bit, um, what I, I won't say skeptical, but we should be thinking more about anything and everything that people say is more objective, more uh, reliable than what we have been doing so far. So let me just conclude this reason and judgment part. And I will quote Alby Sachs, who was the first uh, Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa. He said that delivering a judgment is not dependent on personal taste. And therefore, I don't think it is just an opinion, right? Nor is it the product of a purely logical exercise. So it's not entirely dependent on rules and reason. It is like the solution, like the solution to a mathematical problem. So, you know, it's not two plus two equals four. It is the outcome of an evaluation of a weighing up of determinate factors in the light of agreed credit. So in other words, in a context. And if you really see what the evidence-based, uh, you know, he was called the guru of evidence-based medicine. Okay, and that was Sackett. What did he write? That external evidence can inform, but can never replace. And what does he mean by external evidence? That is what we call evidence-based medicine. Okay? What is written in randomized control trials, what meta-analyses tell, meta tell you. External evidence can inform, but can never replace individual clinical expertise. And this is true of diagnostic expertise. It is this expertise that decides whether the external evidence applies to the individual patient at all, and if so, how it should be integrated into a clinical decision. And this, my friends, is what surgical pathology is really all about. It is not just about making a diagnosis. It is about how the diagnosis and many other things in the in the context can be conveyed to the clinician. I come now to the last part of my talk, and that is paradox, and how paradox drives hypothesis. A paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition, but when you investigate it or try to explain it, you may, you may well find that this proves to be true. It comes from this word paradoxus, you know, which means unbelievable or literally beyond belief. And uh, why have I shown you the picture of Zeno? Zeno of Alea was a, a you know, third 
century BC, uh, BC philosopher who lived in Italy. And he was famous for his paradoxes. And, you know, he used to, um, of course, he knew the answer to the paradox, but the paradox on its face was so perplexing that people used to scratch their heads and say, well, what he is saying seems unbelievable. And yet he would in the end prove it to be true. Now, in our clinical everyday lives, whether we are, do, we are doing clinical medicine or we're doing pathology, we come across paradoxes. And I'm going to tell you the story of the paradoxes that I came across when I was in Tata Hospital in um, doing squamous carcinoma or looking at squamous carcinomas of the head and neck. Okay? And the first uh, in thing that I was interested in was prediction of occult metastasis in the N0 neck because the clinicians wanted to have this question. You can't feel a metastasis in the neck. You have a small primary tumor in the tongue. And the question was to treat or not to treat because if you treat it, and uh, you, you didn't find any metastases over there because you would be causing a lot of morbidity because in those days, they used to do an elective uh, dissection of uh, the neck or they would radiate the neck, one or the other. And this, was, this caused a lot of morbidity. So it made sense to try and find cases that were likely to harbor uh, occult metastasis in that what we refer to as the N0 neck. So we then decided to check whether the pathology of the primary tumor could predict which cases harbored the metastasis. Now, one of the first things we did was to look at tumor thickness. And this was published a long time ago in which we, we found that the watershed zone was four millimeters. And I'm I'm quite, uh, you know, sort of happy to know that tumor thickness, uh, they call it depth of uh, invasion, has now come into the TNM classification for staging of uh, tongue cancer. So this was uh, one thing that we, we found and published. But we also found something very interesting. And uh, at that time, we were looking at... Uh, uh, the proliferation index and the apoptotic index of these small tongue cancers. Okay, and you know what we found? We found, and you can you can see that over here, that the proliferation index, if you measured it, and we measured it by uh, looking at two, uh, three actually at that time factors. You know, we did PCNA. We looked at uh, you know the labeling index, and we also looked at uh, so, uh, you know, looked at measuring this by uh, flow cytometry. So we were just doing this as part of a study. And we found that the proliferation index was not significant with respect to predicting whether that case would have a metastasis in the N0 neck. And how did we do it? We had the primary tumor and the elective neck dissection. And we knew whether there were metastases in that neck, which was otherwise N0, okay? But you know what uh, odd thing was? That the apoptotic index had a very significant p-value, not only for finding uh, metastases in the N0 neck, but also with respect to long-term uh, prognosis. You can see that if the, apoto the apoptotic index was high, the patients didn't do so well. If the apoptotic index was low, the patients did quite well. Now, this is very, uh, you know, counterintuitive. It is paradoxical. You would assume that something that is proliferating very rapidly should have a worse prognosis than uh, something that is proliferating less rapidly. And on the other hand, you would think that the tumor that was, because the apoptotic index tells you about tumor death, uh, cell death, that something that is dying maybe should have a better prognosis than something that is not dying so fast, okay? So this was the paradox. The rate of cell death predicts so-called metastasis in the N0 neck, 
Well, the rate of proliferation does not, and we needed to find an explanation. This was what we had observed. And we had to ask why death mattered more than proliferation. And you know, secondarily, how is it related to the predictive value of tumor thickness? And we came up with a hypothesis which we published. And in this hypothesis, we talked about clonal heterogeneity and its relationship to metastasis. Now, you know that uh, as a tumor grows and uh, you know, it starts off by being uh, homogeneously clonal, that means there is very little clonal heterogeneity. But as, because a tumor system is often, um, you know, has, uh, is unstable, you will have various, uh, with the increase in size and therefore the number of, my, of mitoses or the cell turnover, you are going to get other clones that develop where you are going to get um, change in the, in the genomic makeup. Now, as that increases, one of these clones may have the potential for metastasis. Okay, so if this is so, let, let's just enunciate this problem. In a given tumor, the degree of clonal heterogeneity, yes, how many clones, heterogeneous clones you have, will vary with the number of cell divisions. Obviously, the more the cell divisions, the more likely there is to be a genomic change that has taken place, a mutation, you may call it, that has taken place during one of these cell divisions. Okay. Therefore, it stands to reason that the probability of the emergence of a metastatic clone will increase with the number of cell divisions over time. And what you have to to uh, really wrap your head around is the number of cell divisions, okay? And the number of cell divisions that have taken place in the tumor, therefore, should correlate with metastasis, and that is shown in this um, cartoon that I have uh, shown. And here is the explanation, right? Let us say that two tumors, both have got 16 cells in them. When we encounter them, encounter those tumors in the clinic, okay? I've just said 16 cells because my math is very poor and I couldn't have a very large number over there to, uh, to do this. Now, this first tumor has a proliferation index that is the rate at which the cells are proliferating of X. And the other one has a proliferating index of 2x. And you can see that over here. So this one is proliferating slower than this one. Now, let us see how this works, okay? The proliferating index, uh, the proliferating, every tumor starts with one cell, okay? To reach 16 cells, it will have to undergo four divisions, right? except that this tumor is, is started dividing before this tumor did because its proliferation index is X, okay? So at, it, has, it takes a longer time to reach 16, but it still has only four cell divisions. Here you have the proliferin, proliferation index of 2X, it starts at a low, at a uh, early, at a more proximal time, but it still has four divisions. Okay, so now do you understand that it the number of cell divisions that it takes to go from one to sixteen is four? It doesn't matter if it's it's proliferating quicker; it's still four divisions, yes? So if you had to ask yourself, okay, what is the possibility of a metastatic clone in this developing in this tumor versus the rapidly dividing tumor? It's only got four divisions in the first and four divisions in the next. The chance of developing a metastatic clone is the same because the number of cell divisions is the same. But now if you take apoptosis, okay, this is a tumor that is 
has got Y, apoptotic index of Y. It is uh, the, uh, the rate of cell death is low. Now, if it has to go from 1 to 16, and I don't know what the rate of cell, uh, you know, the rate is. So maybe it will take a number of divisions. Now, if it has double the number of uh, the double the rate of apoptosis, so more cells in this tumor are dying. And if it has to reach 16, obviously it has to have more cell divisions. Yeah. Otherwise, it will never reach 16, at this, uh, which is also in the same uh, as the previous uh, tumor is. So if you take the number of cell divisions over here, the one that has a higher apoptotic rate will have had more cell divisions to reach a size, which is the same size as in the other tumor. And therefore, it is more likely to have a metastatic clone or twice as more likely to have a metastatic clone than in the first tumor, okay? And this also we published. And this just tells you that when you have a higher apoptotic rate, it is to reach a, the same size, okay? The size is the same as a tumor with a lower apoptotic rate because we're seeing these tumors at the same size in the clinic. They are small tongue tumors. Now just put the context of the tongue in there and they're small. And these small tongue tumors have obviously the same number of cells, but this one is a biologically, the lower one is a biologically older tumor. It has got a higher number of cell, it has had a higher number of cell divisions to reach the same size as its biologically younger uh, counterpart, okay? And therefore now we have proved that Apoptosis is a very sensitive index of occult lymph node metastasis. Why? Because for a given tumor size, and that is the small T1 uh, tongue tumor or T2 tongue tumors, which are small, you will find that it is a biologically older tumor. It, it talks about age, biologically age is older, and the proliferation index does not predict nodal metastasis in the N0. Neck. Okay, so this paradox of uh, apoptosis versus proliferation has been proved. Okay, now this last paradox, and that's the paradox of the unknown primary. We see, see this all the time. Anybody who works in uh, head and neck oncology will know that there's a huge primary tumor, a secondary tumor in the lymph node. Sometimes it's fungating, but you can't find the primary tumor or it's very small, sometimes completely undetectable. And we have to ask this question. This is a paradox. Why does a tumor grow inadequately at the primary site, yet grow profusely in its metastatic site? Okay. And what we postulated again was a hypothesis that the tumor which had a known primary with a metastasis had very efficient angiogenesis, the tumors grew, invaded, metastasized, and there was growth in the lymph node. On the other hand, the unknown primary was angiogenically insufficient or was, was very inefficient as far as the, its angiogenic capacity. It just had subclinical growth because it never grew beyond an angiogenesis is required for a tumor to reach a size that is clinically detectable. Otherwise, you get repeated, uh, repeated cycles of proliferation and apoptosis because the cells die, and you do not get a very obvious uh, growth over there. So we, there is some clinical growth, which gives rise to invasion. Just because it's not growing doesn't mean it cannot invade, metastasize, and grow in a in the metastatic lymph node. So we tried, we wanted to test this hypothesis. And so what did we do? We couldn't test the primary tumors because the ones that the metastasis from an unknown primary didn't have a primary to test. So we took the metastasis from known primary, metastasis from an unknown primary, 
And we tested it for a variety of things, but amongst them, we tested it for VEGF, that's vascular endothelial growth factor. Okay? Whether they were, whether this tumor was angiogenically competent or not. And I don't want to uh, belabor this point. This has also been, been uh, published. And the conclusion of the study is that metastasis from an unknown primary reflect a tumor of relative angiogenic incompetence. Aha, you say, okay, it is angiogenically incompetent. But how does an angiogenically incompetent or deficient tumor, which cannot grow at its primary site, how does it grow in a lymph node? Now, there's another paradox. Isn't that so? And the answer is, well, prior to this study, we had done some work. And I have to acknowledge Dr. Naresh and Dr. Nehurkar and Dr. Agarwal, who were my uh, you know, co-authors in this, in this work. Uh, we had already shown, also published data, that angiogenesis is redundant for tumor growth in lymph node metastasis. Okay? And how did we do this? Well, we took 16 squamous carcinomas from the head and neck, all with lymph node metastasis. We took four blocks from each place, the tumor, normal mucosa, nodal metastasis, and uh, in the same, uh, person, uh, same individual, there were some nodes that were not metastatic. Okay, so we compared them. And you know what we found? We found that all nodes in the neck, whether they uh, had, uh, uh, you know, um, metastases or no metastases, had a lot of angiogenesis. And the ones without the metastases had the highest level of, of uh, vessel counts. That means they were loaded with vessels, okay? Whereas the primary tumor and the metastatic uh, lymph nodes had, yeah, they were less than those, that, less vessels than were in this primary, uh, in the non-metastatic lymph node. But this was all vessel counts. But when you looked at neoangiogenesis, and we did that by double immunostaining in which we were able to show vessels that were proliferating by doing a proliferation marker, which was a nuclear marker, as well as doing factor eight that showed vessels. So those markers that showed a nuclear uh, marker, as well as uh, were showed factor eight, they were the new angiogenesis, newly formed vessels. Did you see something very really interesting over here? That the non-metastatic nodes had absolutely no neoangiogenesis. They had the highest number of vessels, if you were counting all vessels, but no neoangiogenesis. The primary tumor had a higher level of, of neoangiogenesis, but that was downregulated when it came into uh, you know, the metastatic lymph node. So what does it tell you? That when there is a metastatic situation in a lymph node, a tumor that is angiogenically competent actually downregulates its angiogenic capacity because it has so many uh, vessels already in this area. It does not uh, need the hypoxia to actually stimulate its neoangiogenesis. Okay. So was the paradox solved? Well, we have an insufficient, we have an unknown primary. There is VGF and FGF downregulated and angiogenic phenotype, subclinical growth, and all of that. And it grows in the metastatic lymph nodes uh, setting because angiogenesis we had found in the previous study was redundant. Okay, so, and I come now to uh, the end. Apoptosis, apoptosis, angiogenesis, and lymph node metastasis. They were all paradoxical. Apoptosis and not, and not proliferation is an important predictor of lymph node metastasis. Occult primary tumors are tumors deficient in angiogenic ability, but grow in lymph nodes because angiogenesis is redundant for lymph node growth, uh, sorry, for tumor growth in the lymph node because it already has, the lymph nodes have so much uh, so many vessels. Okay? So what are the lessons that I learned from this paradox? That death can sometimes be more meaningful than unbridled growth and greatness can come from very humble beginnings. 
So ladies and gentlemen, this is my last slide. I would say that judgment tempers reason and it should do so. Yet judgment without reason is mere opinion and it should never be so. Any paradox begs an answer and hypothesis shows the way. Histopathology may be a subjective discipline, but it uses evidence, it uses wisdom and hypothesis in the real world. Thank you very much indeed for a very patient listening. Thank you for the wonderful talk, ma'am. I would like to call upon Dr. Manoj Singh for his comments. Thank you, madam. Dr. Pratik's question and sir. Okay. Wow, Dr. Borges. Absolutely wow. And before I go on to what else I am supposed to do, you know, moderate questions and so on and so forth, I would like to join um, the rest of our audience in applauding an absolutely beautiful exposition of logic and philosophy, which she has blended into hardcore diagnostic pathology, delivered with perfect lucidity and Overall, a stupendous discussion. Ma'am, thank you thank very you. much indeed. Thank you very much, Manoj. That, is, uh, that was and, very, very sweet and very kind of you. Yes. And, and now, in case there are any questions or anybody wants, uh, I would uh, like to suggest one thing. You know, ma'am has given several uh, hardcore pathology examples. There is no point going into those because those are diagnosed. If you have any technical questions about the, 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 the cases, uh, that might be done better on the email or something. And in case you have any uh, any comments or any um, uh, questions about the 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 overall, the, as I said, the philosophy uh, of the lecture, please uh, go ahead and ask. Them. I think everyone is too mesmerized by the lecture, by the talk, to ask any questions. It was just a pleasure to hear um, talk about such a diverse topic. Thank you. Thank you all of you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bosley, thank for you, having Mara. invited me. And thank you to your uh, symbiosis, uh, uh, you know, uh, college for having me at, on this very, uh, I think, important International Pathology Day. Thank you, thank you Madam. Next year, please uh, join uh, our institute for uh, CME, sir. Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Manoj Singh, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Agle, Madam. Yeah. We have a break now, don't we? Yes. Ah, lunch, lunch, yeah, lunch time it is one hour. Okay. Yeah, one thirty you can join everybody. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, madam. I will leave and come back again. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye -bye. We'll start again at one thirty PM sharp. Please do join. One thirty. One thirty PM. One thirty PM. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, madam. Thank you once again now. Bye. Bye.
हेलो हेलो यस सर हेलो आगे
हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून वन एंड ऑल आई डॉक्टर पल्लवी भूमिया फैकल्टी एट सनबाइसिस मेडिकल कॉलेज फॉर वुमेन वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर द पोस्ट लंच सेशन ऑफ दिस सीएमई द नेक्स्ट टॉक इज बाय डॉक्टर मुनीता बाल मैम एंड शी इज डिलीविंग अ टॉक ऑन बायोप्सी इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ हेड एंड नेक ट्यूमर्स द मॉडरेटर फॉर दिस सेशन इज डॉक्टर रंजीत कांगले सर Sir is the professor and head at Department of Pathology at Jawaharlal Medical College, Belgaum. Sir has graduated and post graduated from JNMC Belgaum and is currently working in the JNMC Belgaum Institute since twenty six years. He is a PG guide, UG and PG examiner. He is also working as a director at Students Welfare for Kahir since two thousand thirteen. Sir is a member of International Association of Pathologists Indian Division. Indian Association of Pathologists and Microbiologists and Derm Pat Society of India he has published numerous articles in international national and regional journals he has also been a resource person at various national state and local cmes and sir is also associated with many national level health projects and international health projects i we welcome you sir i now hand over the session to dr ranjit kangle sir Ranjit sir, Ranjit sir. Hello, am I audible? Yes sir. Sir, you make your video on. Okay sir, thank you. Yeah, I have started. Hello. Yes. Sir. Hello. Ah uh, yes sir, yes, continue. Sir. Yes continue. sir. You are audible, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. A very good afternoon to to all the members, the organizers, and the speaker for this talk, Dr. Munita Bal. it's my it's my honor to introduce dr munita bal who is a professor in department of pathology tata memorial hospital mumbai she is graduated from government medical college and hospital chandigarh and has done post graduation from pgi chandigarh she is also done a dnb of in pathology and her specialties are head and neck pathology and j pathology oh. she is a contributor to who classification of tumors fifth edition of head and neck tumors she is prepared the final dm oncology curriculum which is approved by the medical council of india the first of its kind in the country and has prepared for surgical pathology fellowship curriculum she is in charge of surgical pathology fellowship and oncopathology trainees from 2013 to 2017 she has held international positions like oncopathology co-chair eurasia federation of oncology eurasia and she is a adjunct a visiting faculty for md in pathology at pg teaching in department of pathology kasturba medical college manipal and she has been recipient of many national and internationally acclaimed awards and titles Thank you very much, Dr. Ranjit. Yeah. Uh, with this small uh, introduction, I, I kindly request Dr. Munita Wal to start with the talk on head and neck biopsies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranjit, and uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Bhosle, for inviting me. I, without taking much time, I would uh, begin with my talk. Uh, it is on biopsy interpretation in head and neck pathology. and i'll mainly be focusing on the common day diagnostic pitfalls and at the outset i would like to say that this is not a didactic lecture and 
I won't be going through each and every entity, but I would be that would be like covering the whole world in the uh, in eighty days. Uh, what I would be mainly focusing on is the diagnostic pitfalls, the common uh, potholes that we encounter in our daily practice, and I would like to basically uh, focus on. Uh, routine uh, perhaps interpretation and maybe touch upon the uh, the newer entities towards the end. Uh, so we all know that squamous cell carcinoma is one of the commonest histology in the hair and neck uh, biopsies. And uh, if you can allow me to, yes. So uh, the commonest histology in, is the squamous cell carcinoma. And it is so common uh, in head and neck that uh, many of my clinical colleagues come to me and then they say that uh, you don't even have to see the slides, you just have to write squamous cell carcinoma. So, it, so that is the general impression that my clinicians have. And even the non-speciality uh, uh, pathologists many times feel that uh, even though the workload is more, but you just have to make a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. And so the general impression is that it's a cakewalk. Uh, head and neck pathology is e easy. And we do know that squamous cell carcinoma can have many faces. Uh, so so th these are some of the photographs which show that there are, uh, uh, this is how squamous cell carcinoma can look like. So is that correct? Well, of all these photographs, only one of them is a squamous cell carcinoma and the others are non-squamous uh, histologies. So uh, one of the common tumors uh, when we are encountering a biopsy uh, that can mimic squamous carcinoma is uh, are these minor salivary gland tumors uh, because many of the salivary gland tumors tend to show a squamous differentiation and keratinization. So when we are looking at a parotid resection or a submandibular gland resection, we are very well aware that it could be a weakened encounter salivary gland tumor. But but the scenario is quite different when we are uh, dealing with small biopsies from uh, minor salivary gland locations or minor from oral biopsies, laryngeal biopsies. Sino nasal biopsies, and that is when we uh, uh, when we can mistake these for uh, squamous carcinomas because we are not anticipating them or we are not, we are expecting we are not expecting them. So one of some of the clues that can let us know that it may be something different, not a regular squamous carcinoma, is when we see a tumor which is submucosal predominantly, composed of very uniform cells, uh, and has a lot of stroma which is hyalinized, uh, very pale eosinophilic uh, stroma or a myxoid stroma. So when you encounter a tumor like that, that may suggest that it is something which is different uh, from a regular squamous carcinoma. We need to be aware that pleomorphic adenomas is one of the common tumors that can undergo a lot of keratinization and squamous differentiation, and that can be a misleading feature if we do not pay attention to the to the blandness of the or the metaplastic quality of the squamous epithelium. And also, you can see that the uh, small buds and short uh, nests up arising from these can be missed and these should be paid attention should be paid to the cytologic atypia and then once we see that there is abundant keratinization uh, we should see uh, start looking for some tubules and we very often with if it's a pleomorphic adenoma we find somewhere uh, tubules which are bilayered lined by with ductal and myopithelial cells uh, sometimes it may be hard, the tubules may not be apparent and we may have to look for them and they may be collapsed. And this, in these situations, uh, immunohistochemistry for myopithelial markers can highlight the dual nature of these tubules. Uh, so, so immunohistochemistry can help in uh, distinguishing some of the cases uh, of salivary gland tumors from squamous cell carcinoma. So it's extremely important on one hand, you have uh, squamous carcinoma, which is a malignancy, and the other on the other hand, you have a benign salivary gland tumor, which can show extensive squamous differentiation and keratinization and can look like a squamous carcinoma. So uh, paying attention to these ductular features and awareness that a lot of keratinization can occur in pleomorphic adenomas uh, it can help us. Similarly, pleomorphic adenomas can undergo malignant transformation and then they can undergo uh, and, and harbor areas which are squamous, uh, showing squamous differentiation. And in such cases, uh, a diagnosis of carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma can be mistaken for a squamous cell carcinoma. So uh, apart from that, 
Uh, this is another case of a palate tumor, which is again looking very squamous uh, tumor, which is showing uh, nests of uh, squamous island. And in other areas, it shows these sheets of uh, uh, pale pink eosinophilic squamous uh, squamoid uh, epithelium. And in certain areas, it is showing these vacuolated cells or clear cells. Now, squamous uh, carcinoma as such can also show a lot of squam uh, clear cell change because of glycogen in the cells, but it can also, it's whenever we see this, and we, uh, we notice that the epithelium is very, uh, uh, the cytologic ATPI is not marked, we should uh, do uh, special stains for myosin and see that these are not uh, goblet cells or mucocytes in a mucopidermoid carcinoma. So mucopidermoid carcinoma is one uh, salivary gland malignancy which can, in an oral cavity can be mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma because of its uh, squamoid uh, cells. And in a high, even the high grade mucopidermoid can, where there is a, a lack of, uh, or there can be really, uh, it can be devoid of goblet cells. We, we need to look for those goblet cells and do mucin stain, and we may find isolated goblet cells which are positive for mucin stain. But please note that here, the compared to squamous cell carcinoma, the cytologic DPI, even in the high grade, is not so marked in mucopidermoid carcinomas, and that can be. Uh, a clue to the diagnosis. In difficult cases, uh, fish uh, can be done for confirmation of mammal 2 translocations, which are seen in about 80% of mucopidermoid carcinomas. So mucopidermoid carcinoma is one of the salivary gland cancers which is associated with mammal 2 translocations. You, most of the cases do not require uh, 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 molecular testing, but in a rare case where there is a difficulty, uh, molecular testing can be done. So this is another case of a base of tongue tumor, which is uh, relatively circumscribed, but at the edges, we can see that it is infiltrating. And this uh, tumor again looks very squamous carcinoma-like, and it has this squamous epithelial difference, squamous uh, appearance with a lot of desmoplasia. Uh, in other areas, it is showing these squamous uh, cells are actually uh, if you look at the cells, they are quite bland and quite uh, cytologic ATPI is minimal and the stroma is hyaluronized. And in other areas, you find that the stroma is uh, desmoplastic between these tumor nests. Again, islands of these squamous appearing cells with desmoplastic stroma in between and hyaluronized stroma in between the tumor cells. So this is a hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma, which is uh, notoriously, uh, it can mimic squamous carcinoma, but the important point to remember is that the tumor cells are quite bland in appearance. So these are also positive for P40 or P63, which is a marker which is seen diffusely in squamous cell carcinoma. So immunohistochemistry will, will not help. It is the morphology and the features of bland cytology, which are present in hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma. And there are two types of stroma which are seen in hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma. Uh, hyaluronizing type of stroma in, within, the, within the tumor islands and desmoplastic stroma outside the tumor islands. So uh, if in a rare case we do not, we are not able to uh, make a distinction, uh, EWS R1 rearrangements on fish can be done because these tumors, hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma is, which it shows EWS R1 rearrangements. So we have seen that mucopidermoid carcinoma, hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma, as well as pleomorphic adenoma can look like squamous carcinomas. Then in certain situations, the purely differentiated squamous carcinoma can be mistaken uh, when we, we don't pay attention to the high, we, uh, if we see tumor islands, which look very uh, squamoid, but then they also show comedonecrosis. So if you see large uh, globules showing comedonecrosis, uh, we should see that whether the tumor is showing some glandular um, um, pattern somewhere because it could be a salivary duct carcinoma. So salivary duct carcinomas are tumors which look like breast uh, carcinoma NOS, and they can show um, high-grade uh, morphology, and they can look like a poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma and in situations where we don't appreciate glandular morphology, we can end up calling these as squamous cell carcinomas. 
So these tumors are negative for the squamous markers B40 and B63. And if you find a poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma, where you suspect that it could be something like a salivary duct carcinoma from arising from a minor salivary gland, then P immunohistochemistry confirmation with P40 and P63 should be done. And if it is negative, then it is then markers for salivary gland, uh, salivary duct carcinoma, CK7 and androgen receptor should be done. So these are some of the cases which show that uh, in a small biopsy, a salivary gland uh, tumor can be uh, missed and it can be mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. And the clues that help us are the submucosal growth, the uniform appearance of cells. And if we look carefully, we can find some tubules and ducts and uh, uh, mucin goblet cells uh, using mucin stains. And typically the stroma tends to be hyalinized and mixoid and a variety of patterns. Uh, uh, are usually seen in salivary gland tumors. It's important to distinguish because salivary gland tumors are biologically and uh, prognostically different from the squamous cell carcinomas. Their, their outcomes are different and the extent of surgery is also different. So even in if it is a mucopidermoid carcinoma, the neck dissection may not be required or, or limited neck dissection may be required. Uh, similarly, if it is a salivary duct carcinoma and if it is androgen, uh, if it is unresectable, then androgen treatment is required. Uh, that that may, may be beneficial to the patient or in some cases, HER2 treatment may be uh, beneficial. Uh, for instance, we saw the case of base of tongue carcinoma. If it was a squamous cell carcinoma, then the primary treatment would have been chemoradiation or radiation. Whereas if it is a salivary gland tumor, then surgery is required and uh, chemoradiation is not effective. So treatment and management can be totally different if the diagnosis is, uh, uh, is missed. So uh, going on to another uh, set of cases where we have a 28-year-old 20 year with a gingivobuckle uh, sulcus uh, growth, which was destroying the mandible. We see a very uh, proliferative uh, squamous proliferation, which is quite ugly looking and that mixed with a lot of inflammatory infiltrate. The, tumor cell, the epithelial cells are showing marked atypia. And there are these uh, uh, cells which are showing uh, nuclear atypia. And these are admixed with dense inflammation. And then we also see uh, in certain areas that the squamous proliferation is showing a lot of intraepithelial edema and the cells are quite uh, um, uh, showing a lot of intraepithelial edema. And this was one of the biopsy which was diagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, so, and when a hemimandibulectomy was done, these islands uh, we saw that there were tumor islets which were showing peripheral palisading and stellate reticulum. And uh, then we went back to the biopsy and this was the only focus which was showing a clue of a stellate reticulum uh, in the epithelial islands. So amyloblastomas are one uh, uh, are also tumors which can be mistaken on a small biopsy. Um, and uh, this is another case where you, if you, we see that the biopsy is very squamous looking and it's in a very acanthomatous uh, amyloblastoma. You can see uh, squamous proliferation with uh, stellate reticulum. But if we do not pay attention to this uh, stellate reticulum and the peripheral prominence and peripheral palisading, uh, then we can mistake it for squamous cell carcinoma. So uh, it's important to look at the reverse polarization and to have a high index of suspicion and see in cases where you have predominantly a uh, blank looking uh, epithelium, look at the anstellate reticulum like appearance in the, in the epithelium, we look at the reverse polarization, uh, peripheral palisading. So here the, you see reverse polarization by which we mean that the tumor nuclei are away from the basement membrane. So amyloblastomas also can be mistaken in a small biopsy uh, for squamous cell carcinoma and can lead to a bigger resection, uh, a larger or more morbid resection and neck dissection. So uh, it's important to take care of that. And also amyloblastic carcinomas, which can show a lot of squamous differentiation and squamous appearance, uh, they can be mistaken for squamous carcinoma. So this is a case of uh, amyloblastic carcinoma where uh, it is like any other infiltrative epithelial malignancy with squamous differentiation, but in certain areas, if you look carefully, it, they show reverse polarization where the nuclei are away from the basement membrane and uh, reflecting amyloblastic differentiation. So 
uh, very it is possible to diagnose diagnose amyloblastic carcinoma as squamous carcinomas. So careful attention to uh, these features can help us uh, in proper diagnosis. So in an alveolar biopsies, uh, we should be aware that amyloblastoma can be mistaken. So if we find telecerating or any uh, squamous epithelium showing a reticulate appearance, we should look for reverse polarization. Uh, check with the radiologist or the clinician to tell you the radiology findings if it is an expansive bony lesion. And we also should need to be aware that it can the overlying epithelium can show a marked pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia and can be mistaken for. Uh, uh, squamous carcinoma. So this is another case, which was a, a patient who present young male who presented with a posterior triangle neck node. It came as a neck node and with an outside diagnosis of metastatic squamous carcinoma, we could see that uh, these are these lobules of squamous uh, basaloid appearing cells with, within the uh, connective tissue, no nodal tissue was identified, and they were showing peripheral palisading and cribriform architecture. And in other areas, they were showing these uh, basaloid uh, lobules and these bud like uh, uh, squamous buds and very prominent peripheral palisading and some clear cells. At some focus, uh, central vacuoles and central multiceptated uh, uh, vacuoles resembling uh, hair shafts were also identified. So, this was a case of uh, a cutaneous trichoepithelioma, uh, which was mistaken. Uh, for metastatic squamous carcinoma, mainly because it was it was presented as a neck nodule. So this was a cutaneous benign tumor, which uh, which with a squamous appearance, and because the clinical information provided is, is is a neck node, and it can be very easily mistaken for uh, for a metastatic squamous carcinoma based on the basaloid cells. So the clues were the palisading and the follicular pattern, but the relatively bland cytology was. Uh, was it important. So cutaneous adrenoxal tumors, uh, benign and malignant, can be mistaken for squamous cell carcinomas. It's important to get the clinical history. Another tumor, which is the uh, adnexal tumor, which can look very, uh, which can resemble squamous cell carcinoma, is a tumor which can show a lot of abrupt uh, uh, keratinization in the form of, uh, which reflects triclamal differentiation. It, this, this is a triclamal type of keratinization. So there is no granular layer and there is abrupt uh, keratinization. And this is a proliferating triclamal cyst, which is which can be mistaken for squamous carcinoma on histology. And if you are not aware uh, that it can show a lot of atypia, uh, we can mistake this for squamous carcinoma. So important uh, features are that it is a cutaneous tumor. It has cutaneous localization. The keratinization is uh, abrupt and uh, triclamal type. And overall, it's a circumscribed uh, uh, lesion. It can show uh, mitosis uh, in, because it's a proliferating lesion, but uh, awareness of this is very important to, to, to avoid mistaking it for a malignant squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, another uh, area where we can have uh, uh, misdiagnosis as squamous cell carcinoma is uh, in the eyelids or in uh, tumors presenting as orbital swellings where we can see uh, now, this is a tumor which is a basaloid in uh, our architecture and shows these clear cells. And if we do not pay attention, then we can call this as a basaloid squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, where this is actually a squamous cell carcinoma, uh, sorry, sebaceous carcinoma. And the, the sebaceous uh, cells or the sebocytes can be very, very focal and very subtle. And it is the uh, location, it is the ocular location or the eyelid location, which can be a very good clue. So sebaceous carcinomas uh, typically or a very classical location is the eyelids. Uh, they can, uh, uh, they have basically a basaloid tumors and uh, we have to look for sebaceous differentiation. They can be extraocular as well. And uh, immunohistochemistry can help us in difficult cases to distinguish from uh, squamous cell carcinomas, where, whereas while they share P40, P63 positivity with squamous carcinoma, they can be, they are androgen receptor positive, and in about 75% cases, they are HER2 positive as well. So th that may have treatment implications in unresectable cases.
So apart from adnexal tumors, uh, cutaneous tumors, and salivary gland tumors, uh, we can see that there are other tumors. Uh, this is a case of 29-year-old woman with alveolar swelling. She presented with uh, this very uh, necrotic mass with epithelioid cells. It was uh, almost on the verge of getting diagnosed as a squamous cell carcinoma. And then we noted that the, uh, the tumor cells were, uh, there were a lot, and there were cells which were hyperchromatic polygonal, just like squamous cells, but there was a too much of necrosis. And um, this uh, slide shows cells which are looking very keratinized, uh, but then there were tumor giant cells and the patient was quite young and we uh, thought of doing H uh, human placental lactation and CARTA-3 and who and behold, it was a metastatic choriocarcinoma. So this is mainly to show that uh, many of the metastatic tumors can present in the jaws or in the craniofacial skeleton. So tumors with bone metastasis can present as primary tumors in the in the head and neck region. Uh, so it's important to be aware that if something looks unusual and out of place, then metastatic carcinoma should also be thought of. Uh, just yesterday, we had a case where uh, a palatal mass was seen as a, as a, there was an unusual tumor, oncocytic tumor in the palate, which was looking like a, a salivary gland tumor. And we asked them whether it is a uh, is there any, is this a bone lesion or a mucosal lesion? And then they did a PET scan and found out there was a liver mass in that. So uh, a liver mass, which was metastatic to the bone uh, of the maxilla and it presented as a palatal mass. So uh, in the head and neck region, metastatic carcinomas can really complicate uh, the picture and we can be totally misled. And uh, if, the, um, if the findings are unusual, we should also suspect and see whether the patient also has a is this a part of metastatic uh, disease? So tumors that can be mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma on a biopsy are minor salivary gland neoplasms, amyloblastomas, uh, cutaneous adnexal tumors, sebaceous carcinomas, and a variety of metastatic uh, carcinomas. So uh, then there are other tumors. Uh, let's see whether they are, uh, what are these lesions of this collage shows uh, a lot of squamous lesions. Uh, let's see. So this is an obvious uh, squamous carcinoma, right? or may not be. So we see a lot of uh, uh, islands and globules and uh, nests of uh, squamous cells with uh, abnormal keratinization. And what we do see if we look at the low part is that we tend all these nests and lobules, uh, these are present in a lobular fashion. And we see that these are centered around the duct. So this ductulo lobular architecture is a very striking feature. And although the lesion looks very squamous and very, uh, very much like a squamous carcinoma, it looks infiltrative. But if we look at the low bar, it is the architecture which is very striking. It is centered on a duct and it has a lobular architecture. And this is the, something that saves us from falling into a pitfall. And then we find that these are like buds and branches of ducts which are filled with this. Uh, squamous metaplastic cells. So we can identify ductal lumens here. Here we can identify ducts which are plugged with this squamous proliferation and giving this appearance of a very uh, infiltrative tumor. So this is silometaplasia. This is a, a condition which can be mistaken for squamous uh, carcinoma. It is the architecture. It is the ductulocentric architecture, the lobular architecture at low part, which helps us uh, uh, to avoid this pitfall. So it is and if you look at the squamous, the squamous character, it is a very blind looking, it is a very blind looking squamous uh, epithelium. Okay, so and the uh, history of uh, injury or radiation injury is, or uh, post radiation uh, silometaplasia can be seen. And in a small biopsy, it can be mistaken for squamous carcinoma. So another common biopsy, we see these uh, 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 fronds of uh, uh, squamous epithelium. These are thick. Uh, papillary structures, we see finger-like fronds and we see this fibrovascular cores. And if you look at the epithelium, we find that there is a normal maturation and there is hardly any dysplasia. And uh, uh, these are basically thick papillary fronds uh, with fibrovascular cores and we find that there is no, although there is a lot of exophytic proliferation, there is no uh, endophytic component. and. Um, in inflammation, this epithelium can look uh, atypical. So this is one of the conditions. Uh, again, then here we see papillary fronts with fibrovascular cores, and within the fibrovascular cores, there are uh, capillaries. 
So this is a squamous papilloma and it needs to be, it can be difficult diagnosis and differentiation from exophytic or papillary squamous cell carcinoma is important. And, uh, if it, it's important to remember that it has papillary fronts with fibrovascular pores, but there is no endophytic component and stromal invasion is absent. So going to the another case of a 32 year old male with nasal mass and nasal bleeding, uh, we got this biopsy, which was uh, we showed a very complex proliferation of squamous epithelium and again, heavy uh, inflammatory infiltrate and necrotic debris. And this was diagnosed as a squamous cell carcinoma on the initial biopsy. And in the subsequently, we got a biopsy uh, of the same patient uh, from the nose, which showed a lot of fibrin exudate. And within that, if, uh, there, were a, there was an infiltrate of atypical cells, and they, these atypical cells appeared to be lymphoid. And the immunohistochemistry showed these were positive for CD3 T cell marker and C4 T cell marker. And, and this was actually an extranodal non-Hodgkin lymphoma, angiocentric T cell lymphoma. And then we went back to the uh, epithelium and we saw that there, the overlying epithelium was markedly uh, complex. It was showing a lot of uh, abnormal proliferation, atypical proliferation. But, but this uh, complex atypical proliferation, the cytologic atypia was not, there was no dysplasia or dyskeratosis. It was just very abnormal looking. So this was a, uh, a case of lymphoma with a marked pseudo epitheliometer hyperplasia, which was mistaken for squamous carcinoma. So another case uh, which we saw previously was that of an ameloblastoma, which showed a very uh, ghastly looking pseudo epitheliometer uh, hyperplasia. And uh, this is another case where we have a healing ulcer. And in the adjoining area, you can see that the epithelium can look really uh, uh, very uh, carcinomatous, but it is uh, actually a healing and a growing, regenerating epithelium. So uh, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia in a small biopsy can really look very, very uh, abnormal. It is basically a reactive kind of an epithelium and it takes your attention away from the actual lesion and you have to look under the surface and as a rule, see that uh, the whole biopsy and see that beneath the surface, uh, is there any lesion which is causing this kind of a pseudoepitheliomatous reaction. Another case which is showing a lot of so the whole uh, attention is taken by this uh, pseudoepitheliometrous hyperplasia and we realize this in this clean looking biopsy we do see some cells which are totally uh, hidden and these are because the whole attention is taken away by the pseudoepitheliometrous hyperplasia on the surface and these are cells with granular cytoplasm and these are highlighted with S100 diffusely and then we see that there is the actually the biopsy has which looks very clean is actually full of these uh, granular cells. So this is a granular cell tumor and here it is quite hidden within infiltrating but hidden within these uh, skeletal muscle bundles and here we can see this granular cell tumor. So it, but <clears throat> But the most obvious lesion on in on a low part is the pseudoepitheliometrous hyperplasia. So granular cell tumor is again one tumor which can be totally missed and uh, can be mistaken for a squamous cell carcinoma because of the prominent pseudoepithelial hyperplasia. So there are so we saw some tumors, non-squamous malignancies, which can, or squamous tumors which can be mistaken for squamous carcinomas. Now we saw some benign pathologic entities which can be mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma, namely the silometaplasia, pseudoepithelial epithelial hyperplasia and squamous papilloma. Uh, other uh, area of uh, difficulty is uh, distinguishing varicose carcinoma and varicose hyperplasia. Now, varicose hyperplasia is basically, these are lesions with a broad pushing bulldozing type of uh, growth pattern. And varicose hyperplasia is basically, we say when the, uh, there is no endophytic component and the proliferation is mainly above the baseline uh, of the adjacent, uh, taking from the adjacent basement membrane. Uh, where while it is oh, easy to make this on, on a resection specimen, it is difficult on the uh, on the biopsies. And many times, and many times the biopsies from a varicose carcinoma do not have any subepithelium because it is a uh, it's an infiltrative lesion which has a pushing type of uh, invasion, and you don't get much of the subepithelium or adjacent epithelium to uh, to to identify whether it is endophytic or not. So. Uh, it's easy to, it's me, it's still not easy, but it is a diagnosis that we tend to make on a resection specimen rather than the biopsies. And our clinicians are now aware that it's a diagnosis that may be difficult on a biopsy, and multiple biopsies make it to a misdiagnosis only. 
The other entity which can lead to a lot of misdiagnosis on a biopsy is a, is a, a entity which has this pattern of a rabbit burrowing type of a pat growth pattern, a pattern where we see here, we see these, rub, uh, these rabbit burrows which go deep inside and uh, on the surface there is hardly anything. So we have a tumor which is called as a carcinoma cuniculatum, which is a variant of squamous cell carcinoma. It has a deep burrowing type of a growth pattern which resembles the rabbit uh, burrows and is called as a carcinoma cuniculatum. So it, the no, surface may be normal, whereas the deep, the underlying uh, architecture is uh, underlying tumor shows a growth pattern, which is formed with these tunnels or burrows or branching cribs filled with keratin. And uh, you can have deep uh, uh, tunnels of these or uh, crypts or branching crypts of these squamous epithelia filled with keratin plugs. And uh, the important thing is that the, uh, the epithelium is ha has shows hardly any dysplasia and it is a very well differentiated epithelium and in a biopsy this uh, leads, this is usually missed and if you can see that the epithelium is so minimally atypical that it can it leads to multiple negative biopsies. So it is one of the reasons of uh, uh, a missed or a negative uh, diagnosis on biopsies. So going on to another case of 45 year old female with lower alveolus biopsy, where we see a tumor which is very uh, spindly and it is, appears very vasoformative with lots of uh, vascular spaces. Again, this is this came as a diagnosis of angiosarcoma because the tumor cells were still for appearing to be forming these vascular spaces. But when we did the immunohistochemistry, vascular markers were negative and uh, it was diffusely positive for squamous marker P40. So we have to keep in mind that sometimes squamous carcinoma can look like some other tumor, or it can look non-squamous. And this is a pseudo-vascular adenoid variant of squamous cell carcinoma, which because of its lot of etantholysis leads to a lot of these pseudo-vascular spaces. So awareness of this is also important. So coming on to the, so these were a set of conditions where the tumor is looking either obviously squamous or squamous carcinoma is looking like something else. Now we go on to the poorly differentiated uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So most of the times when our uh, resident who is posted in head and neck comes, by default for all poorly differentiated malignancies, because he's posted in, some, in head and neck, he labels everything, he or she labels, tend to label everything as poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma. And then uh, I have to tell them to look for differentiation. And when we don't find differentiation, and that is uh, the time we have to uh, work them out. So, so these are different cases which are all uh, likely to be labeled as poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma because mainly because of the site, mainly because it has come from either a larynx or from an oral cavity or a sinonasal location, and they are poorly differentiated. So uh, whenever it is poorly differentiated, we have any tumor before calling something as poorly differentiated uh, squamous carcinoma or any poorly differentiated carcinoma, we need to look at the differentiation and search for it. And many of the times we will find some differentiation or not, but in a biopsy, it may be possible that there is no differentiation. And so just because of the site, we should not label it. We should uh, we should look for differentiation. And if differentiation is not found on morphology, then we should resort to uh, immunohistochemistry. So this is a case of uh, alveolar tumor where there is an, a very epithelial tumor, which is looking uh, uh, cords and nests of cells. And here we find that tumor cells are very polygonal and uh, high, dark hyperchromatic nuclei, in some places it is spindle, and there is some multinucleation also found. So uh, it, this is a tumor where there is no proper squamous differentiation identified. It looks very squamous, and uh, but it is if we don't find any proper unequivocal squamous differentiation, it's better to go for immunohistochemistry, at least a basic cytoperitin. Uh, it is this case was negative for cytokeratins and it was negative for uh, P40, uh, which is a squamous marker. And then we did melanoma markers, and it is strongly and diffusely positive for melanoma markers, HMB45, S100, and melan A. So, melanoma is one tumor which can look uh, very squamous, it can look epithelial, it can look spindle, it's sarcomatous, so it can have any morphology. And in oral cavity, it can be mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. So multinucleation and uh, pejotoid spread and prominent nucleoli are some of the features. So another case of uh, 
34 year old uh, alveolar biopsy was sent to us and this is a very poorly differentiated malignant tumor uh, with atypical mitosis very uh, very anaplastic looking and again cytokeratin a1 a3 was negative and this alerts us to that this may not be a carcinoma then we go on to do a lymphoma marker lc and it is diffusely positive and cd3 t cell marker was positive and cd30 was diffusely positive so this is an alcl or anaplastic large cell lymphoma which can mimic an epithelial malignancy or a carcinoma Another case of 46 year old lady with a nasal polyp and we see again a poorly differentiated malignant tumor with uh, some tumor giant cells, very abnormal looking cells and there is a tendency to label this as a carcinoma but if you see there is a lot of um, admixture with inflammatory infiltrate as well as some very very anaplastic looking cells. Again, multinucleation, so which is not a feature of squamous cell carcinoma. And again, this case was EMA positive, which can be, which is an epithelial marker also. So it can be mistaken if you only do EMA, this can be mistaken for a carcinoma. So LCA was also done and CD30 was also positive. So these, these EMA, LCA and CD30 are markers for anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So uh, another thing we need to keep in mind, especially if the patient has retroviral disease, is a plasma plastic lymphoma. These are the patients and many times they tend to have mucosal lymphomas or uh, mucosal plasma plastic lymphomas. So this is, it can look very uh, carcinomatous and epithelial and these are positive for LCA as well as for MUM1 and CD138. So another case of tongue tumor with 69 year old female with poorly differentiated malignant tumor, it is positive for neuroendocrine markers. So neuroendocrine carcinoma can also be positive for and uh, can be mistaken for a basaloid squamous carcinoma because of their poor appearance. So if, if the tumor cells can look very small cell like, then we should go in for neuroendocrine markers. So similarly, tumor cells can look neuroendocrine as well as have large uh, cells. And these, uh, if we should do neuroendocrine markers, if we suspect that this is uh, uh, looking like an abnormal or a very poorly differentiated malignant tumor, and this, this is a case where the uh, chromogranin was positive, and this is a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So these are rare instances where, uh, where, where which are of poorly differentiated malignant tumor, where uh, we should think of these differential diagnoses. Again, this we have already discussed that metastatic carcinomas can also look like poorly differentiated squamous carcinomas. So another case of uh, laryngeal biopsy, where then we have a submucosal tumor, which is very poorly differentiated, we cannot see any differentiation. And then we do see some large, uh, almost anaplastic looking cells with smudgy nuclei at tail eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm. And we do epithelial markers and then we find that they are negative. P40 squamous marker is negative. We did melanoma marker S100 negative, LCA, which was negative and only the lymphocytes were showing positivity. And then we noticed that a lot of lymphocytes are seen sprinkled in the whole tumor. And then we did found, found out that the tumor cells are not anaplastic, but rather smudgy nuclei and lymphocytes are sprinkled all throughout the tumor. And the tumor cells are arranged in a syncytial sheet. So we did uh, follicular dendritic cell marker, which is CD23 and CD21 and found that this is a a very epithelial looking follicular dendritic cell sarcoma. So one of the clues for follicular dendritic cell sarcomas is the sprinkling of lymphocytes throughout the tumor. And one of the pitfalls of this tumor is that it can have a very syncytial appearance, which can make it look very epithelial. And also there can be a lot of giant cells or smudgy cells, which can also in a small battery look like an anaplastic carcinoma. So a typical uh, follicular dendritic cell is usually spindle, but in head and neck, we tend to see a lot of epithelioid uh, morphology also. So this is one of the uh, sections which show again, very pink eosinophilic, but if you notice that there is a lot of uh, lymphocytic sprinkling and uh, giant cells with spongy nuclei. A tonsillar follicular dendritic cell sarcoma with uh, uh, which can look like a poorly differentiated carcinoma. And uh, we see that tumor cells are in syncytial sheets, but the important uh, clue is the sprinkling of lymphocytes. So these uh, can have giant cells and smudgy nuclei, and this can look like an anaplastic carcinoma in a biopsy. So whenever we see very smudgy nuclei, lymphocytic infiltrate, 
and uh, this we should also and we are not getting anywhere close to any diagnosis all markers epithelial markers uh, melanoma markers lymphoma markers are negative we should also keep this diagnosis in mind um, so we see a lot of uh, differentials uh, when we are uh, dealing with the poorly differentiated malignant tumor and we should also keep in mind uh, taking uh, care of all the recent entities which have been uh, uh, which have been recognized in head and neck now this was a 29 year old lady with a very rapidly enlarging mass in the heart palate a very basaloid appearing tumor if you see the tumor cells are very blue basaloid and epithelial looking but they are very uniform in appearance one cell looking just like the other and this was almost like a then there was a focus of of uh, keratinization and this is a tumor that we we and everybody will call it squamous cell carcinoma because we've seen differentiation and then we see that this tumor is also cytokeratin positive which is also positive for p40 uh, which is a squamous marker and this is uh, justified to call it a squamous carcinoma right but what we do see if we look at the morphology the the rest of the cells apart from the there is abrupt keratinization and there is a a very undifferentiated appearance and a round cell appearance of the remaining uh, uh, cells. So this undifferentiated round cell morphology or undifferentiated uh, appearance, uh, uniform cells and abrupt keratinization uh, is, a, is, is uh, quite a distinctive feature of nut carcinoma. So this is nut uh, carcinoma, immunohistochemistry is positivity for nut, which is a nuclear marker. And this is uh, an entity which has been described in head and in mostly it was described in the midline, but now it, cases are also identified uh, outside of the midline. And head and neck and thoracic uh, mediastinum is one of the, these are the common sites. Uh, and the typical appearance is undifferentiated round cell appearance with abrupt uh, keratinization. So uh, now it is not called as nut midline carcinoma, but it's only called nut carcinoma. It's a very aggressive tumor. Uh, Sinonasal and mediastinum are the common sites, and it is associated with it is associated with a very poor survival. It can show undifferentiated appearance, it can show round cell morphology, it can show abrupt squamous keratinization, and which is a, a pitfall. And uh, sometimes you can see extensive uh, keratinization, but the rest of the cells either show up undifferentiated monomorphic appearance or, or a round cell morphology. This is one of the cases which we saw in a parotid of nut carcinoma. So we are seeing it uh, outside of midline also. And you can see that the, the tumor cells are either very basaloid round, and then there is abrupt squamous differentiation. So, so these have been called previously with different diagnosis, but it's important to suspect when you see these two features. And uh, even if we don't have, if you don't have the IC, it should be suspected. It can be suspected on morphology, and it can be sent to a center where IC is available. Uh, clinically, these patients progress very fast, so that can also be a clue. So another case where there is a nasal mass, uh, again, a tumor which shows wall to wall, same type of appearance. There is no gland formation, no squamous differentiation. Uh, cells which are totally undifferentiated. Again, uh, epithelial appearing, but very undifferentiated appearing. Cytokeratin is positive and P40 is positive, which is a squamous marcus. So should we call this a basaloid squamous carcinoma? We have been calling these as basaloid squamous carcinoma, but now we know that we have to look for uh, uh, these tumors more carefully. And now we find that this tumor is also harboring very uh, raptoid morphology at certain places. Uh, tumor cells with, which are too undifferentiated and showing focally rhabdoid morphology with eccentric nuclei and prominent nuclei. So tumors with rhabdoid morphology, now we uh, tend to do INI1 or SMART P1. And they, here we see that the tumor cells are showing loss of INI1, whereas the internal control in the blood vessels is showing positive positivity. So this is a SMART B1 or INI1 deficient sinonasal carcinoma, which is a newly recognized entity. And it is a distinct entity, which was earlier either called as undifferentiated carcinoma or uh, basaloid squamous carcinoma, mainly because of its undifferentiated appearance. It is an aggressive tumor, and this is a part of SWE-SNF uh, family of proteins, uh, which has uh, SMART A4 and SMART A2 also as partners. And loss of this or the deletions in this leads to smart uh, B1 deficient carcinomas. 
So there are many tumors now which are INI1 deficient or SMARP1 deficient. The list is long, like the malignant trapdoid tumors, the atypical teratoid tumors, epithelioid sarcoma, renal medullary carcinoma, myopithelial carcinomas, epithelioid malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, extraskeletal myxoids and chondrosarcoma. And now SMARP1 deficient sinonasal carcinoma is also added to this list. It's an aggressive tumor with a high mortality. So these are some of the other pictures. You can see that we can call this as a basaloid squamous carcinoma. If you don't do INI1 IHC, then it can show a very nice raptoid uh, uh, morphology, very raptoid. So if you see a typically differentiated or undifferentiated with raptoid uh, morphology, it is a small B1 deficient tumor. It can show pagetoid spread. Uh, also a glandular morphology can be seen and undifferentiated morphology and sometimes clear cell morphology also is seen. So this is how the internal control is positive. However, the uh, tumor cells are negative. That is how the diagnosis is made. So uh, uh, another entity which is now recently recognized is the smart a 4 deficient uh, tumors. This smart a 4 is also known as the BRG1. And uh, these can be, again, similar set of uh, morphology, undifferentiated carcinomas, but showing uh, loss of smart a 4 So we can see that undifferentiated carcinomas, especially in the sinonasal tract, which were called as SNUCs, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas, now they are slowly, slowly being, uh, because of molecular advances and knowing that underlying genetic defect, we are able to make these diagnoses routinely now using morphologic clues and immunohistochemistry, and we can identify them as either nut carcinomas or uh, smart p one deficient carcinomas or smart a 4 deficient sinonasal carcinomas. And similarly, another uh, which is identified is an IDH2 mutant uh, SNUCs, which is, uh, these are tumors which show IDH2 mutations and a large majority of the tumors which were earlier called as SNUCs, uh, about half of them are turned out to be IDH2 mutant uh, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas and immunohistochemistry for that is available uh, and that can help us identify it. So that is seen as a uh, positive cytoplasmic positivity. So, so we can see that the SNUC is slowly disappearing. And most of the tumors, if we work up, uh, these were either earlier called as undifferentiated carcinomas. Some of them also ended up being called as round cells or tumors, or they were also called as uh, squamous carcinomas or basal or carcinomas are now, they, if properly worked up and identified, can be uh, categorized as that carcinoma, smart B1 deficient, smart A4 deficient, or IDH2 mutated SNUCs. So uh, I can skip this in the interest of time. Um, another uh, uh, tumor that I see is that uh, uh, this is a case of 32-year-old uh, nasal tumor, which is showing a, a very uh, uh, nested appearance. Again, round cell morphology, uniform appearance. And uh, it shows a nested globular pattern with basaloid cells, monotonous cells, and peripheral palisading. And in some cases, we can also see abrupt squamous differentiation. So this is cytokeratin positive, uh, positive for P40 diffusely and strongly. So is this a squamous carcinoma? No, we see if we see uh, squamous differentiation, we can do think of NUT. Uh, now this tumor is negative for NUT also and a whole lot of other immunohistochemistry is negative. And then we find that this is positive for MIG2, uh, membranous positivity similar to that which is seen in the Ewing sarcoma. So is, what, is this an Ewing sarcoma or is this, a, but it is also showing uh, carcinoma features. So a tumor and we do NKX 2.2, which is again a marker for Ewing sarcoma, that is also positive. So this is a tumor very, which is showing both features of carcinoma and uh, uh, Ewing sarcoma. Um, and on, on fish, it shows EWS R1 uh, break apart. So this is an entity that especially in head and neck, we need to be aware of. It's a rare tumor, but it is a tumor that can uh, really be a pitfall in the head and neck region. It is the adminthinoma like Ewing sarcoma. It is a variant of Ewing sarcoma, which can show epithelial differentiation and it can show squamous differentiation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it is a, uh, it, like Ewing sarcoma, it has EWS uh, fusions. 
And uh, important thing is that out, out of all the even sarcomas reported, about 75% of them are reported in head and neck. And because they tend to call, show squamous differentiation, they can be mistaken for squamous carcinoma. Uh, uh, in the, this is a case in the parotid. Again, you see these nests and nested appearance, round cell appearance, and abrupt squamous differentiation. So you, you can see that this looks very much like nut carcinoma images that I had shown. So nut carcinoma is also a very important difference, uh, differential diagnosis. But here, the tumor cells are very, very monomorphic and uh, uh, a round cell appearance and you see uh, abrupt squamous differentiation. Again, one very important uh, clue is that they tend to show this nested appearance. So this nested round cell morphology, nested appearance and abrupt squamous differentiation, uh, these are quite characteristic features of adamantinoma like even sarcoma. So squamous differentiation may or may not be present. Keratinization may be present. So uh, in a thyroid, uh, this can uh, look like a poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. But if you notice here, you see that there are round cells which are in a very nested uh, appearance. So again, monomorphic round cells like EV, but in a very follicular or nested appearance and showing very nice colonization of the follicles with uh, central colloid. So this colonization pattern is very typical of uh, even uh, adamantinoma like even sarcoma in the thyroid. So uh, one of the, another feature is peripheral palisading. It can show peripheral palisading. So this is one entity which can, uh, which is rare, but it can be mistaken for a carcinoma and it also can be mistaken for various round cell tumors. And in the parotids, it can be mistaken for salivary gland neoplasm, especially basal cell adenocarcinomas and solid adenoid cystic carcinomas and non carcinomas. So, uh, and in thyroid, it can be differentiated, mistaken for a poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma, medullary thyroid carcinoma, and a carcinoma with castle carcinoma with thyroid like element. So, it's important to differentiate it because it has to be treated like even sarcoma with chemotherapy protocols and not like a squamous carcinoma. So uh, when we see a poorly differentiated basaloid tumor in the head and neck region in a biopsy, uh, this is some basic panel that can be used if we don't find any differentiation or we are suspecting some, uh, or we have some differential diagnosis. So if cytokeratins and P40, P63 is positive, mostly it's a basaloid carcinoma, but we do have to rule out other tumors which can have squamous differentiation, so we can do NUT. And if NUT is positive, it's a NUT carcinoma. If INI1 loss is there, uh, then it's an INI1 deficient or SMART B1 deficient carcinoma. If BRG1 loss is there or SMART A4 loss is there, then it's a BRG1 deficient or SMART A4 deficient carcinomas. Uh, and if it's IDH1 or 2 antibody, this IDH2 mutation is present, uh, which can be picked up on immunohistochemistry, uh, then it is a IDH2 mutant carcinoma. Uh, this is an entity I skipped for the sake of time, but this is uh, an HPV-related multiphenotypic cyanonasal carcinoma, which can look like an adenoid cystic carcinoma. But we need to just be aware that it is positive for P16 diffusely and also shows ic like uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma. Then adamantinoma-like carcinoma, like carcinomas, has cytokeratin and P40, P63 positivity diffuse. And like healing sarcoma has uh, membranous CD99 or MIG2 and NKX2.2. Uh, of course, we should never forget melanomas. Uh, mucosal melanomas can look like carcinomas and we can do S100 positivity and melanoma specific markers like HMB45, Milan A, SOX10, and MITF. And uh, never uh, forget lymphomas. Uh, for that, we can, if LCA is positive, we do specific markers for uh, further characterization. And once, if we don't find any diagnosis, uh, we have a last diagnosis, and that is of follicular dendritic cell sarcoma. It's a diagnosis of exhaustion. When you can't think of anything, think of follicular dendritic cell sarcoma. And uh, our markers are CD23, 21, and GWT35. So we've covered some pitfalls in the, in the biopsy uh, diagnosis in head and neck. Uh, so we see that non-squamous tumors can show squamous differentiation. Uh, these are salivary gland tumors, amyloblastic tumors, atmic cell tumors, uh, tumors recently identified entities like nut carcinomas, adamantinoma-like even sarcomas. 
uh, multi-phenotypic HPV-related cyanonasocarcinoma and metastatic carcinoma. So they can show common differentiation. So we have to go beyond and think of other tumors also, which can be, uh, uh, which can be there. Then some benign squamous lesions which can be mistaken are silometaplasia and pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia and squamous papilloma. And some of the squamous malignancies which, can, which are difficult on biopsies are varicose carcinomas and carcinoma cuniculatum. And uh, for poorly differentiated malignant tumor, it is basically that we don't just have to go by the site and call every poorly differentiated uh, as poorly differentiated squamous. We should not assume that it is a squamous or carcinoma, should look for differentiation and alternate differential diagnosis should be ruled out by looking at morphologic clues and doing appropriate immunohistochemistry. So biopsy diagnosis, getting it right the first time is absolutely essential because once we make a diagnosis on the biopsy, uh, it, the management starts. And uh, if, if on a resection specimen, we may not sometimes focus on the diagnosis and we are mainly focusing on margins and and the other prognostic parameters and the T stage, DNM staging. So it's important to get the biopsy diagnosis right in the first time. Uh, so thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Yeah. Thank you, Madam, for your lively slide seminar and going through the various lesions in the head and neck. Uh, there are no questions. Okay, madam. Since there are no questions, I would like to thank you for giving this wonderful presentation and taking us to the spectrum of lesions which are present in head and neck, apart from the commonest squamous cell carcinoma. Thank you, madam. Thanks Thank a lot. you so much. Thank you very much. I now hand over the session to Dr. Pusha Haragude for the next lecture. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Now we, we move on to our next session. Uh, our next session speaker is Dr. Santosh Menon, with, uh, who will be conducting a lecture on updates on written neoplasm. And our moderator is uh, Dr. Sandhya Sundaram, ma'am. I would like to introduce Sandhya Sundaram, ma'am. Dr. Sandhya Sundaram, ma'am, uh, is head and, prof uh, head and uh, professor of Department of Pathology at Sri Ramchandra Medical Institute Center, Chennai. Uh, she has an experience of 24 years and special interest in genitourinary gastric, breast and molecular pathology. She was awarded Young Scientist Fellowship by DST for training in molecular pathology as WIS Center. She was a WHO invitee participant for cancer epidemiology training at IARC Lyon, France. She has done her observership in genital urinary pathology, UPMC, Pittsburgh, USA. She has more than 70 uh, national and international journal, journals and research grants. She's a founder president of Society for Genital Urinary Pathologists of India. She's a president of Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry chapter of IAPM since July 2021. She's a chief editor for book title Handbook of Pathology for Postgraduate Students, CBS Publications and chapter pathology for surgeon in the book short cases in surgery she has the honor of writing foreword for the most iconic book in pathology that is rosine ackerman surgical pathology southeast asia edition in this current year she was awarded the power grant for women for research in breast pathology by serb government of india 2021 and research grant for cancers of head and neck now I pass on the mic to our moderator, Dr. Sandhya Sundaram, ma'am, to further introduce Dr. Santosh, sir. Ma'am. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, a very detailed one. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anand for uh, inviting me here to chair this session. And it's such a pleasure to introduce my very endearing friend, uh, Dr. Santosh. Uh, we keep meeting in different virtual forums, and I hope to see him soon uh, offline. Uh, so very uh, a great pleasure to have you, uh, Dr. Santosh, to see you again. And um, I think Dr. Santosh does not need really a great introduction, but uh, because he is known across the country, 
uh, but uh, just to complete the pleasant formalities, he's a professor of pathology and a specialist in gen genitourinary pathologist. And he graduated from uh, Calicut Medical College, uh, Calicut in Kerala in the year 1999. And then he went on to do his post graduation from the prestigious uh, PGI Chandigarh um, in uh, 2003. He's also went on to do his diploma in National Board uh, 2003. And he's been working in the field of GU pathology and oncopathology for the last 15 years. Uh, his research includes a lot of translocations in prostate cancer, staging system validation, risk trust stratification in penile cancers, study on specific uh, variants of urothelial cancers and grading system. Uh, he is also invited to the editorial board of the fifth series of WHO, a very, very rare and very uh, a high honor for WHO classification of male genitourinary system, uh, WHO Lyon, France. And he's also a nominated member of the GU Pathology Society, USA Membership and uh, Diversity Committee. He's a member of the core committee of organizer for development of first Indian prostate cancer um, consortium guidelines, consensus guidelines. And uh, he's got so many best paper awards. Uh, he's won uh, the International Best Poster Award in 2014. Uh, he also got the Travel Bursary Award by the European Society in 2015. And he's put on several studies which were related to GU pathology, including digital pathology. And he's also involved in clinical trials. Also to say that he's a pioneer who started the uh, Society for GU Pathology. He's the Secretary General of the GU Pathology. And it was in his direction that we uh, all congregated together, the GU pathologist uh, congregated, and he's the one who really spearheaded the process. So thanks, so many thanks to him. And I'm so happy, Dr. Santosh, that uh, I'm getting to see you virtually, at least, you know, though we are not able to meet offline. And every talk is very distinct and unique. And that's how uh, Dr. Santosh designs his talk. I don't know where he gets it time, but he's so busy, and yet he's there for the students to teach them in the way they like. So once again, welcome, Dr. Santosh, and we are waiting for your wonderful session. And thank you once again, uh, Dr. Anand, for inviting me to chair this session. Thank you. Thank so you. over thank to you, you, Dr. Santosh. Thank you so much, Sandhya, madam. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And yes, I hope do, do hope that we meet uh, in person soon. Uh, at the outset, uh, before the talk, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Bosley and his team. At, uh, at, at Symbiosis uh, for inviting me here to share a little about uh, recent updates in renal cancers and what is coming up in the next WHO uh, classification and uh, where does it put people like us in India who have uh, limited resources and how do we go about things. So uh, if I can share my screen now. Yes, sir, you can. I hope it is visible now. Yes, sir, it's visible. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I will begin by uh, my talk, which is uh, on updates in renal tumors. So uh, this is just an ethical disclaimer. There are some images and some cartoons from the internet, which are solely uh, introduced for the purpose of interest. Some images are for humor, but are no way disrespectful to the patients. There is no breach of confidentiality of any patient in the presentation and appropriate references have been included. Uh, if you look at, before we go on to the the proper uh, innovations which have come in pathology, classification, and the recent entities. We have to be part of a team of, of a multidisciplinary team. And if you look at the innovations in the surgical field, there have been a very big innovation in the field of robotic surgery, where a surgeon can sit very far away from the operation table and the OR room, and he can sit away at a console and easily operate on a patient with the help of these, these, these uh, robotic arms. Uh, if you look at medical oncology in the field of RCC, there are several, several drugs. In fact, RCC is one of the few solid cancers in which there are more than 10 targeted drugs now available. It's a lot of innovation and a lot of molecular work has been done, which has brought about this world of changes in the tra treatment of metastatic RCC, which, which about 15 years back had very little option uh, except for uh, interleukins and interferons. So now we have several drugs. If you look at radiology field, uh, radiology has completely transformed how we practice medicine, especially in oncology. It is completely indispensable and uh, it has changed from CT of uh, renal lesions to very high uh, three Tesla MRIs, which can really try to distinguish different kinds of renal tumors. In fact, as pathologists, we are threatened by uh, many radiologists uh, who almost can even diagnose the variants and different types of uh, RCCs based on their imaging and their imaging uh, characteristics. So uh, that's all what is happening in the clinical field and radiological field in, uh, in, in renal cancers. 
and somewhere down the line the pathologists also didn't want to miss the bus and every few years we have updates we have new classification we have new entities which are coming up so uh, before we go into actual entities there are certain things which have changed over the years we will describe that and then go on to the entities uh, if you look at entities in renal neoplasms there are several different entities but most of them have a lot of overlapping histological patterns so you have clear cell you can have eosinophilic variant of clear cell you can have clear cell variant of papillary so there are several overlapping entities and very limited kind of histologies which are available but then there has to be a difference and they are classified different and their outcomes are different so it's important that we recognize them so uh, if you come to renal tumors what are the issues in renal cancer what are the before the tumor is resected what are the things we should know how do how do renal cancers present most of them would present with abdominal pain a dragging sensation in the flank and hematuria uh, but in recent times because of widespread use of ultrasound for various other conditions many incidental lesions are being picked up so that's an important feature does radiology help in diagnosis of renal cancer so if there is a renal mass which is which is enhancing on on a contrast enhanced ct scan the clinician or the urologist is almost confident 100% sure that he is dealing with a renal cancer so uh, that brings us to the question as a pathologist will you receive renal biopsies for cancer diagnosis the answer to this question is a almost a big no because if the clinic if the clinical and radiological features are characteristic of a mass lesion in the kidney which is contrast enhancing they are pretty sure that they are dealing with renal cancer so they would work up the patient for metastatic if it is non metastatic setting they would operate even in a metastatic setting renal cancer is one of the few cancers which undergo resection so renal biopsies per se for a renal mass lesion suspected renal cancer is uh, no it is only in the setting of metastatic setting widespread metastasis where they are not considering to operate the kidney they would send a renal cancer biopsy to you so what is the main uh, main aim of a biopsy diagnosis is basically to tell whether it's a clear versus non clear i come to that in a short minute and radical versus partial nephrectomy is the most important question in the mind of the urologist based on the tumor size and other characteristics so basically in a biopsy what the clinician wants from you as a pathologist is to whether you can tell it's a clear versus a non clear rcc so that is the most important case, uh, question because this is mostly done in a setting of metastasis when there is widespread metastasis and there is a renal mass and they suspecting a renal cancer they do a biopsy send it to you and you would need to tell them it is clear versus non clear as certain uh, Im immediate Im uh, cancer directed therapy in a metastatic setting by medical oncologist is different between clear and non clear in some settings uh, so the important thing to remember on a small core biopsy there are limited morphologies you can have clear looking cells you can have eosinophilic looking cells some oncocytic with and the patterns may be solid papillary so these are very little variations which you can have on a small biopsy at the outset only i would like to say here that the cn9 immunohistochemistry may help in picking up conventional re renal cell carcinoma clear cell carcinoma so we already know that 70 75% of all renal cancers would be conventional renal cell carcinoma but sometimes on a small biopsy or sometimes in a in a setting the clear cells may not be very prominent in a core biopsy they may look a little eosinophilic a little more oncocytic and then a cn9 ihc may help a diffuse cn9 membrane positivity help you diagnose a clear cell rcc other ics which we routinely do on biopsies is ck7 amakar ckit and we include a pack set if the differential is say uh, we are thinking of a large mass we cannot distinguish from an from an adrenal tumor or from a from a from a hepatic tumor we would do add a pack set to confirm the renal origin as pack set is a uh, kind of a renal renal marker in this setting so this is a ca9 ihc which shows that nice membrane is positivity now setting we have recently standardized this and some sometimes you get cytoplasmic positivity also in ca9 but membrane positivity has to be there diffuse uh, to call it a, a conventional renal cell carcinoma so if you look at daily utility uh, pathology practice in in case of renal cancers these are the four tumors which you will come across so if i can point it out maybe uh, i can do this uh, so this is your clear cancer this clear cell renal cell carcinoma with a lot of blood lakes and plasma pools which you see the cells have clear morphology uh the second picture showing the foamy histocytes here in the cores of papillae come in type 1 papillary rcc or the uh, routine papillary rcc which we see uh, or what we call as type 1 rcc and this one is the chromophobe renal cancer with multinucleation binucleation perinuclear halos which are very prominent on 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 um, uh, on, on the morphology and this one is the oncocytoma showing lot of oncocytic cytoplasm very homogeneous dense cytoplasm Uh, the nuclear atp is minimal in these cases most of the times 
so these are the these four tumors are the most common uh, cancers which you will come across uh, in your in your practice tumors in, in your practice the uh, other rare ones are the collecting duct carcinoma which is very infiltrative it infiltrates around the glomeruli and then you have this comedian necrosis pattern hobnailing pattern can occur in collecting ducts and spindle cell pattern can occur in these tumors so uh, by far collecting duct now is a diagnosis of exclusion and i'll tell you why it is now taken like that so if you look at resection specimens this is the minimum data set which is used for reporting so there are certain essential criteria and there are certain optional elements which you need to include in a in a resection specimen you have to tell whether the specimen is radical nephrectomy or a nephron sparing surgery you have to give the site of the tumor the maximum tumor dimension because t1 versus t2 the tumor size of T tnm staging is based on the tumor size you have to give the histological type of tumor clear versus non clear and in the non clear you have other varieties uh, like the papillary chromophobe and other tumors the grading used is iscp grading uh, not the ferman group grading anymore you have to comment on the necrosis presence of sarcomatoid rhabdoid areas and the extent of tumor invasion perinephric renal sinus so these things have to be taken into consideration when you are reporting a renal uh, resected specimen of uh, renal cancer obviously the margins come into play the optional include uh, the press the percentage of necrosis and percentage of rhabdoid areas this is an optional element and it's a good practice to put this in the report uh, because that gives an idea of how much sarcomatoid pattern is there in the tumor and that helps in deciding uh, what kind of targeted therapy they would employ so this is in a nutshell uh, rcc pathology report tumor size gross renal invasion sinus invasion histological type uh, some people still use ferman but i would strongly recommend that now you should use iscp grading necrosis present or absence and if possible give percentage of necrosis renal sinus invasion Uh, uh, perinephric fat invasion cut margins and lymph node status uh, before we go on to the recently described entities and varieties of renal cancer i would just touch upon some important aspects of staging and grossing so if we look at agcc 8th edition uh, tnm staging the most important change which was introduced is that uh, the involvement of pelvic elicil system was not part of agcc 7th edition and involvement of pelvic elicil system by the tumor is now recognized as pt3a and categorized uh, along with the renal vein invasion and the sinus invasion so that is an important change which has occurred in tnm staging uh, once so when when you gross you have to take sections from the renal pelvic pelvic elicil system if the tumor is close to that you have to take that uh, some important points to remember when you are grossing renal cancer specimens are that if the size of the renal cancer is more than 10 cm it's almost always they would involve the renal sinus so supposing your resident has grossed a, a tumor which is 15 cm and the section from the renal sinus is not showing tumor probably you need to go back to your gross specimen and take more section from renal sinus because most of the rccs uh, which are more than 10 cm would um, uh, invariably involve the renal sinus the renal cut vein margin one should be should mean that it is adherent to the cut margin a direct contiguous adrenal gland involvement is now staged as pt4 and not m1 m1 is a hematogenous involvement of adrenal is called a metastatic uh, and literature says that less than 20% necrosis in an organ confined clear rcc has better outcomes so when you are reporting necrosis it's a good idea to say how much necrosis is present especially in a completely kidney confined t1 or t2 tumors so sarcomatoid change can occur in any tumor so you can have chromophobe with sarcomatoid you can have papillary with sarcomatoid so it's it's kind of a de differentiation in the cancer and it occur in any kind of uh, uh, renal cancers and they are amenable to pdl1 inhibitors so that's important to uh, thing to pick up so this is a cartoon to show that if your tumor is this one which is clearly involving the renal sinus uh, fat uh, uh, one section may be clearly enough because you are grossly seeing that it is invaded uh, the renal sinus whereas if the tumor is very close to the renal sinus but you are not sure whether it's invading renal sinus it's a good idea to take three sections uh, of the tumor with the renal sinus to categorically say the importance of this fact is that this renal sinus route is the route through which the tumor spreads so compared to the perinephric uh, tumor gland involvement the renal sinus uh, fat involvement is more important for the tumor metastasis pathway so that's the understanding and in coming years maybe the renal sinus involvement will be upstage compared to the perinephric fat invasion uh, a word about grading recommendation like i said uh, uh, ferman grading is not used in tumors now uh, the uh, rccs especially the clear and conventional rccs and the papillary rccs are grading used the iscp grading system now this grading is basically based on the nucleolar prominence so if you put your slide on the stage and you can pick up the nuclei at low power 
they probably you're de dealing with a high grade tumor because the nucleoli are visible at low power. If you go to high power and still not able to see the nuclei, nucleoli, then probably you're dealing with a grade one or grade two tumor. So that's the basic understanding. So if you see nucleoli at low power itself of a renal cancer, you're dealing with a high ISP grade tumor. That's the basic understanding in this. Uh, chromophorob is not graded according to ISUP, uh, neither graded according to Furman. There are certain other CTG grading systems which, uh, which have come up, but they're still not in practical use. So chromophobe RCC is not graded using either the Furman or neither the uh, ISUP graded system. So this is a recent paper in 2021 Europe, Urology, which says that four type classification using coagulative tumor nebula. So it's being understood that a chromophobe renal cancer which has a lot of necrosis, does very poor compared to a tumor which does not have necrosis. So somewhat grading is in getting incorporated in chromophobe with the help of tumor necrosis. So like I said, these are your common tumors which you see in uh, routine practice. But what is new in RCC? What are the new updates and what are the new entities which have come up in RCC? So in RCC, it's going like, I wish I knew what is new. So there are so many new entities, so many new things which have come up in renal cancer and we will go through that in a mean in the so we look at previous classifications from 1996 heidelberg classification till the 2015 who zurich there have been several changes several entities have come into the classification several have left the classification this was in 2014-15 in vancouver classification of renal neoplasia uh, a huge list of renal cancers and renal tumors which were recognized uh, notable among them were the mitf which was included in this there was mucinous tubular and spindle cell carcinoma, tubular cystic renal cancer, which was included from in the 2014-15 classifications, uh, uh, adopted from the 2004 classification. And then there were certain new epithelial tumors which are uh, put up and emerging entities which were given up, uh, given by the WHO in the Vancouver classification. So coming to the recent modifications in WHO classification, which are going to come up in the next spring. So in probably in March 2022, we'll have a newer uh, version of uh, RCC classification. And just like iPhone, different versions, we have a 22 spring classification, which is going to come up. This is based on uh, two major papers, which came up in modern pathology by a large group of GUPS, uh, where they uh, found new entities, as well as provisional novel emerging entities, two papers, which came up in modern pathology. And based on that, WHO is coming up with this classification. Uh, this is still in press and there may be minor changes which are going to occur. If you look at renal cancer classification, which is coming up, it is mostly these clear tumors. So you have a clear cell renal carcinoma, uh, which is the conventional one. And you have a multilocular cystic renal neoplasm of low malignant potential, which is literally uh, no malignant potential for that matter. The papillary tumors are the papillary RCC and papillary adenoma. Oncocytic tumors uh, include oncocytoma, chromophobe uh, renal cancer, and other unclassifiable or still not recognized oncocytic tumors. You have the collecting duct RCC, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have a lot of several entities like mucinous tubular, tubulocystic, acquired cystic disease, which were already part of classification. A new entity which is recognized now is the eosinophilic solid and cystic renal cell cancer. And there is a whole new, uh, this red box demonstrate there is a whole new subset or classified tumors known as molecularly defined renal tumors. Now, this is important. Uh, update which is coming up because this would need a molecular uh, confirmation. So like TFA3 or MITF associated RCC and TFEB, they have IHCs to pick the tumors. Still, the recommendation would be to do a molecular in these, these group of tumors to finally confirm. So there are these are several overlapping tumor morphologies. And because they are molecularly different now, it is better to have a confirmation by molecular. And that's how the WHO is going to uh, classify these kind of set of tumors. I would not be touching about the mesenchymal embryonic tumors in this. I'll be mostly confined in my, my lecture about these epithelial tumors. So uh, there is another group of emerging renal tumors like the thyroid-like follicular carcinomas. Uh, it is still not found a place in the classification. We still have to generate a lot of evidence to say that this is a different entity. There are other tumors like eosinophilic vacuolated tumors, which find a place in the group of other oncocytic tumors low-grade oncocytic tumors, which also part of oncocytic neoplasms, and then there are other, certain other type of tumors. So uh, I, I'll just take you through one case, and maybe we can discuss out how to go about a tumor when you see uh, such kind of neoplasm. So this is uh, labeled as the eosinophilic papillary oncocytic nucleolated conundrum. So you have a eosinophilic tumor. You don't know whether it's a clear cell eosinophilic variant, whether it's eosinophilic variant of chromophobe, 
you whether it's it's got a papillary appearance or is it a papillary variant so those things always come up into your mind and how to go about these things and delineating according to the new classification so so this was a 73 year old male with hematuria of short duration and like i said a cct abdomen pelvis was showing a, a heterogeneously enhancing mass lesion uh, arising from the posterior cortical surface of right kidney and there was a small thrombus in the right renal vein suggestive for cc so like i said in such cases they would hardly do a biopsy they are pretty sure they are dealing with renal cell carcinoma because based on the cct finding of a heterogeneously enhancing mass in the kidney they are almost sure that they are doing with a renal mass so they would directly go ahead and do a nephrectomy in such cases here you can see this tumor has got a little mild cystic appearance but most of it is solid a very a brownish colored tumor not like a conventional classical rcc it is sort of involving the uh, pelvic lysis system so that puts uh, a question mark at gross whether it is a urothelial cancer or renal cancer so that's an important question which you have to ask when the tumor involves the pelvic lysis system you have to also put into put into thought process whether it's a urothelial cancer so this is the gross picture this is a, a scanned image of of the same showing this uh, tumor with uh, very solid looking areas some papillae at this power you can see that there are papillary areas you can see the blood vessels running even at this power through the core of these papillae and then there are these solid areas in these areas so these are the solid areas and these are some of the papillary areas in this again you see that there are solid areas you can see the core of the blood vessels running through the tumors here at many places forming papillae and pseudo papillate places very nicely and better developed papillary and floating micro papillary kind of appearance of this tumor but even at this power you can make out that there are hardly any clear cells in, uh, in the tumor so the cytoplasm very eosinophilic oncocytic at places and it looks very busy very cellular tumor uh, but the core of vessels is well seen here and a high power to show so if you look at this power this is like a low power uh, picture and you can see that the nucleoli are very very prominent even in this so this is how you start grading a renal cancer if low power you start seeing nucleoli you basically dealing with either a isup grade 3 or a grade 4 tumor so that's the initial part of grading again to show solid area similar looking cells more solid pattern thin capillaries separating them into small nests of tumor cells a uh, higher power showing very prominent nucleoli a uh, vesicular nuclei uh, oncocytic to eosinophilic cytoplasm uh, moderate to abundant cytoplasm uh, no clear cytoplasm so that's important so this is the question so you have this tumor highest power to show this very prominent nucleoli in these cells very 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 uh, prominent eosinophilic nucleoli lot of cytoplasm in the cells perithelial arrangement which is very characteristic in most of the renal cancers and then you have a uh, moderate to abundant cytoplasm but no clearing of the cytoplasm so i think when you see such a tumor uh, what do you think of you have to think that first thing which should come to your mind that even though it looks eosinophilic it's got very high nuclear grade is it just a eosinophilic variant of of clear cell carcinoma the commonest tumor is clear cell you should always put that in mind think about it but in generally in such a case you would hardly think of it because it's completely eosinophilic oncocytic tumor and it has got papillae it does not have any clear areas but still in such cases uh, i would suggest that you do employ a ca9 to see the expression of ca9 in such tumors uh, this was an old tumor we did not do the ca9 in this so my the point which i am driving in when you see such morphology so this is a classical morphology of what we label as a type 2 papillary renal cell carcinoma so now the current understanding by the who and by everyone is that there is the type 2 morphology is just a morphological diagnosis so it, it includes all of these tumors which important ones are the fh deficient rcc eosinophilic solid cystic renal tumors alk rearranged rccs and tfe tfeb rearranged rcc so all of these four cancers four types of cancers can have this kind of histology and uh, unfortunately we have to employ a panel of ihcs and if you have a molecular lab do molecular studies to try and delineate these ones now some of them are targetable by different therapies so fh deficient rccs has got a specific target of erlotinib based therapies uh, which is different from other rccs so you need to diagnose these conditions because the therapy is different and fh deficient rccs is one of the worst rccs uh, even compared to conventional renal rccs so my point what i'm driving is when you see such a morphology all these things should come into your mind uh, of of uh, 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 no, differential diagnosis so again coming to this Uh, this very prominent nucleoli when you see this prominent nucleoli you should definitely definitely think of fh deficient rcc 
or what we call in hereditary setting, it would be called a hereditary leiomyomatosis associated, associated renal cell cancer. This is called CMV like nucleoli, very prominent nucleoli, but uh, with peri perinucleolar halo. And that is important feature of a FH deficient RCC. But like I said, just confining to one thought process is not important. You have to think of all four of these when you come up, come up with this kind of morphology. Again, to show the prominent nucleoli, isnophilic oncocytic cytoplasm and the patterns. Uh, this the patient also had nodal metastasis. So this is metastatic in the node. We did a pax it just because uh, we thought that uh, urothel should also be considered because it was involving the pelvic lysal system. pax was uh, diffusely positive. Mind you, urothel cancer of uh, prenatal pelvis can be focally sometimes positive for pax but this was diffuse positive. CK7 was positive like this. We, this is the control here you see in the tubu renal tubules. Amakar was diffusely positive. So if you do a CK7 and Amakar only, you would probably label this as type 2 morphology or type 2 papillary cancer. There is nothing wrong in calling it, but the current recommendation is that type 2 papillary is just a histology or morphology and you need to separate these out into different entities. TFE3 was negative. You can see the prominent nucleoli even in this negative stain. So what is this tumor? So like I said, we have to do other IHCs. HMB45 was focally positive, which can come in MITF associated uh, tumors like TFEB and TFE3 tumors. Again, HMB45 very focally positive in this tumor. Now, cytokeratin 20 was pretty diffusely positive in, in many areas. Uh, so very strongly positive in certain areas. So cytokeratin 20 is nicely positive. There are sheets of areas which are CK20 positive. Uh, in this, you can see this very nicely positive uh, cytokeratin 20. So uh, we did FR, uh, fumarate dehydratase, uh, fumarate hydratase for FH deficiency, but in, in FH deficient tumors, the tumors would be negative for this stain. The tumor did pick up FH stain, so it is not an FH deficient tumor. Uh, another picture higher power to show fumarate hydratase is retained in these tumors. So the diagnosis in, in this case as eosinophilic solid cystic RCCs. So, so this is uh, recently described by Dr. Tripkov and team. Uh, they found that this tumor is seen in females, but uh, slowly people have realized that they can occur in pediatric age group as well as in males. Uh, they were supposed to uh, be indolent. So initial uh, studies by Tripkov et al. So that most of them are slow growing tumors confined to kidney with no metastasis. But now several cases have seen and we have seen three, four cases of uh, ESC, which are no, most of them are presented with metastasis. Now, most of the renal tumors, as they grow in size, they would present, they were likely to be metastatic. So in a country like India, where presentation is late, uh, we would expect that many of these tumors, which in the West do not present with metastasis, would present with metastasis in our country. The classic cases have granular LD body-like inclusions in the cytoplasm, uh, something something look at, called as basophilic stippling in the cytoplasm. They are characteristically CK20 positive. So there is no other renal tumor, primary renal tumor, which is CK20 positive. It is only ESC, which is CK20 positive. CK20 may be negative to focal. Mind you, whenever you get CK20 positive renal cancer with papillary architecture, you should always keep urothel carcinoma in mind because the management, at least surgically and uh, uh, medical oncology, will be different in those tumors. And molecularly, they have shown TSC, tuberous sclerosis gene associated changes and mTOR mutations in these tumors. Now, again, coming back to this classification, like I said, these eosinophilic solid cystic RCCs would be confused with TFEB, TFE3 tumors, fumarate hydratase, and alkaline. So if you have the provision of doing molecular or the immunohistochemistry to this, this is how you distinguish these ones. So that is an important thing which uh, comes to your should come to your mind when you see an eosinophilic tumor with papillary appearance. When you are thinking of a papillary type two RCC, you should think of all these entities uh, uh, according to the coming up uh, WHO classification. This is another biopsy slide of a patient uh, who was a young patient, 34 year old. Uh, the biopsy showed these clear cells. Now you're very tempted to call it a conventional renal cell carcinoma, but look at the age of the patient. It's a 34 year old patient. So you should always keep in mind a clear cell, uh, clear looking tumor in a nested or alveolar pattern with some eosinophilic cells in between. You should think of, uh, of uh, translocation associated RCC or MITF RCCs. They can have very, very clear appearance. You can be totally Fox and you can label it uh, as a conventional RCC. But you, if you do a TFE3 IHC, uh, of, uh, a, a diffuse strong TFE3 positivity would almost be sure that you are dealing with a MITF associated RCC. So that's how you diagnose these things. Obviously, you have to do a molecular test of translocation to pick up. This was the resection of the same patient showing very nested pattern 
uh, alveolar packed alveolar pattern of these cells. Some eosinophilic cells are also present, but most of them are clear looking cells. Can have some momentous calcification at places. Again, a mixture of uh, uh, clear and eosinophilic cells, large voluminous cytoplasm, sharply defined cell borders. You should think of, of uh, translocation associated RCCs in such cases, especially in young patients. However, they are also described in adult patients. Again, more pictures to show the alveolar pattern and the abundant cytoplasm which these, these tumors have. Some of them may not have those many clear cells, but may have abundant somomatous calcification, look more eosinophilic. So that's also a part of the spectrum of TFE3. And for confirmation, you have to do a TFE3 break apart fish. I can see the red and green signals are far, uh, are, are, uh, far away in these uh, tumor nuclei, and that's how you diagnose uh, MITF associated RCCs. So just for awareness, uh, you can again reiterate the fact that clear cells may be seen in a spectrum of all renal tumors. And a pink eosinophilic RCC is an ever expanding list. And I see a molecular almost now necessary for exact subtyping. The most important thing for pathologists is that thankfully, currently the management of these other ent entities is not refined. But I'm sure in the coming years, many of these would be refined. They will have targeted therapies for different tumors. And then we would be in, 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 in a uh, forced to give the correct diagnosis in such cases uh, by employing uh, appropriate IHC and molecular research. Another case to show this cystic uh, renal tumors, uh, papillary, so same tumor, which has got this multi, uh, uh, multi-appearance uh, multi in the sense you've got cysts, got solid areas, tubules, you got this papillae within the cyst, kind of cyst with papillae, solid areas with, with very desmoplastic stroma. Again, very high-grade nuclei in the tubules, desmoplastic mixoid stroma uh, with certain caught-up tubules, papillae within the cyst. When you see a myriad of, of uh, morphologies, which include cystic, papillary, solid, desmoplastic responses within the same tumor, uh, you may be tempted to call it a, a collecting duct. But whenever you're thinking of collecting duct, you should always think of HLRCC. So like I said, uh, again, very prominent nucleoli in the tubules, uh, some kind of necrosis and hobnailing of cells. This is this may all be very prominent. So different kind of patterns within the same tumor, you should think of HLRCC or FH deficient tumors. So this tumor was deficient in fumarate hydratase. You can see that the tumor is negative. The endothelial cells and the stromal cells are taking up the fumarate hydratase staining. And this is an uh, important entity which should be recognized. Uh, tubulocystic RCC, a very low power view of tubulocystic showing how the tubules and cysts look like. On gross, these tumors look like soap bubble or the bubble paper appearance that classically described. And this is how a tubulocystic RCC appears. They have this, uh, again, hobnailed appearance of the nuclei. The nuclei usually ISUP grade 3, grade 4 nuclei lining these tubules and cysts. But mind you, when you see a tubulocystic pattern, along with supposing papillary pattern, you should think of FS division. The point is you have to keep on looking at the morphology of different areas, gross them, take more sections to look at these different areas and try and delineate these different entities. Some other recent entities, uh, a tumor which was called as clear cell papillary carcinoma has now been renamed as clear cell papillary tumor. The important thing is they look like clear cell RCC. They are, but the nuclei are towards the lumen rather than towards the basement membrane or the vascular structures. The nuclei are towards the, towards the lumen and they're regimented towards the lumen. And they look very low grade, usually grade one, grade two nuclei. Here also you can see the picture where it can be very nicely seen that the, uh, the nuclei are towards the lumen. And here also you can see that nuclear tumor. So this should make you suspect that this is a clear cell papillary tumor. The important IHC which comes positive in this is CK7 diffuse positive. So uh, generally a conventional clear cell, run of the mill conventional RCC would be CK7 negative or very focally positive. But when you give a diffuse CK7 positive tumor with this kind of morphology, you should think of clear cell papillary tumor. It is important to distinguish this tumor because none of the diagnosed cases have metastasized in comparison to a conventional RCC, which is a highly, highly, highly uh, malignant tumor and one of the worst RCCs to have. So this tumor is mo more or less con considered to be benign. There are no metastatic described in a properly diagnosed clear cell papillary tumor. So this is again a tumor, looks very clear at low power, again, little eosinophilic cytoplasm at, at in other areas, clear areas in other areas. And if you look at a higher power, this is this, they have vacuoles, they have this very flocculent kind of uh, cytoplasm in the, in the tumor cells. So when you think, when you see such very monotonous looking low grade kind of nuclear tumor with very flocculent and fuzzy 
pink cytoplasm you should think of sdhb deficient rcc this is the sdhb stain uh, which is negative in the tumor cells and which is focally positive in these endothelial cells very weak positivity so this is an sdhb deficient rcc with very flocculent cytoplasm so you can see how these have very limited kind of a spectrum of morphologies so you have to think about these before you go there another low grade tumor is the low grade oncocytic tumor looking very oncocytic tubular pattern seen in this tumor diffusely positive for ck7 negative for ck again this tumor very oncocytic looking almost like sdhb tumor again positive for ck7 and negative for ck so these are other spectrum tumors a mucinous tubular spindle cell rcc uh, has got tubules you can see the tubular pattern here very nicely you have got a almost spindling of tumor cells here the same tubules getting compressed by the stroma and the background is very mixed right you can see so mucinous tubular spindle is a is, is a name which is self explanatory you have mucinous background you have tubules of spindle uh, tumor cells and the spindle cells getting and the tubules getting compressed into spindle cells more pictures from one of our own publications of tub mucinous tubular and spindle cells you can see the tubular pattern the spindle pattern here uh, the tubular pattern and the the variably mixoid stroma which you can find in these tumors coming to another interesting case a gross picture of a, of a, again a young patient 36 year old male uh, who had this very solid looking tumor uh, nephrectomy uh, there were certain cystic areas again seen in this tumor and on morphology you see this kind of appearance solid looking areas and some cystic areas and solid areas here you can clearly make out and if you look at the cystic areas this is the morphology of the tumor uh, something which strikes your mind it looks absolutely like a thyroid with lot of colloid like material uh in fact if i don't tell you the site you would all call this a thyroid tumor or a thyroid uh, section from a thyroid so this is a thyroid like areas and spindle areas which we saw in the tumor more areas to show that this colloid like colloid filled tubules or follicles are seen and then this there is a uh, admixture of these kind of epithelial areas with the spindle looking areas and then there is certain areas of demarcation and focal admixture of these tubules so this this was a thyroid like follicular carcinoma uh, thyroid like this is still an emerging entity in renal tumor not currently part of the classification uh, hopefully over the next uh, next 4 5 years we'll get more uh, uh, evidence to put this into category recently there have been ews r1 studies on these tumors and they found some fusions in these tumors a word about immunohistochemistry uh, like i said the four main tumors we use cd10 we use vimentin ck7 to diagnose a uh, uh, conventional renal cancer and a ca9 would be something which i would uh, recommend if you can have a ca9 in your armamentarium that can really help you in picking up a conventional renal cancer a papillary type 1 rcc is ck7 amacar positive a uh, chromophobe is ck7 positive ck may be positive focally or even diffusely but not very strong vimentin is usually negative in a chromophobe and an oncocytoma morphologically is easily picked but it's ck7 focal and ck diffuse tumor but if you look at the list of ihcs in current era a huge list and an ever expanding list is coming up and you have ca9 as a marker for conventional you have ck20 as a marker for eosinophilic solid cystic rcc and you have cathepsin for all the tfeb tfe3 tumors and many other cancers are also positive for ck cathepsin case so that's a important thing to have most of the tfe3 tfe would be positive for melanocytic markers like hmb45 and uh, melane so the point is uh, as the time is going uh, into the future we will be needed to do more and more immunohistochemistry chemistry to delineate this especially if they they have a targeted therapies coming up so in coming next decade there will be a lot of targeted therapy for different different tumors and we may have to employ more ihcs and more molecular to sort of delineate so in practical utility these are the most common ones which we use that is a cd10 by maintain ck7 and uh, ck it but i see like paxate and a panel extended panel of melane ck20 hmb45 cathepsin is finding its place in daily utility practice uh, in a metastatic setting when you are suspecting rcc paxate is the one of the most useful markers uh, especially when you are thinking of urothel versus rcc and tfe3 needs to be done if if the renal cancer is below Uh, occurs in a patient which is below 30 years of age a small word about uh, nephron sparing surgery because the spectrum of renal cancers is changing from large tumors and more and more small tumors are being picked up in recent era due to rampant use of radiology you are likely to get as pathologists many many nephron sparing surgery or partial nephrectomy specimens so the question is why was this started because they want to save the nephrons 
they have found that for similar oncological outcomes they can just remove the part of the tumor along with a little normal parenchyma of these tumors and they can save the rest of the nephrons this is because most of the patients uh, are living longer and they are likely to develop ckd disease ckd uh, chronic uh, renal disease uh, because of uh, diabetes hypertension and if you do a C, uh, nephron sparing surgery in most of the patients uh, they would be able to spare a lot of nephrons uh, so that's that's important uh, many studies have shown that nss associated with less clinically apparent renal failure and risk of dialysis so that's that's why small tumors in renal uh, in re, uh, renal masses are now treated by nephron sparing surgery so this is just to pick, show a picture how a renal uh, tumor is operated they would put uh, these guide wires along and pull up the kidney they would put up this ice pack surrounded for the cold ischemia they would cut out the renal mass and send this partial nephrectomy specimen uh, to you uh, earlier we used to get a lot of frozen sections for margin but now we don't do not get so that's another question sure, should you do frozen section in all partial nephrectomy uh, what would you what would your clinician do if the margin is positive and what should a radical nephrectomy be done in all these cases where the margin is positive so the answer is a big no so frozen section is not needed to to in partial nephrectomy specimens because the surgeons are already sort of using cautery in the bed of the nephrectomy and that would kill most of the tumor cells if at all they are left behind the renal ischemia which is induced by clamping can also help in uh, taking care of the cancer cells and most of the times a partial nephrectomy is done uh, for small tumors and these small tumors are very low grade tumors so if at all the patient develops a recurrence that may be many many years later so a positive margin at frozen section uh it may not adversely affect the uh, outcome and there is no need to revise these patients at frozen first of all i don't think there is need to do frozen and initially we used to get a lot of frozens for partial nephrectomy now we hardly get any frozen sections so before i end my talk i would summarize uh, that the role of pathology is very important clinical decision making and it's going to become more and more important uh, in the era of targeted therapy especially in the metastatic setting so many of the recently described entities have morphology mimicking conventional rcc and other types of papillary rcc so you have to keep in mind the whole list and think about it the coming who is defined basically dividing all cancers renal cancers so more molecular defined tumors and morphologically defined tumors type 2 papillary rcc is just a morphological term so we don't diagnose and put a bottom line of type 2 papillary rcc we should try and read i i know it's difficult we don't have all those ics at our naramamentarium we have to rule out an fh deficient rcc tfe3 tfeb rcc alk associated rcc the grading system to be used in conventional and papillary rcc is the iscp grading system the staging we have to always think about the importance of renal sinus any tumor which is more than 10 cm you have to make sure that renal sinus is not involved it's likely to be involved so you should go back and take more sections as a pathologist you are going to see more and more nephron sparing specimens because we are picking more smaller tumors and if you look at immunohistochemistry the the it is expanding the list is expanding we have to have ca19 in our amamentarium i think it's very very important to have that and then you have ck20 melane hmb45 cathepsin or these uh, list is going to increase in the coming years uh, what about the future or like all other tumors i think this slide can be put up in any cancer uh, we are currently using ihcs tissues and we are looking at clinical picture later on everything is going to be based on bioinformatics and molecular diagnosis and uh, the world is going to be more difficult for the pathologists because uh, they are going to have they would have to have some knowledge about all these but the best part is we will be the liaison officer between the clinician the and the molecular lab i would like to acknowledge uh, dr sangeeta desai my hod and my colleague in euro dmg uh, other my euro dmg mates in urology medical oncology you get to learn lot from the clinical people and it helps you improve your own subject uh, immensely a technical ics staff they do fabulous work and without their giving us good sections and good ics we can really not uh, proceed in our work uh, we have a lot of mentors in our life and we should always uh, acknowledge them always acknowledge my residents because i get to learn a lot from them although i don't acknowledge that uh, and i want to acknowledge dr kashyapi from pune uron college uh, for sharing few of his slides uh, in his presentation thank you very much thank you sir for the wonderful lecture uh, i uh, now pass on the mic to our moderator dr sandhya sundaram ma'am ma'am any comments um thank you santosh for that excellent lecture i think in this one uh, uh, you took us through the entire gamut and i think only you can do that really thanks so much 
Um, do we have any questions, uh, Dr. Priyusha? No, ma'am, not right okay. now. So can I ask a few things that were, yes, I mean, it's so discussion. self explanatory I have, I have finished before my time, Dr. Anand, I, I think we can yeah. discuss a little bit. Yeah, a couple of questions. So one is, um, of late, we are getting a lot of these RCCs in young patients, you know, mm -hmm. 35, 40. Mm -hmm. So just by virtue of their age, uh, Dr. Santosh, would you suspect any of these uh, molecularly uh, determined cancers? Because sometimes the morphology looks like any clear cell, but there's yes. a niggling doubt. Yes, yes. So, so the recommendation is that any tumor which looks even like a conventional RCC in a less than 30 year old, 40 year old, you have to do the translocation uh, studies in any case, at least TFE3, TFEB. The point is our clinicians don't push it too much. And we also don't push it too much because the translocation RCC currently are treated the same way. The, the treatment is pretty much similar to yes. the conventional RCC. So that's the issue. But I'm sure in coming years, as more and more data is generated, uh, you will have different therapies. So yeah. for example, I'll tell you FH deficient. Hmm. Sometimes people just diagnose FH deficient using the IHC and the molecular. Now it is well known and there are studies, clinical studies that FH deficient RCCs can be treated with erlotinib and bevacizumab. Okay. In fact, we have a couple of patients, our medical oncologists have put the patient on erlotinib and bevacizumab. They got the drugs on compassionate grounds for these uh, poor patients, but uh, they do well with those. So I'm sure in the coming decade, uh, just diagnosing these patients would not be, but it would have treatment and prognostic implication. Prognostic, we know that FH deficient yeah. and TFE, they, yeah, they do worse compared to conventional. Correct. Correct. So it would be probably useful to get it all yes. done. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, we have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Sushmita has asked, if mm -hmm. the entire renal sinus is involved by tumor grossly, mm -hmm. should we have a microscopic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this thing, evidence of uh, renal sinus invasion? Should we uh, then still no, so take... I think if, if you have got a good eye and you are clearly sure that the renal sinus is grossly involved, I think that's fine enough. Because it may have completely destroyed the fat there. In most of such cases, I would say that the renal vein thrombus would also be there. So the renal vein thrombus is, will, will upstage it in any case. So then the renal sinus... Uh, microscopic description becomes uh, not very necessary. So that's uh, important. The point is you have to look at the renal sinus grossly. And if you find that the tumor is close to it, but not involving, you take more sections. If it is clearly destroying the renal sinus completely involving, you have to already call it a PT3, PT3 a tumor. So just in continuation to that, um, Santosh, sometimes we find a tumor just stopping short of the renal sinus. Yes. And I always, uh, you know, uh, you see multiple sections is just close, but it's still not into it. So are we missing something out there, uh, Santosh? I mean, uh, is there a minimum number of bits that we would like to take in that case? Generally, if it is close to renal sinus, uh, especially in big tumors. So um, I'll, I'll share some experiences. Many times there are 15 centimeter tumors and we see yeah, renal sinus. So then definitely it is involved. When we go back and take more sections, we do find that there are certain small nodules which are there in the renal sinus. Correct. So uh, the, the dictum is any tumor which is more than 10 centimeter, Yes. Especially in a country where we have 15, 20 centimeter yeah, tumor. We have to make sure. And we must sure. almost be sure that the renal sinus is involved. Such is involved. Okay. So there's a couple of more questions. One is how to differentiate uh, oncocytoma versus chromophob RCC um, mm -hmm. from uh, Dr. Gauri. And she also says how to differentiate on biopsy as we do not get renal biopsies at times. How to we differentiate and biopsy. We do get, sorry, we do get. Yeah, so we also biopsies. do, uh, Gauri, we do get uh, uh, renal biopsies. It's not that we don't get it, but the point is, so we are talking about chromophobe versus uh, chromophobe versus chromophobe. Yeah. Chromophobe versus oncocytoma. Oncocytoma. So like I said, uh, chromophobe is usually diffuse CK7 positive. Both can have very overlapping morphology, especially in a small biopsy. Uh, in a small biopsy, sometimes you may have to leave it, uh, your bottom line saying that it's an oncocytic neoplasm. Mm. And uh, mm. if it doesn't come CK7 diffuse positive mm. and it come it doesn't come CK positive or something, though CK7, CK is a combination which we use to distinguish chromophobe from, uh, yeah. from uh, uh, oncocytoma. Yes. If you are unable to delineate them, you have to put the bottom line as an oncocytic neoplasm yep, yes, and yes. final to be decided on, on resection. Absolutely. So it's yes, only, yes. only in very few cases where the clinician will push you and say, Ki, can you really tell uh, that's an oncocytoma? Because we plan to put the patient under surveillance. Very, very few patients will, will agree for surveillance. In, in, in a country like India, if you tell there yeah, is a mass want. lesion mm. in the kidney, yes. the patient will say, please get it out. And yes. the, tu the resection now for a small tumor is a partial nephrectomy. So that doesn't entail much damage to the other kidney functions. Okay. So uh, very few patients. So recently we had a very high VIP patient. Mm. 
small tumor mm-hmm. so they really wanted to know what it is so we yeah. called it onco setama on a biopsy but still that patient said i would like to get it out so that's the thing finally most that's of the time the renal mass is uh, would Nobody come out yeah correct correct uh, there's another question here uh, is papillary oncocytic variant a type 1 tumor papillary oncocytic variant of um... uh, so uh, papillary yeah. type 2 histology is basically based on the eosinophilia the stratification of the cells and the presence of very prominent nucleoli mm-hmm. so if you have very prominent nucleoli oncocytic eosinophilic cytoplasm and stratified cells looking very high grade you mm-hmm. wouldn't categorize that as type 1 yeah. what yeah. you are probably talking about is a new entity again which is still a still a emerging entity is the papillary tumor with reverse polarity Mm-hmm. which has very low grade nuclei again the tumor nuclei are towards the towards the lumen and they are again regimented towards the lumen and they got very eosinophilic homogeneous kind of cytoplasm looking a low grade at low power they are they harbor something called as keras mutations in these tumors they found it uh, but is still an emerging entity and not as a recognized entity okay right i think uh... Yeah, one more question which always bothers me: this clear cell papillary, yeah, Santosh. Yes, How often do you make a diagnosis of clear cell papillary? I'm extremely and... frank with you. There have been several times where we have suspected a uh, clear cell papillary tumor. Yeah. Uh, but my my dictum and my advice would be to go and take more sections in such tumors. See, you are sure. dealing with a, a borderline area where mm. you are talking about a benign tumor versus mm. a conventional renal cell carcinoma. Yes. So conventional renal carcinoma, highly malignant, clear cell papillary yeah. tumor is not it's malignant, almost, almost yeah. not malignant now not recognized. Much. Yeah, correct. So obviously, uh, uh, IHC of CK7 diffuse positivity has to be there to call it a clear cell papillary tumor. Mm-hmm. Uh, many times when you have gone back and taken more sections, we have found conventional areas. Yes, conventional exactly. Yes, yes. Local it areas happens. would absolutely look like a, 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 a yeah. clear cell papillary tumor. Correct. So that is important. So thank you so much, uh, Santosh. I think the questions, uh, I mean, uh, it can go on, and I know you can keep answering. You have such a wide experience, such a pleasure to listen to you. I think thank you once again uh, for that excellent talk, and you touched upon everything. I think all of you, there have been some very good comments. I mean, such appreciative comments about uh, all the sessions and your session particularly. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, Dr. Anand. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Anand. That uh, was Dr. such Sandhya, an excellent. It was a pleasure uh, seeing Dr. you Dr. again. Thank oh you yes, sir. Dr. Sandhya, this sir. is good afternoon. This is uh, Dr. Vijay Sagar, and Hello, it's sir. a pleasure seeing you again. Absolutely. And thank you very much for contributing, Dr. Santosh. I've been listening to your uh, talk for the last half an hour. Though I'm not a pathologist, exactly. I'm an anatomist, but I found found it extremely interesting. Yes. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And Sandhya, madam, we hope to see you sometime soon yes, here in, yes, in yes, Symbiosis Medical College. Yes, sir. So such a pleasure to see you, sir. Same Thank, you so Same much, yes. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Sandhya, madam. And you are always welcome when you are coming. Sure. Yes, definitely will do. And sure. uh, Dr. Santosh is already coming in the next month. We are Achy. planning to uh, okay. end the academic session also. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Next month. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Doctor Santosh, you and Munita Madam also you are invited. Yes, you tell how you are coming like that. We will arrange our academic. No worry, no worry. Pleasure yeah. for you, sir. Huh? Yeah, pleasure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Now I will pass on the mic to Doctor Rajan Bidhu, sir, for a, their concluding remark of today's conference. Uh, uh, good evening, all. Uh, we have now come to the end of our CME. on onco pathology update what more a pathologist would expect than to have a such a marvelous academic feast from the stalwarts in pathology on the occasion of international pathology day we had a very lucid lecture by dr bharat rekhi sir on biopsy interpretation of endometrial neoplasm in which he stressed the importance of ihc and molecular genetics in endometrial carcinoma with a remark that all the markers should be interpreted in a clinical pathological context as anything can happen with any marker thank you dr bharat rekhi sir we had a scientific deliberation on a biopsy interpretation of liver neoplasm by dr mukta ramadwar madam who elaborated extensively on all types of liver neoplasms including cancers of unknown primary with uh, classifying them with the use of ck7 and ck20 in diagnosing cups thank you uh, mukta madam 
what can be said about the most senior and stalwart in pathology dr anita borjesman she stressed on evidence based medicine in surgical pathology where in wherein external evidence is to be integrated with clinical expertise to achieve the goal she also stressed as histopathology being subjective evidence wisdom and hypothesis needs to be applied as a take home message thank you very much madam for the deliberation on a very difficult topic dr munita wal madam had a talk on head and neck tumors biopsy interpretation which was very informative she also covered various pitfalls in the diagnosis of head and neck tumors biopsies thank you madam dr santosh menon sir elaborated on update on renal neoplasm with impressive presentation with very beautiful graphics at places he also touched the newer who classification of renal tumors 2022 thank you sir i thank honorable dr muzumdar sir our chancellor of symbiosis international university honorable dr vidya yarodekar madam pro chancellor symbiosis international university honorable dr rajiv rajini gupte madam vice chancellor symbiosis university honorable dr rajiv yarodekar sir dean faculty of health sciences honorable dr vijay sagar sir dean symbiosis medical college for women honorable dr vijay natarajan sir ceo symbiosis hospital of and research center and all the dignitaries who permitted us to conduct this cme on virtual symbiosis platform we are thankful to all the moderators who actively participated in the cme dr sujata kanetkar madam dr shubhangi agade madam dr manoj singh sir dr ranjit kangre sir and dr sandhya sundaram madam we are thankful to dr rajan sancheti sir mmc observer for his participation and guidance we are also thankful to our it team of symbiosis and i am thankful to all my colleagues who took efforts in conducting this cme at at the end we are grateful to all the delegates who participated actively in this cme for delegates to note that you will receive the certificate of participation after filling the feedback form and please note that there is one credit point allotted by mmc thank you very much uh, before finishing just i will make to a one message from dr sumit gujral sir because he made this all organization behind this uh, he is not in this platform today but he supported to organize so he took message that that you have done the great good job to getting all the stalwarts of the pathology from the uh, tata memorial hospital as well as ex tata and hope next year all of you will come offline cme as well as conferences regularly as well as uh, weekend uh, anytime if you are uh, coming for this uh, that we will organize the academic fish in the form of slide seminar and the uh, subject uh, uh, lectures for the pg students of pune around pg hmm? sir definitely sir next time you are invited and all the uh, stalwarts of pathology and thanks to uh, dr sumit gujral please say my regard to sir sure. and thank you sandhya sundara madam next year you are expected to come offline hope this uh, covid will finish at our age thank you thank you everyone thank you i think i think we uh, can close this uh, anything you uh, uh, want to ask you can ask thank you thank you dr anand thank you uh, thank you thank you once again thank you thank you okay we'll close this okay thank you thank you